in the competitive snowboarding landscape, evolution is inevitable. The Natural Selection Tour was once an idea that quickly became a reality. And then a phenomenon. And it changed the way we look at snowboard competitions forever. Now, the evolution of the Natural Selection Tour continues. The duels format took center stage for our qualifying event. 12 new riders matched up with 12 tour vets in head-to-head -head backcountry sessions. The winners have arrived here, Revelstoke, British Columbia, a hand-picked zone amongst the half-million-acre tenure of the Selkirk Tangiers backcountry, uniquely suited to showcase what natural selection is all about. This is the new generation of backcountry competition. A mission to inspire all of us to forge a deeper connection with Mother Nature. This is so sick. But make no mistake, this isn't just rock, paper, scissors, and high fives. Ten hungry riders are looking to take down reigning tour champs Travis Rice and Elena Height. Who will emerge? Who will evolve? Stop two of the 2023 Natural Selection Tour is upon us, and the next stage of our evolution begins now. Welcome one, welcome all. The wait is over. We've been counting down the days, the hours and the minutes, but we are ready now to kick off the Yeti Natural Selection here at Revelstoke Mountain Resort. I want to start by saying a huge thank you to the province of British Columbia. Their support is what has made this event possible and they've contributed two of the key ingredients, perfect snow and fantasy terrain. The third and final ingredient in this wonderfully simple recipe has been supplied by Natural Selection, and that is 12 of the world's best riders. Very happy to say I'm joined in the studio today by Mary Walsh and Eddie Wall. Uh, if you've never come across him before, Eddie Wall defined as one of uh, Forum's finest riders in the original lineup. And uh, I like to think of him as a human, though, as a little glass of orange juice in the morning, a bit of human sunshine that sets you up for the day. And then sat next to him, Mary Walsh. I like to think of her as Alexa and Shakespeare combined. You can ask her any question you want about snowboarding, and not only will she know the answer, but she'll phrase it beautifully. Uh, pleasure to have you both in the studio. Eddie, you look so excited. Yeah, I am very honored to be here with you guys, honored to be a part of this event, and um, I'm, I'm extremely excited to see what we're uh, about to see. Okay, Mary, uh, first impressions of this venue because that's what's dominated the conversation in the build up to this. This is so exciting. I mean, this is literally a venue that has never been ridden by skier or snowboarder anyone. We are about to rip the seal off on a brand new tenure of terrain. Okay, the course is always the star of the show at Natural Selection. So let's take a closer look at it with the GoPro course preview. So, the red lines, 
delineating exactly where the riders can take on. Eddie, it is a vast area, four and a half times the size of the venue at Jackson Hole. Yeah, it's incredible how long this course is. And if you see far to the left and far to the lookers right, you have a little bit more open terrain, but right in the middle, you have some very uh, tight trees and steep pillow lines. So it'll be interesting to see who chooses that middle line. You mentioned it, Mary, is characterized by some of those really classic BC features. Yeah, so we call this zone Boulder Park and it really typifies interior British Columbia, which you can see is filled with just these runnels, gullies, tons of pillow lines, cliffs, and just this very, very creative terrain that really is at the heart of what we want natural selection to be, opportunities for creativity. Okay, one of, the, one of the key things here is scale. We haven't yet seen a rider on this course, so it's incredibly difficult to know just how big it is at this stage. Yeah, you know, I think that's interesting to say. I mean, those pillows, they look fun, they look inviting, they look soft, but in reality, they are massive and they are very, very difficult to ride. Okay, an average gradient of around 45 degrees on that bottom part of the slope, and it all rolls away out of sight. Uh, now, the broadcast team, it's not just Mary, Eddie and I. We've also got Todd Richards, Hannah Beeman and Pat Bridges who'll be tag teaming with us in the studio. And then up on the mountain, we've got two of the finest field reporters you could ask for. At the bottom of the hill, we've got Tom Monterosso. And up at the top, we've got our very own Ryan Seacrest on the white carpet. It's Stan Levier. Wow, thank you, Ed Lee. I hope Ryan Seacrest doesn't take offense to that. What an incredible day we have here. We are in Revelstoke at about just under 7,000 feet. The vibe is incredible, okay? I feel like I'm at a sleepover with all of this pillow talk that's going down, but it's good to be here, okay? Weather, kind of optimal for a contest, if I do say so myself. It's about 16 degrees Fahrenheit, seven mile an hour winds, which is calm. And we're out here in full sun. I'm at the top of the course. Honestly, saw the riders this morning. They got smiles on their faces. They're ready to go. Now, me personally up top, it kind of rolls right off. Hard to see the course a little bit. But luckily, we've also got T-Bird, Tom Monteroso down at the bottom with a better view. T-Bird, how are things looking down there? Stan, they're looking incredible. We got riders in the corral. Little bit of nervous energy down here, I'm not gonna lie. Behind me, you see the size, scope, and scale of Boulder Park. And one thing I've noticed in the intel that I've gathered this week is this is gonna be a game of situational awareness. I do not believe this will be a freestyle fest. I could be wrong, but looking up at this face, the, the true size and scale of the features up there is remarkable. Tom, you were there on the first day that the riders got visual inspection. What were the initial reactions like? Absolute astonishment, I think. I mean, we've been looking at photos of this face and some drone videos leading up to the event, but you really can't truly understand or comprehend the size and scale of this face here in Boulder Park without seeing it in person. So I think the riders got a little bit nervous, but I've been seeing the confidence build throughout the week as they get more time on the flanks of Boulder Park. Fantastic, thank you, gentlemen. A-plus reporting to start with, and I've got to say, the outfit game is very, very strong from the gentleman there. Real kind of Jim Carrey Riddler vibes from Stan, and then you've got the kind of goggle and beard matching the backcountry gear for T-Bird down the bottom. Um, there's, we've talked about it already, but this course is dominating the conversation. Riders seem to be visibly nervous about it. Yeah, you know, I think right from the beginning, even on our call with Travis yesterday, I mean, he said that, you know, first sight of this course went from all the riders. I mean, I think nerves are running high right now. Okay, Mary, from, from what you've heard, I know you've been speaking to a lot of people up there. If you don't know, we've got a 1,400 mile gap between us in Southern California and a live broadcast going down in Revelstoke. Uh, and that, that's created its own issues, but there's been a lot of messaging coming down that people are taking this really seriously. Oh, completely. I mean, word was that all the riders last night were literally studying as if it was a college exam, like a very intense physical college exam today. But they were all studying. I mean, this course is really going to reward, like we've been saying, the riders that can take those kind of like 2D photos and the 3D drone videos and kind of translate that to your own POV because it is so particular where you want to go that 
not getting lost and really root finding is going to be paramount. You're piecing together all of those different elements. OK, we talked about it. We've got 12 of the world's best riders here, but they qualified through the jewels, which, unless you've been living in an alpine hut for the last two weeks, have been released on a daily basis and saw the world's 24 best going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. These are the highlights. They want to see us battle, so let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Against Gigi? No. Class accurate. Dude, I think I won. <laughs> Let's see. The kid did not fall. That was definitely the best day of riding for my season, 100%. So these are the eight men that qualified. Talk us through the brackets as they line up, Mary. We always say they're finals matchups from the start, but no more is clear than right now it is that way. <laughs> Travis Rice is going to be opening up the course, dropping first, and of course, Ben Ferguson elected to go against him first round. Justin Craven, the only local to Revelstoke, most familiar with this terrain. Very excited to see him ride. And Blake Paul in the fourth matchup, one of snowboarding's most light on his feet. I think that's going to uh, do well for him today. And of course, he's facing against Mikey Cicerelli, who is taking Mark Morris's place, who injured himself after the duels. Yeah, Mark's loss is our game. We're going to see Mark in the studio with us in the semis. These are the women's brackets, though, Eddie. Uh, how do you see these lining up? OK, first bracket, younger riders, uh, freestyle driven. Second bracket, freestyle background, but now a lot more free ride driven. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, two very distinct matchups there. Uh, we actually teamed up with DraftKings, the Fantasy League uh, website and app. Uh, you can go on there and pick your teams. I'm going to put you two on the spot now. I know you've already got on DraftKings, haven't you? Yeah, I'm not going to say it was on accident, but I signed up for $100, so <laughs> I kind of have a lot riding on this right now. <laughs> Who did you pick? Oh, oh uh, me? Yeah, uh, I got to go with Travis and Elena. You know, I'm going to say I bet some smaller amounts because I'm a little nervous about that kind of thing. But I like to put something on every one of the women because I, I think they all are crushers. So, Fantastically sat on the fence there from Mary <laughs> Walsh. Uh, I'm going Dustin Craven and Elena Height. I do think that's going to be it. OK, uh, we are now ready to get this thing underway. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we will have all of the action for you as the natural selection here at Revelstoke Mountain Resort gets underway. Travis, you know, who has had a long career, is at a stage of his life, he's like, well, I, I want to use this as a microphone to really elevate the conversation around sustainability and to celebrate Mother Nature in a very engaging way and almost use the competition, the content as a Trojan horse to have these conversations and to impact change. The New Earth Project is a coalition of outdoor enthusiasts, industry-leading brands, and innovative packaging suppliers all working together to solve these problems. Great things are accomplished by the people who refuse to lie down. Our whole mission around celebrating Mother Nature and talking about sustainability, now we have something very tangible that's it's relevant action. to our audience. At the New Earth Project, our, our tagline has been, we do this together. And that was something that we figured out really early. Like, the secret sauce is community. Yeah. <laughs> the secret sauce is everyone working together. My hope is that brands will begin to look at this sustainable transition as something to celebrate. And at the end of the day, like, that's what this should be about, is like we are all inspired by this beautiful planet and we have a responsibility to understand our impact and do everything we can to minimize that if it's negative.
Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here at Revelstoke Mountain Resort, tucked into the Selkirk Tangiers Heli Tenure. It is, as we said earlier on, fantasy terrain, unlike anything else we've seen at Natural Selection so far. Format is the same as always, head-to-head -head matchups. The riders get two runs to find their best score. Whoever has the highest score advances to the next round. It is, you get two shots, two bites of the cherry, but in terrain like this, I feel like you're gonna need them. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing uh, as a viewer to remember when you're watching this is again, is the first time these riders are ever riding this and it's completely blind. Okay, so there you have it. You get two runs in the quarters, straight into the semis for the four best riders, and then the two best left at the end of the day go into the finals. The judging criteria are probably one of the most critical areas, and we've got an incredible lineup of judges today. Chad Otterstrom, Transworld Rider of the Year in 2005, Guillaume Morissette, Brian Fox, Jody Wachinak, and then Connor Manning. Go on his LinkedIn profile, it says professional snowboard judge. Creativity, risk, execution, difficulty, overall. So many different uh, criteria there and they reflect the type of riding that we're gonna see. The creativity on a face like this is gonna be key, as is risk. You can see here on this drone shot, you're coming up to the crux of the face where it just rolls away, that bowling ball effect. If you don't know exactly where you are, if you don't have the confidence to attack this section of the face, then you are not gonna get high scores. It is that simple. Okay, let's go up to the top of the mountain where Stan can Tuck us into Travis Rice, who's walking just behind you there, ready to go. Yeah, here we are. It's game time, you know. It's that, <coughs> wouldn't call it the calm before the storm as much as I might call it that angst before the battle. Uh, when we saw in the seeding ceremony, Travis Rice took that first seed. Half a mind to think that he was kind of saying, you know what, guys, I'm going to open this thing up. I'll show you how it's done. You follow me. Let's do this. But... I will say everyone seems in good spirits and uh, I think everyone's kind of just, I asked Ben Ferguson in one word how he was feeling before the drop and he looked at me and just said, ready. Fantastic, thank you, Stan. Uh, down at the bottom there, Tom, what are snow conditions looking like at the moment? Right now, snow conditions are looking absolutely caked. I mean, literally, it looks like stacks and stacks of wedding cakes out there. The snow is really, really deep. And when Kimi Fasani came down today, her and Elena Height were kind of scoping the riders' left side of the course. They said it is very, very deep out there. Okay. It's uh, very stable as well. We know that we've had avalanche mitigation uh, over the course of the winter itself, shedding all of the excess snow. We've had bombs dropped either side of the course into very similar terrain and nothing has released. So we have a secure and stable snowpack and we now have 12 of the world's best riders ready to get stuck into it. The first man to drop, number one seed, defending natural selection champion after his victory in Alaska last year. It is a man who has more experience, more time in the backcountry than anyone else. Rumor has it he has a photographic memory and he's got to be the number one seed out there today, Eddie, Travis Rice. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing to start off this event with Travis. And, uh, and again, we've talked a lot about how difficult this course is and how blind it is. And when we say that, you know, you might be rolling over a convex roll or a pillow, and you don't know if on the other side of that is a 10-foot drop, a 20-foot drop. There might be trees in the landing. It might be a 50-foot drop. You know, so these are the things that the riders have to be able to think so quickly on their feet. And if there's one person who is extremely talented as that, it's Travis Rice. Okay, but he's going up against one of the classiest riders in the field, I feel, in Ben Ferguson. If there's someone that can step toward uh, Travis, <laughs> you see getting ready, it's Ben. I mean, Ben's natural prowess in the backcountry, even though he's only been kind of really deeping, deeping himself into it in the last few years, is enormous. I mean, he is someone that can read terrain so well, so naturally. But he's also never been on terrain like this. This is so different than the terrain he's used to in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, Travis, you saw him there stretching out the method, just making sure it's still there. Travis, got to say, 40 years old. His days of in-flight contortionism may be, or, or the glory days of in-flight contortionism, I should say, may be behind him. But we saw a huge backside 720 nose grab in his duel. His ability to read 
natural terrain. Terrain he's never ridden before on the fly is unrivaled. And we've had a couple of people saying that we might see one of the, if he can lace this first run, we might see one of the highest scoring runs of the day, first run here. Well, I think that's some of what we've seen with Travis, especially in, in the last few years, as he kind of perfects his really big mountain free riding stuff, is that he's gone to the super, super technical. I mean, those POV runs that we've seen from him up in Alaska and in BC have been absolutely bananas. This kind of stuff plays to his strengths, but I also think that it opens the door for other people just to see him uh, achieve that. Yeah, cast your mind back to his first run in Alaska in 2022. He opened up that gigantic step down gap with the backside 360. The fact he was able to scope that and had the confidence to hit it with as much speed as he did, it, it speaks volumes about his ability. Yeah, and another thing to consider too is, you know, first run, your legs are strong. You have the energy going. You have your optimal amount of, uh, of fuel in your tank on that first run. After your first run, you're gonna start getting more tired, more exhausted going in and run two, and if you advance, even more. So, you know, Travis, I think he's the type of rider who knows, let's strike while the energy is high. Okay, it is time to crack the seal on the Yeti natural selection here in Revelstoke. Travis Rice, number one seed, first rider to drop. He's going to show everyone how to ride this course. He's looking incredibly composed there. Yeah, if there's one person who can be relaxed in a situation like this, it's, uh, it's probably Travis. Interesting about his board selection. Earlier in the week, he said he was going to go for the shortest board possible. He talked about a 153 Orca because he wanted to be maneuverable. There was a little bit of debate about whether he might take a 160 Golden Orca just because of the snow depth. But I think he's on the shorter board looking at that. Yeah, it looked like he was on that 153 and a shorter board. Uh, what that will do is while you're in those tight areas, it will allow you to maneuver a little bit more. Okay, run. Maybe not too great, though. <laughs> Here we go. We are off. Travis Rice is on face. So you can see him coming down, breaking trail, having a little fun right there as he heads into uh, what we like to jokingly refer to as the false sense of confidence here at the top of the course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just this run alone is a leg burner, and that's before you even get to the bench and start getting into the real meat of this run. And I'm just very curious to see if straight from the start he's going to get into one of these center lines, which it appears from this GoPro view is, the, is that that's, is where he is going. That snow quality as well. Yeah, it looks like Travis is getting right into the guts of it, and I think that makes sense. I mean, he's going up against Ben Ferguson. You can't lay up in this situation. Is he making his way through some of these tighter trees? Oh, going a huge foot three and clearing that pillow. Absolutely huge first bite. Again, just to do that with sight unseen, first run ever riding uh, this, this terrain is, is unbelievable. And I think notice too that there's no hesitation right now. Like even though no one has ever dropped in this, this course, Travis is making his way down very methodically. Imagine how easy it is to get lost in this. It's like a kelp forest. Here we go. Looks like he's setting up for a pretty substantial drop right here. Yes, he is. Ooh. This is where it gets technical. Look at the gradient. This is extremely difficult to ride. And oh. you can see the pillows peeling off and he oh. stayed on his feet up until the very end there. But and you could hear that effort in that last the grunt there. Tiny over rotation on the back three. All right, you heard a, yeah, you heard a little bit of a grunt. So he took, looked like he took a pretty good spill there, but Overall, I mean, just to navigate that line, sight unseen is just unreal. Wow. All right, and so now the judges, uh, they have a very difficult job. You know, they have, to, they have to put scores, put these guys into the positions and girls into the positions that they believe is correct. And here's Travis coming down to the bottom. Yeah, so he's got that catcher's mitt track there, allowing him to get back to the finish area. We are not gonna see a score after the first run. We're going to see Ben Ferguson's run, and then we'll see both scores revealed. But that is a big run. He, he actually covered the bottom section of that course incredibly quickly. I agree. I mean, that's one thing that we were anticipating was that there would be a lot more kind of like picking across and billy goading. 
OK, yeah. let's hear from Tom and Travis now. It was good. Yeah, I landed in a Ronald that was hard. Down here with Travis Rice after the first inaugural run here. He dropped first. He's leading the pack. Travis, let's talk a little bit about snow depth. I think we, we've been saying it was deep, but judging by the looks of that, it was ridiculously deep. <laughs> uh, yeah, snow's, snow's like a nine and a half out of 10. Uh, I love it, man. It's, it's so tricky. Such a long run, and it's got so much to offer. It's, I'm just psyched to see what goes down today. After all the film study, all the drone footage review, was it what you expected? Did you feel prepared dropping into that line? Um, I did, yeah. I, I mean, shit, I got the line I was going for and landed in kind of a hard runnel at the bottom. Other than that, insane, insane face. All right, we got Ben Ferg up next. Congrats, Trav, that was incredible. We're gonna throw it back to the studio and go back up top. Travis Rice heaving on oxygen there, just trying to get the oxygen back into his lungs, get rid of that lactic acid buildup from a gigantic run down Boulder Park here at Revelstoke. So the judges furiously Crazy scribbling. The judges are absolutely terrified of this, as, as nervous as the riders, I think, because they're sight unseen. They don't know what they're measuring against. And there's no barometer for them. That, that's the only barometer we have, and that's a very, very solid run. OK, so next rider to drop in, Ben Ferguson, the owner of some of the most eclectic half-pipe runs in the business as a competitor. He migrated all of that beautiful edge control, all of that poise uh, into his backcountry riding. He spent the last two years absolutely slaying it with his project Fleeting Time, and he's now emerged, I think, as one of the apex predators in backcountry snowboarding. So, so strong in this kind of terrain. And we saw the consistency, Eddie Mary, in his duel when he went up against Niels Mindick, arguably one of the tightest. One of Ben's strengths, obviously, I mean, among many, is his edge control. And that's really going to do him well when you're riding pillows, especially like this. You're actually doing a lot more edging than it would seem from our standpoint. So his ability to, to know the right distribution of exactly where he wants to go and make that happen and maneuver quickly is really going to serve him well. You can see there he had his eyes closed. It looked like he was visualizing his run. I feel like there's a lot of visualizing going on during this competition because there is no actual practice on the run like in a normal contest form. OK, let's see. Ben Ferguson knows he has got to pull the lid off this one because he's up against one of the best in the business in Travis Rice. Ben Ferguson into the face here at Revelstoke. Of course, he's making a beeline for the center, it looks like, which is that, as Eddie you said earlier, the meat and potatoes of Boulder Park. He's going straight for Rice on this one. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah, that was almost a, a little bit of a gap there to start off. And again, you know, he doesn't know the speed to hit that with. He doesn't know the actual distance until he's in the air. So, you know, Travis started this off by honestly doing probably, taking one of the more technical and difficult lines definitely in, like we said, that meat and potatoes area. Uh, it's, I'm very curious to see where Ben goes. I'm assuming he's, you know, it looks like he's going a little riders left than uh, Travis. Fuck. So uh, let's Ooh. see what he gets into. It sounds um, like he's quite serious from the language he's employing. Yeah. Okay, that's, I mean, there's first, first line, first pillow line, a couple of quick drops there, staying on his feet. As you can see, look how blind that is going in. He cannot see anything except the valley floor. Edge of the seat as he lines up on top oh. of some serious exposure. All right, okay. pausing. So this is one of those moments where, you know, where do you go from here? Based on what he said earlier on his mic, I'm not positive if he intended to be in this area this quickly. It looks like he maybe wanted to be a little more riders left, and he is on the top of a very massive cliff, followed by an even larger one. So we'll have to see how he navigates this. And again, this kind of is an example of, of how Travis was able to navigate his line and was able to nail his uh, exact line first run. Uh, that so savant-like ability, we talked about this. Okay. So there is a huge, there is a shelf here, here but there's huge oh. exposure. He needed to make that turn. 
That was phenomenal. Now he's going to track across to the left of our pitcher because below him, he has a gigantic amount of exposure. This is incredible. Just holding his composure and his mental toughness to navigate that. That is absolutely massive. That, oh my God, and he's out. That was incredible. That exposure was a real deal. Okay, for everyone in the studio and everyone at home, take a breath. That was incredible. When we talk about ripping the seal off of this terrain, this is enormous. I mean, look at that runnel right there that he's coming out of, and he's in the home stretch. He's made it to a wide open field. I, Todd Richards had called this indecent exposure. It's now Ben Ferguson's to name because that is a first descent. Looks like he was trying to get a little backside three off a pillow at the bottom there as he makes his way down to the finish line. And uh, I'm very curious to hear uh, in his interview with Tiber to to just uh, you know talk about where he was at and 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 what he was feeling at the top of those that cliff band. My jaw is on the floor right now. Like just the visceral feeling of watching him be on top of that band. That's the kind of thing that drives fear into your heart. So to see him navigate that so deftly, that speaks to you how amazing he is. Ben has been one of the most relaxed riders of all of them in the build up to this. Let's throw down to Tom now. <laughs> yeah. Yep, it looked even bigger with you and Fran. Because I came in on that platform, huh? Yeah. I wanted to come into the right. Look who's right. Oh, and kind of sweep <coughs> around. Get on that one. Back there, one. <laughs> well, instead, you rode an even gnarly one. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Just kind of bounced down the whole thing. Yeah. Snow's good, though. Snow's good. Yeah, snow's All good. right, I'm Perfect. down here with Ben Ferguson and Travis Rice Bird. That's a hell of a run, buddy. Yeah, I got a little lost up there before the like that kind of like pinch. Should have been a little rider's left, but kind of ended up making it down surprisingly. Yeah, you that really nice. Billy goaded your way down there, buddy. It's a bit yeah. of a game of situational awareness, yeah. For sure, those trees all kind of look the same. Should have zigged when I zagged and. Didn't end up in the right entrance point. Man, it's wild in there. It's bigger once you're in it, for sure. It's crazy. All right, buddy, good job, Ben. We're gonna go back to the studio, back up to the top. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ben Ferg. Human Valium there. He's so relaxed about that situation he's just navigated. That blows my mind right there. So, highlights from Travis, first of all. Beautiful work from both of them up on the top face there, just playing with those roles. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the one thing to note comparing these two runs right off the bat, Travis never stopped. And I, I mean, look at that front side 360. It's 30 foot plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely mental. And, uh, you know, that's one of the signs of an extremely seasoned veteran in this type of terrain is when you never stop. And look at that, just blasting airs like goal posting trees and landing on other pillows. This is, now, now that we're seeing this for a second time, I mean, this run is unbelievable. And this is something too, like worth noting that normally you wouldn't just hit a pillow line like that. Like you'd have an opportunity to scout it and usually stand on top of it and really check it out. So just dropping in like without any knowledge is insane. That was so underrated as well. That yes. gap that he had up top that he measured perfectly. You know, we, we heard at the bottom uh, when Ben finished his run, he said, oh, I wanted to be a little more riders left, which is where he's pointing right now. And then Travis said, well, you ended up riding a gnarlier line. <laughs> so uh, this is in incredible. And as a rider, when you ride up on something, you use trees. Like you can see how far down the trees are to know how much do drop there is in front of you. There was nothing for a couple of hundred feet. No, but I mean, the big underline is situational awareness. I think that is the, literally the phrase of the day. To see Ben get on top of this where he didn't expect to be there, but navigate it so deftly, I mean, that's incredible. And there was still exposure below that. It was shelf on shelf on shelf. So scores coming in from these first runs. Travis got that Cheshire cat grin strapped on. I think he knows he's done well on that first round. 77.6 versus 66.6. The number of the beast for Ben Ferguson there. Something to build on. Very interesting. A, a run laced together perfectly. Almost a range. That perfect range finding score for Travis. Mid 70s. That's the classic judges play. Okay. Heat two. The action just keeps coming.
And this is an exact... We, the first two rounds here are an exact repeat of our semi-finals from Baldface in 2022. Ben Ferg, Travis, and now we have Mikkelbang, the Norwegian powerhouse, going up against the closest thing we have to a local here, Dustin Craven. And Mikkelbang, I mean, you put him in any kind of terrain and this guy comes up smelling of roses. He's one of the most adaptable riders that we have on tour. We've seen it for the last two years. He is an improvisational king. But again, this is really new terrain. This is different terrain. Mikkel's ridden everything, but this is still unusual. Okay, a colossus of snowboarding, literally and figuratively speaking. Dropping in. All right, Mikkel just making his way down. This is the kind of a little bit more fun, relaxing part before you get into the more terrifying terrain. The calm before the storm, as, Sa as Stan called it. Yes. yes. The, the false sense of security, I improperly named it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so Gab, the drone pilot, armed with those GoPros just tracking Mikkel into the forest here. And we heard Ben Ferguson say it, so easy to lose your way in these trees. I'll tell you what, uh, depending on what these riders had maybe planned to do, I bet you uh, Mikkel and Travis may have just completely changed their plan of attack because uh, they know they have to get into these, this steep tree, big cliff area in order to put up a solid score now. Right, this is a no warm up situation. He's using, looks like Travis's track here as a bit of guidance as well. He yeah. split off, we saw Ben Ferg's tracking off to the left and he's following Travis down. So that's interesting, you know, I think judges will take note of that. If you are following someone else's tracks, that already gives you a, um, a, a really beneficial place to be in. You know, he, he's already um, kind of getting a bit of a, the same, as of now, he's doing the same run that Travis did. Let's see if he tries to get off his path a little bit hung up there. Oh, it looks oh. like he's trying to go a little rider's right, pop off this cliff. Okay, so he is going for a different line than Travis. And navigating those Ooh. pillows looks like he went down a little bit, but now he is still on his feet. He's getting flushed. Oh, he is really in that right now. That is a very, very tight wow. run out. And those are those slough runnels that we've talked about where the face is shedding snow and it just cleans out these little gullies. You know, and he got dragged down into it because it's always full line. And that's so hard because if the snow gets in front of your face and you're riding that completely blind. And you were saying runnel, that was more like a tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's so, looking back up the course. I bet you he's looking up to get a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little eyes on it from the bottom to navigate that for his next run. But yeah, I don't, I don't think he uh, purposely meant to end up in that zone. Look at this getting uh, picked up by one of the skidoos at the bottom there. Yeah, skidoo ambassador, Nadine. So he's out on that far rider's right-hand side of the venue and there's a creek bed there. And the crew have put in a catcher's mitt of probes with pink tape and skidoo riders ready to pick them all up and ferry them back to the finish area. So. so as we mentioned, you know, he started off that run following Travis's track. Now, uh, you know, if I were a judge, that is something I would take note of because uh, again, that's gonna give you a massive benefit right from the get-go because you know that that's navigating you into a certain area. Um, but as soon as he did get into the thick of things, he peeled off riders right and took a totally different path. I'm not sure if it's the exact path that he necessarily wanted to take, but um, he, he definitely put on a show. <sighs> Mickelbank going to be wanting to uh, improve that for his second run. Got a little bit lost at the bottom there. But heading back up to the top, we have the Revelstoke local, Dustin Craven, winner of Baldface in 2022. One of the most adept riders when it comes to big spins, switch riding, but critically for British Columbian riding, he knows his way around pillows. It's his bread and butter, Mary. <laughs> Dustin is the scrappiest, the wiliest, and he's incredibly creative. And just as you said, he is very adept at this kind of thing. And he has more preparation than anyone else in this field for this specific terrain. High anticipation for what he's gonna do out there. If there is any athlete out there today who is familiar with this style of terrain, it is Dustin Crater. He's in a lot of... I mean, that, those are like the most... 
That's, I've never done a fill of line that big before. That's for sure. That's <laughs> saying a lot right there. Holy smokes. Mickle's been a provider since he was in fourth grade, and he's never done a pillow line that big. Dude, so I like, I saw the, the runnel, and I was just like, oh, fuck. But. I can hear you in there. You can hear me? It was like nice in there. <laughs> for, it was like. For the record, they should give you extra points for going through the freaking tunnel. Right? It definitely was like a tube. <sighs> Wow, that's a leg burner too, huh? Like actually like right before getting into the like lower part. Two decades of video parts. White balance for standard in 2003 was his first video part. And as you said, biggest pillows he's ever hit. So going toe to toe with Mikkel is Dustin Craven. Such an accomplished rider in this kind of terrain. But even he was saying at the start of the week, he hasn't done pillow lines of this size without standing on top of them. So it's fresh territory for Dustin Craven as well. Big cloud burst up top to celebrate dropping in. Okay, so he's dropping in, you know, kind of taking a similar line as Ben Ferguson going massive to start things off. I mean, just the scale of that, if you were to put that in a, in a, a park at a resort, that would have probably been, uh, you know, the entire upper half of it. <laughs> so peeling off Pretty far riders left right now. We know there's a uh, other fresh pillow zone in that area. I don't know if it's going that far left, but it looks like he might be veering toward it. And again, I think the judges will note that he's not following any other of the previous riders' lines, which I think is, uh, you know, he's aiming for a high score by doing that. And you see that similarity to Travis Rice, that he's riding uh, with a fair amount of speed and a lot of confidence right now. He's just uh, kind of definitely seems to know where he's going despite the fact that he's never ridden this area. Average pitch of this run as well, 40, 45 degrees. So you can't charge off any of these lips or you're going to outrun the landing so, so quickly. We saw with Travis, he took a tiny, like quarter pace off something and he's going 30 feet. Dustin just, he knows his way around this, doesn't he? He's killing the speed on top of every pillow. Oh, he is heading into a terrain. very exciting area. Uh, this is blowing my mind right now that they that he is going into this line without ever having eyes on it. Before. No hesitation. And he's do, he's riding it very well as of now. Oh, you can see these pillows oh breaking off. Oh my god! Nearly oh, padding over a tree. Oh, okay, and he's down. Okay, he went down, but he was navigating that really well uh, to start off with. There was a lily pad on a tree there. Oh, that was a beautiful 360. Wow, Dustin Craven really stepped it up. I mean, already these guys are riding lines that I wasn't sure we were going to see anybody step to. What's fascinating, what he's just driven, ridden through there, it's not avalanche debris. That is pillows that have fallen off trees or been knocked off that have actually settled in this runout area. And those are, those are legit hazards. Well, you can see here he has to traverse far right to get to that finish line area. That was fantastic though, watching him navigate that, no hesitation, he just went right through that. He was a little bit tail heavy on the landing, but he almost completely rode out of that. Phenomenal amount of exposure, like big, that is an, a huge instant drop there. You know, we talked about it earlier as well, once riders get on this face, it really puts into perspective how massive these features are. And I think Dustin uh, was a great example of that. I mean, as soon as he got to the top of that pillow line, it was a, a pillow line that you may have seen and said, I, I might be able to do that. And then he gets on the top of it and you're like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, think, think about, I always think back to his, he had one of the last Transworld covers with an incredible pillow line and I'm looking at the scale of that. I think that one was bigger. Like that was probably cover worthy drop. Oh, yeah. completely. That Abby Pascal was like, it was hard. Skipping. Nice to go, man. Okay, let's take a look at the highlights from these two runs. Mikkel up first. So both of these riders are so talented, but they're very different styles. They have very different styles, excuse me. You can see getting a little bit caught in this zone when Mikkel was going down. And this is where he goes into that, uh, that severe tunnel. Well, we got that great view from above. 
Just got kicked back seat by the last one, didn't he? Yeah, now this is where things get interesting. He gets thrown into this little chute and uh, went completely blind there. And here we go. Watch this massive air just kick things off by Dustin. Wow, that angle really makes it look so big. Again, I think the fact that Dustin looked so intentional with where he was going and navigated this so deftly, I think is going to serve him well, even though the landing was um, a little bit rough. See, he actually was up in the landing and yes. it kind of went down a little later. So I'm yes. curious how the judges are going to judge that. That was technically, yes. that was a gap out across that little runnel onto the top of that cliff and then into a 10 meter, 30 foot drop. Yeah, if I had to put money on it, I'd say Dustin's going to take, take the first run on this. Okay, let's see if you're right. right yeah. 83.8, highest score of the day so far for Dustin Great. Craven. Two points for Eddie Wall. 54.2, <laughs> creativity, I would speculate, mm, coming right okay. down from the judges. As you, right, as you both said, following Travis's track, so you, you dial that down straight away. I was, like, I was going off it, and I was like, I need not to slow myself down. And I was just like pushed into the wall, like, like, and then I was just like, that's it. You manned that fucking landing spot. The level that these riders are operating at now is absolutely mind blowing. Next match up again, it is two heavy hitters. Torstein Hogmo, second place in Alaska in 2022, going up against undoubtedly rookie of the year in 2022, Jared Elston. Torstein's up first, and you've got to say, Eddie Mary, his riding is characterized by the the strength of his freestyle and the consistency of his freestyle. How is he going to get on in this kind of terrain? Well, I think the thing about Torstein is, yes, he has an incredible freestyle pedigree, but he's one of those individuals that locks into the moment and just can focus so well and read terrain so well. I think, honestly, he doesn't often get enough credit for just his free riding. Yeah, I think we're seeing him come into his free riding. I mean, of course, he's been into it for the past uh, few years, but, you know, he started off with a lot of X Games medals, a lot of Dutour medals for straight, you know, big park jumps, big airs. And then uh, over the past few years, we've seen him completely dominate the backcountry. I, and I'd seen, I was one of those people who'd seen him link a couple of kickers together backcountry, but hadn't seen full lines. He blew my mind in Alaska last year. Absolutely phenomenal. But by his own admission, he hasn't spent a lot of time in pillows. So let's see how he gets on. Oh, beautiful. Back 360 to start things off. Oh, and a little butter. Are these flourishes of what brought the AK run to life? Exactly. And I think coming off of last year's finals when the storm came in and really shut down his final run, I'm sure he's itching for a rebate. All right, coming into this, this lower bench here, let's see what Torstein has set up. And again, now he's going far rider's right. This is the furthest right that we have seen a rider go so far. So let's see what type of situation he gets into. Way more open. You can see a little more on this side of the venue. Yeah, more landing space, a little more, uh, you know, less trees. So, uh, you know, definitely a good opportunity. But now as he gets into this, going through this second bench, let's see what pillows he gets into here. Big blind air. Yeah, it looked <gasps> like he kind of did a little tree tap there. Here we go, setting himself up on top of a couple pillows. Again, navigating that massive exposure on his left side, finding the landing on that pillow. Now, one thing I will say is he's really keeping his speed up. Uh, and that is something that I know the judges are loving. Okay, so picking his way down this section right now. It's really interesting because, you know, even in this more open space, there's still so many drops. He did so well to save that. He'd fully broken at the waist. He could have collapsed. Yeah, absolutely. I, <laughs> he definitely folded at the waist, but he did not uh, go down. He stayed on his board. And uh, I believe that is going to be the, the, the run for Torstein. So, you know, I'm really curious to see how the judges score this because he did not go through the very steep technical terrain as the um, first riders went through. But he did keep his speed up, and he was going very quick, like very fast through the entire run. I, yeah, I'm, it'll be very interesting to see where he is, uh, where he's put after that first run. And it's going to matter, too, where does Jared go? I mean, is he going to go straight for the gut, or is he going to also take kind of a more um, 
left or right side lane approach because that's what is really going to matter in this situation. Yes, uh, Nadine Overwater on the Skiddo, one of Skiddo's ambassadors, taking care of business, picking Torstein up. You've got, you made an interesting point that this is the first time we've seen one of the more open runs. Everyone else has been straight into that really steep, exposed central section of pill pillows. Now you've got Torstein on the outside. It sounds from the intel we've had like Jared is going to take to the meet as well. So it's going to be great to see how these scores match up. Well, Torstein's a very calculated individual. I mean, obviously, we touched on the fact that he has had decades of contest experience. He's been filming video parts for so long. Like, there's definitely a reason strategically in his head that he's like, I'm going to go in this open, normal open area first, get my, get my feet wet, get comfortable, and then, uh, you know, there's always time to unleash the beast still. So. Yeah, and you know, one thing that Torstein may have been doing too is scoping that run right, to maybe lay down some freestyle like tricks. <laughs> Nice work. Thank you. Okay, so we can go up to the top of the course now with Stan. We know that they've got screens at the top and bottom of the course. What's the atmosphere like up at the top there now, Stan, that we've seen five riders through the course? I guess the word I would use to describe it is odd, <laughs> right? Everyone is kind of huddled around an iPad watching as their fellow competitors go down the hill, cheering them on no matter if it's the competitor they're against or someone they might be against in the next round. Jared Elston kind of a sigh afterwards and said, well, we just watched three of the best riders in the world kind of have some trouble in there. Uh, right before Dustin Craven drops, he looks at him and says, remember, this is your territory. Everything the sun touches is yours. And I think it was helpful. <laughs> we saw Craven have a, a nice work in there. So right now I think they're getting their legs under them. They're feeling good. I think all these riders are gonna be excited for that second go. Thanks, Stan. That's a really good point, exactly the one you made, Eddie, that for some of these riders, it's a range finder. It's, it's actually working out what you can hit, how fast you can hit it, and, and where you can go. Mikkel, at the end of his run, Mary, looking back up and potentially taking stock, getting that really up close and personal view. Yeah, just getting his bearings. And I'm sure, too, just feeling the snow conditions. That's a huge deal in itself. Okay, so Jared Elston, 24-year-old, He's been investing so much time in British Columbia, making sure he's ready for this. Had, I think, one of the most controversial duels against Giggy Ruff. Very, very tight. He played it strategically, and he looked very strong in that. He's got a point to prove out here. Because, uh, to me, he, he was one of the riders who looked visibly intimidated by Alaska last year. I think last year on the tour, Jared was a dark horse, right? But he came in and really, really showed up. And I think to even step to Alaska as he did was a mark for him and was very impressive. So I think this year he's coming in with that experience, adding to this incredible natural ability that he's seen. <coughs> okay, so Jared Elston gets his first taste of Boulder Park here in Revelstoke, snapping a couple of quick turns out up top. Looks he looks anxious and eager to get into this. And he'd actually been camped out in Revelstoke for the past two weeks. Oh, huge front three. Little backseat on the landing, but manages to chuck up some cloud burst, hide from the judges. In a little air, using these, the lines in the snow as a bit of a navigation. I love Austin Smith's quote about Jared. He said, everyone's good these days. Jared isn't just good. He will use his head. He'll ride with his brain to make sure he makes the most of a situation. And I'm looking forward to seeing that. Like, Ooh, oh, goes down on the back three, unfortunately, but very momentary blip in his run. It's a really beautiful setup as well. Jared, of course, going to be choosing some of this middle line. And if you guys could hear his audio too, he just said, where the hell is this? Got himself onto a nice bubble there. Oh, yeah. Sounds excited. Oh, beautiful looking navigation of this pillow line. Made that look easy. Yeah, he is making this run look very easy. He's in a pretty wide open area, but it looks like he's trying to get into some more sketchy terrain oh this my God. angle oh my goodness that rider's left side with that drop 
Wow, this angle really puts it into perspective. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Absolutely mind melting. Jared Elston in the Goldilocks zone right now. He was able to, he had good visuals so he could keep it opened up, but he had the exposure, he had the technicality that the judges are looking for. And again, that's that innate ability to read terrain. We, we heard him vocalize that he was unsure exactly where he was, but he ended up being probably exactly where he wanted. Now, here's the big question. Is that enough to take over Torstein? He had a couple bobbles in the very top, uh, but he, you know, as we saw from that, that GoPro uh, drone angle, that line that he just did was uh, extremely exposed. Well, you, you're balancing the criteria, aren't you? The creativity and the risk are through the roof for Jared, but the execution uh, and the difficulty, but the execution and the overall probably belongs, is weighted a little more towards Torstein. But I think the creativity and risk for Jared there. Who's got any like, water? We had a couple of spins, like big instability on the landing of the backside three, which was a real shame. I think without that, he'd probably be, on my scorecard, I'd have him a little bit further out. Totally, and the thing about his fall too is it's in a less consequential place, which I think will take away away from that portion of his run because he navigated the kind of meteor section, the big pillow line so well. Okay, replays. Torstein up top, big back three, that classic compact style of Torstein's. High speed butter. That double as well, really tidy. See, that's a, that is the thing that they to take note of, the amount of speed that Torstein rode that line with. It is the more open uh, field, but his speed is so uh, solid. But it talked to how, how much more mellow the gradient was. Yeah. He was probably dealing with 25, 30 degrees there compared to 40, 45 for Jared. But big, big stops. And the flow was there, wasn't it? Yeah. All right, here goes Jared. This starting things off with this front side 360 and just kind of leaning into the back seat. A little bit of an over rotation going onto that heel edge and, and getting a bit of a butt check there. And the back side three and then uh, doing a little somersault, but getting right back to his feet. And then here we go. And this is where we really see Elston shine. I mean, again, the lack of hesitation, the flow through this line is really, really impressive. It was breathtaking, wasn't it? So first run scores coming in for Torstein Hogmo and Jared Elston. If you're just joining us here at the Yeti Natural Selection in Revelstoke, this Ooh. is the first runs of the men's quarterfinals, the third matchup. Jared Elston, 72.8. A whisker ahead of Torstein Hogmo on 69.2. Two incredibly different runs, two very close scores. That one is going to come down to the wire second run. And that's where we're seeing how the judges are kind of stacking things up. And it appears that they're really prioritizing that gnarly, gnarly terrain. Okay, fourth and final of our quarters. And two very different riders here. Blake Paul, the backcountry prince, so light on his feet. Such a beautiful, elegant rider. And then Mikey Cicerelli, one of the Slopestyle world's powerhouses up until uh, I think it was around 2020. And then he ducked away from competition. He's invested so much time in the backcountry. But up first is Blake Paul. He has got such a beautiful riding style. In the jewels, I would have refer I referred to him as human silk. He was <laughs> so smooth. I love that. I always think of him as a melody. He's an absolute harmony when he's riding with the snow. So he's more of an essence. So I, I, think of, I think of him as a bird, like he has hollow bones because he is so light on his feet. And I think this terrain uh, favors a rider who is light on their feet. It, it is, I think, a lot of people. I also think that Blake is looking for redemption. He was... I don't think there's another word for it. He was humiliated by that 50-point score in boldface last year. Ninth place, the wooden spoon. He rode it beautifully. But the point, comment from the judges was they thought he was laying up. He took more turns forward than Dustin Craven did switch. So he has a point to prove here. And he, this is the kind of terrain he can do it in. We talk about the interplay between the terrain and the rider. And Blake just does, does that interplay so exquisitely. So coming down... The top face of this. Oh, you know, that was kind of cool. He landed on another little roll, so he kind of did an ollie and then another ollie. And it looks like he's staying 
fairly center right now as he heads into the guts of the course. Yeah, and you know, earlier we were talking about athletes taking other people's lines, and you know what, I mean, as the contest uh, progresses, of course you're gonna see athletes now um, overlapping some other, other people's lines because, uh, of course, you know, everybody has, uh, you know, maybe people have been choosing the same lines, but I will say judges do uh, are going to reward riders for taking completely new lines. So far, Blake's run is so playful, um, which is definitely really nice to see because this is not a uh, playful face to drop in for the first time. Well, it's about to get really serious. Yeah. We're at that crux point where it starts rolling out of sight. And this is where the judges are looking for those tells from the riders. Are they hesitating? Are they pulling up? Blake knows exactly oh, where he is, though. Perfect. Entering into that more severe consequential area really beautifully. And this is the thing is Blake has ridden some pillows. He look how light he is on the touch. And again, he's riding this as it, it looks as if he's ridden this, you know, a hundred times. This is that is so far one of the most solid drops that we have seen. Complete staying on his feet. Didn't even look like he put a hand down. That was beautiful. Now compared to some of the earlier runs that were right in the thick of things, that wasn't as technical, it was, it, you know, there weren't as many uh, uh, trees to navigate, but I will say he did it very smooth. In, and that's almost the problem with Blake. Sometimes he makes things look too easy. Right at the end there, he's fallen. The first rider to show all of the face a clean set of heels. And then just as he joins the traverse line at the bottom here, he uh, trips himself up. But definitely, we're going to see from the judges where they rate cleanliness. There yeah. was... I think similar level of exposure there to Jared Elston, but so, so smooth, so playful on the top side of the face. Yes, and honestly, fairly like playful looking, like he made that look fun, whereas it's very, very technical and gnarly, and he made it look enjoyable. I think that behooves him because I, I, the judges, they wanna see that smooth, confident line riding. And Blake delivered. Very, very strong run from Blake Paul. And you know, at, at this point, we've talked about how nervous these riders have been in the four days building up to this event. That is the ultimate antidote. He's just settled himself perfectly. He's like, you know what, I've got this. I know where I am. My navigation worked. The GPS, the internal GPS is working. I've got something on this face. He looks like he's still processing, doesn't he? Yeah. Again, like you said, he was, uh, he's one of the first athletes to stay completely on his feet the entire run. Almost zero bobbles. Um, but again, a slightly, and now I say this you know, subjectively, a slightly uh, safer run than you may have seen from Travis or Craven or something like that. But again, very smooth, very relaxed. And uh, I'll, I'll be very curious to see where that puts him in on the scoreboard well the pressure is 100 percent on mikey cicerelli now to deliver the canadian out of mont st louis moonstone love the name of that resort <laughs> took up a uh, world cup win back in stoneham in 2015 had a really strong slope style career he's got that fantastic grounding in the park and pipe uh, area, but then he goes up against Mark McMorris. He got his invite off the strength of his uh, arc part. He got the closer in that film. Finished with a cab 12 in the backcountry. Lost out to Mark McMorris though in their duel. But then Mark McMorris broke his ankle, and the spot becomes Mikey's. So there's no pressure on him. There's no expectation. He can relax here, but as we've seen already, this kind of terrain, it's not letting anyone sit back and enjoy it, I don't think. So, Mary, Eddie, have you, have you seen much of Mikey in this kind of terrain? For me, his arc part was based completely around backcountry cheese wedges. Yes, no, this is the first time I think uh, all of us are seeing him navigate this kind of terrain. He's really just recently taken that step into the backcountry, as you said, so this kind of free riding, entirely new for us as viewers. Starting thing off with that that big ollie, just catching that nice little transition. Ooh. Nice slash, that must have felt so good. You know, this is the time when the, the, the riders can actually relax a little bit. I, I heard one rider comment that by the time they got into the thick of things, uh, you know, down to this first bench, 
their legs were already tired, which is very tricky when your legs are extremely tired as soon as you're about to drop into the gnarliest part of the course. Oh. Lovely, shifty front three. One of the things, though, that you find, I think, having that lovely false sense of security, as you've called it, Mary, building up, it gives you a chance to relax and find your feet and say, oh, no, it's just snowboarding, I can do it, before you get to this. A little bit of hesitation, just checking out this line and going for it, staying on his feet. Beautiful Ooh. transition Ooh. finder, but he's got white room as he gets flushed through this funnel. All right, making it out. Looks like he's going to get on his toe edge there and kind of surf that rider's left wall. So let's see if he can make a couple poppers here. There we go. Nice, huge ollie. Have struggling a little bit in the landing, so... I mean, I would say Valiant go through that pillow line, got a little caught in between those two pillows and fell down, but picked himself right back up. I feel really strongly, as he makes his way out onto the apron here, I think we can discuss it, I feel it would be very, very cruel of the judges. Where he came onto his crux there to find his route, it was maybe a tiny hesitation, but it was momentary. I don't feel like that's going to play play a huge part in marking him down? No, I don't I don't think they'll they'll uh, you know deduct too many points for that pause at the top. Again, you know, this is the first time any of these riders are really getting a, a the, their first runs on this uh, course. So, I don't think they'll deduct any points for that, but of course, I think they will uh, you know, they will dock some points for him uh, kind of slipping out and going down through that runnel. Uh, and not being able to stay on his feet, especially, I mean, that was a gnarly line, but, but you know, Blake's run was just so clean, so smooth. So, I, you know, if I had to predict, I would say Blake's going to come out on the top on this one. I think, though, because I completely agree, I don't think it's going to be a huge deduction, but I think those moments of hesitation are potentially going oh, to be crazy. the hairs of points <laughs> that cause people to advance or not to advance when it comes down to it. Well, then it's going to, everyone watching this at the top is going to, this is a critical <laughs> matchup to watch. Nice do you, do you lay up? and give it a clean, like show the face a clean set of heels, or do you stretch yourself a bit, take the risk in the exposure? Let's take a look at each of these runs. Kicking off with Blake Paul, he just soared down the face, didn't he? That big wingspan that you see. And again, we, I definitely think that we can't not give Blake credit where credit is due because he makes things look easy. Yes. Like this was a gnarly first face to step to, and I think Blake really showed his prowess and just his, if you put money on Blake, you're stoked right now. <laughs> do you think that's one of the big issues, that Blake makes things look too casual? Yes, I actually do think that that is, it, it's odd, oddly enough, it can almost harm his scores because he makes it look too easy. Okay, Mikey, we saw that freestyle pedigree coming out all over the face. And he did bite off this big chunk of pillow up here. Yeah, and he it's actually... Oh, it looks longer, doesn't it? He did it does well. look longer. I mean, I'm really stoked that Mikey stepped to this on his first run because this is the kind of thing that natural selection puts these riders in these positions that maybe they haven't been in before. And, and even though he got sucked to the side there, he did, he rode very well. And there was, even though he was short, it was a tiny pocket of landing there. The transition that he had to find and line that up, that's going to max out those risk categories. Wow, 75.8 for Blake Paul, 57.8 from Mikey Cicerelli. A clear message from the judges there. There you go. They are rewarding Blake for staying on his feet and keeping things smooth and flowing nicely. Okay, so Travis Rice taking the lead so far against Ben Ferguson. Dustin Craven with the highest score so far. Only person up in the 80s right now uh, against Micklebank. Jared Elston taking the lead against Torstein Horgmo, but that one is very, very close. And then Blake Paul with a commanding lead over Mikey Cicerelli. OK, we're moving across now into the semi-finals for the women where they have their first runs. So much data for them to absorb from those men's runs. Well, what kind of mindset do you think they're in right now? Well, you know, one thing that's interesting is, you know, I, I think you can learn a lot from watching the, the, the first riders go, but also you're going to stick to that line that you've had memorized in your head. And who do we have dropping down, Mary? Zoe sadowski Sinnott. I mean, she is just the, the absolute natural. She took this tour by storm, and you can see her just barreling into... Nice, just gap right there. Barreling into the rider's right side of the course. 
22 years old today. And what did you say yesterday, Mary? It's a hell of a birthday hitting this uh, yeah. <laughs> in this terrain. <laughs> yeah. Not sure if it's a great birthday present or a terrible birthday present at this stage. We're about to find out. Heading far rider's right-hand side of the course. You can see Torstein Hogmo's line just to the left of her there. All right, going into this, uh, you know, what we were calling an avalanche path earlier. So, you know, in this path, you have a little bit more uh, visibility, uh, a little more uh, eyes on the line than you do going through those thick trees that are kind of more straight down from the drop in. Um, but you can still get into some pillows and, uh, and drops, which is, looks like what Zoe's doing right now. Oh, great cool. first drop, landing that so effortlessly as she comes down this face. And I think we've seen Zoe at so many different steps of her career over the past few years get into terrain that she has not been in before and she handles it very very well her ability to read just as she is now is is great yeah she's already got two solid drops at the start of this uh kind of traversing riders left trying to pick off a few more pillows a few more cliffs let's see what she gets into and there's some pretty consequential stuff right below her she's heading right to it <sighs> good yeah. chunk of exposure no nice. hesitation whatsoever you know, kind of pretty much stays on her feet, lays back a little bit, but I tell you what, that was a, a solid line, uh, line. And you know what we're seeing too, she hasn't been slowing down much. She's been keeping her, uh, her, her rhythm flowing. She, she's charging down this. <laughs> These uh, POV above <sighs> angles are just incredible. This is steep. I mean, this is gnarly. This is, this is almost like a, a miniature AK little spine zone right there. This is just a gigantic statement from Zoe sadowski Sinop. Making, we've seen some of the men making this face look really, really challenging. She's made that look deceptively easy. Top to bottom, that run was breathtaking. And right to the billy goat pack, like she knew exactly where it was the entire time. I mean, that's the power that she has. She comes out firing and just doesn't let off the gas. I was going to make the point at the top that she's arguably one of the best all-round snowboarders in the world right now. Olympic champion, world champion, two-time X Games slope style champion, first woman to lay down a switch backside 12 at the big air, start of the year, comes out, four natural selections. This is her fifth. She's won two of them. She's never been off the podium. The end of that run, I don't think there's any debate. She can transfer from a big air kicker on a fifth World Cup straight into a big pillow line in BC. That was immense. That was so well said. I like to say that it's like watching a young Michael Jordan. Like, she's <laughs> incredible. She's one of the best ever to do it. And I don't want to jinx anything by saying that, the curse of the announcer, but she's just an incredible rider. She rides with so much power, force, and style all in one. If I you're Haley Langland right now, you're... <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say, I think Zoe just set the bar extremely high for the entire women's field. So uh, I think they're all up there right now. Like, uh-oh, I better, <laughs> I need to step up my line. She had multiple drops on that run. She basically stayed on her feet the entire way, kind of went in the back seat a little bit on one of the larger cliffs. But overall, that was one of the smoothest runs we've seen. 100%. So, women's, we're going straight into the semi-finals. Four riders, same as the men, they get two runs head-to-head. -head. The highest score will advance through to the finals. Super simple on paper, but when you have a venue like this, it is much, much harder. Big risk for Zoe going in first there. She gets that creativity because it's the first time the judges have seen that line. Uh, she's also got the risk factor there, the choice of features. Anyone else, any of the other women heading over to that far rider's right-hand side of the venue now, technically they're following a track. They've got to cut their own path. But Hayley Langland, you've got to say, on the strength of her last couple of years, she's made a real statement. Front cover of Slush with that front seven. A standout part in fleeting time as well. And just one of the most stylish riders in snowboarding. I mean, the, what she's bringing from her slope style background to the backcountry is astounding. And as she heading da heads down into that rider's right side, no doubt she's kind of going for a similar setup as Zoe just did. We definitely saw it. Uh, Todd Richards' call with Blake Paul was that, and you guys both said it, he's light on his feet. Same for Haley. She is so light on her feet. And that, that skill, I think, is going to really pay off for her. This whole upper section just looks so fun. 
but I know for the riders, it is, uh, it's just anticipating what is to come. I do think it would settle you though. Those, that, that immense pressure cooker of nerves that build up while you've got to wait. Once, by getting this, you get to release a bit of that tension and think, oh, I can snowboard, I have got this. Yeah. This is exciting. We've all been watching Haley for years just crush slope style courses. And so seeing her on this terrain, this is a moment I think we've all been waiting for. She's getting into it here. All right, making her way down. Again, you know, something Ben Ferguson said at the bottom, he's like, all those trees look the same. <laughs> so, you know, oh, nice little tap on that pillow, little gap. This actually has echoes of Scary Cherry, doesn't it? With the tree spacing, the gradient, and the features. Yep, it absolutely does. And so far, Haley keeping up her speed, riding solid, linking her turns very smoothly. Looking in control, looking calm. These are all things that the, the judges are gonna take note of. Really nice double. And just takes that single down there, but landing everything very cleanly. And as you can tell, yeah, this, is, this course is two times longer than any other uh, natural selection course that they have done. So uh, it is a leg burner. Okay, you can start to see this really steep pillow terrain. So easy to overcook it and let the speed get away from you on the landings here. I love these views. It, makes, it really gives you a perspective of how difficult Ooh. it is to really see, uh, see your line. First time we've seen a stall, and she's kept it moving nicely. All right, so Haley navigating her way into this zone. It looks pretty, pretty scary. Yeah, that's very complex. This angle really shows you that steepness right there. Well, the fact that there's a snow ramp straight in front of her that she can't see because of the way it's rolling over. Uh, all right. There we go. Comes out clean. Checking speed with a little toe side turn there and then making her way down to the bottom of the course. Yeah, makes the apron. A, a really solid run. Oh, just got kicked off. Yeah, I, you know, I don't even think, you know, I don't think, I think by that time the judges are, uh, it looks like she got caught in just a little slough there. And, uh, but at this point, I think the judges are, are done scoring the run. Yeah, I'm sure this is a bit of leg burn. I mean, that's a heck of a run right there. Yeah, absolutely huge. And it, what's really hard is that was actually a very, very solid run. But you've got to compare it against Zoe. Definitely. And I think I, the more we see, I think the more that run from Zoe is going to stand out. Zoe definitely navigated toward um, a bit of those pillows a, a bit more than Haley did, but Haley still rode with great intention and she kept her speed for the majority of everything. But yes, Zoe did hit a bit of the, more of those features. Okay, so blasting over that same hit that we saw Torstein getting into at the start. Get some eyes on. I mean, that right there was a solid drop right in the trees, navigating a few of those other large marshmallows in there. And then, I mean, look at this clip this right section. here. This section. It all that collapses. Just... Yeah. And you know, again, she, she, she kind of butt checks a little bit, but not really. She keeps up her speed. She gets back up on her board very quickly. And uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, as far as the first run goes, I think both uh, had a very solid performance, but I think Zoe is going to walk away with the higher score. Haley was dead. I think they were very, very similar for the top half of the course. Yep. I think on just as it rolled into that pillow section down at the bottom, Haley just started to pull up a little bit here. And we talked about this in Alaska last year. It's like a bank robbery. You hold up. This is time in the vault. Yeah. Exactly. Like you, you're running out. You're burning that time. That was a great angle. The that. Yeah, the judges are chasing you down the moment you saw. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. I think we're going to see similar score to the one we saw from Craven up in the 80s here from Zoe. <laughs> there it is. Wow, 80 points, 63.8 for Haley Langland, 80 points for Zoe sadowski Sinop, And she allows herself a little, just a hint of a smile there at that one. Both only 22 years old. That's what's so mind-blowing. They're so young. Yeah, we've answered that question about whether it's the worst or the best birthday present ever. I think Zoe Sadowski's not really enjoying this one now.
And we go back up to the top to begin the second of our two semi-final duels for the women here at the Yeti Natural Selection in Revelstoke. Elena Height going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kimi Fasani. Elena, unbelievable. I mean, she was a very, very solid rider coming into Natural Selection, but the stride she's made under the watchful eye of Jeremy Jones in big mountain terrain over the last couple of years surely puts her as one of the favorite, the favorite rider, I think, coming into this event. She's one of the most dominant riders in the backcountry, full stop. And you can tell by the way, she is charging toward the guts right now. She's taking that rider's right line, but no hesitation. She, she looks like she's going exactly where she wants to be going. All right, Elena starting to get into some of these trees on this first bench before she gets into the thick of it. She's kind of doing some setup turns again, looking looking confident and looking smooth so far. And taking an untouched zone too, landing that very flawlessly. She's heading into that rider's left section of that more open avalanche path, which is definitely more technical and getting to more of that really meat potatoes aspect. Yeah, and to take note, you know, she did not take either of the previous two, uh, you know, two path tracks, uh, you know, so she's a little bit, looks a little bit left of Zoe's track right now. So coming into this event, defending natural selection tour champion. She's wearing the pressure. She's got the target on her back. But she's, she's almost got the luxury of a range finding run here, hasn't she? And here we go, getting into that complex terrain right now. Same cliff as Zoe? I believe it. Just yet, no. No, new, oh, wow. wow, look at this section. Oh, a little bobble, but still, you know, stayed on her feet. Still kept her speed up. What's lovely, the snow's consolidated a tiny bit from those first couple of days, and it's not white rooming or sloughing quite as much as we were expecting. Yeah, I, 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 don't even, I don't think you could get more perfect snow conditions for a day like today and for this terrain. So she's taking a very challenging uh, run right here. Well, she's got to keep in mind that her competitor and very good friend, Kimi Fasani, dropping next, is going to be going for this sort of thing right away, too. She can't lay up on this one at all. She's got to go for it, which is definitely where what Elena usually does. <laughs> I mean, goes for it. Yep. <laughs> all right. Getting a little, oh, just kind of, I think she actually just kind of scrubbed. I think she wanted to go off the tip of that, but uh, unfortunately lost a little bit of speed, but nice little transfer gap there. Oh, and uh, bashing that last pillow. Looks like she's kind of cruising down towards oh, the bottom here. But turn. I mean, that was, uh, that, 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 that's going to be a pretty tough run to beat. But if anybody can, it's Kimi Fasani. I think we see Elena going straight for the technical aspect, which is really cool and really interesting because she's just navigating. It looked as if she's going to that rider's right side, but she detoured, stuck right along the edge of that very technical Revelstoke terrain and, and put one down. Okay, Kimi Fasani up next, a household name in snowboarding. And this incredibly talented rider is, in a sense, beginning a new chapter in her career on the Natural Selection Tour. Let's hear a little bit more about her journey up to this point. If you would have told me a year ago that I would be standing on the top of the hemlocks at Mammoth Mountain with a crew about to drop into the natural selection, I wouldn't have believed you. Kimi Fasani is the archetype of the changing face of women's snowboarding. She's just broken all the boundaries. And now she's a pioneer for all women in sports, all female athletes. She helped all of us women with that. I was like, if I ever decide to get kids, I know now there is a person that did it before of me and made it work. Here, this is the doctor. Five years ago, this started with my mom having cancer. This is not something that I see even once a year. This is something that I've seen a handful of times in my career. Even though you were so young, my goal with you was to make sure you were alive to take care of your kids. Now going through cancer, I've got to a point where I'm more free and I'm so much more my true self, but I would have never found that if we didn't have to go through all of that. At the end of the day, I really feel like all of these lessons that we go through are a way to pass down knowledge to other people.
Well, if struggles make you strong, Kimi Fasani is a warrior. She comes into the natural selection tour with a new lease on life. Got the clearance from that rare inflammatory stage three breast cancer on the 1st of October. She's come straight back into natural selection jewels. Uh, she beat Dara Reed McLean in Mammoth, and now she faces Elena Height here in Revelstoke. She has some incredible parts under her belt in Alaska as well. She took on spines in the realm of the legendary Noah Salasnek. I mean, she's got the smarts to, to make this venue work for her. Kimmy's an absolutely incredible rider, and this run is no doubt a celebration for her being back exactly where she feels most like herself in the mountains in deep snow and we can see that with her careening down to that rider's right section right now like this is where she belongs Kimi i was sunny at nerves of steel i i it it just makes me so happy and so excited to see kimmy back on her board and absolutely killing it um yeah, just such, such an incredible human being and, and such an, uh, an amazing, unbelievable story from this, uh, this past year. And she looks like she's taking similar, uh, that section that Elena took kind of on that edge line of the avalanche path. Ooh, oh. going down off of that, but right back, back, right back up on her feet. Yeah, it looks like she uh, caught a little, almost uh, was a little toe heavy and kind of bounced to her stomach, but got up real quick and was back on her board before you knew it. And uh, let's see how she continues this run. She's got great flow through here. Yeah, and again, I think judges reward flow. They reward when you just look confident, you look like you know where you're going. Um, and uh, let's see where she looks like she's getting into a bit of a cliff band right here. She just took a glance out to her right as well. It was like she was orientating herself, wasn't it? Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. I, it was almost, I wasn't sure if she was just kind of scoping that or if she was like, uh oh, where am I? Because you never, that's the scenario you don't want to have. Oh, here we go, looking at some exposure right below her. Navigating to drop right here. Oh, oh. Ooh, a little bit of a butt check, but getting back up on her feet again. You know, and I, you know, oh. What I want to like mention as well is, you know, in those runnels and and in those those, it's kind of where all the snow sloughs out. It is not as soft in there as you would think. Um, it it can be a lot trickier to navigate. There's a lot of little ridges and and uh, bumps and bobbles in there. So if you if you go in there, it's no wonder uh, that it's easy to get knocked off your feet. But that was solid right yeah. there. Yeah. Kicking up a big spray over those cliffs. Oh. Gorgeous turn. Yes, yeah, so you, you'll see her coming across this slough right here, and that's that's kind of firm right there. You know, that's not soft powder, and you'll have that up on the course. So it's not all just you know pillows and uh, and blower pow up there. Well, it's the one that apron at the bottom is the one sun affected area. I spoke with Kimmy before she entered natural selection, and you know she was asking herself. Am I ready? Am I physically ready to get back at this after having to take the full year off of snowboarding last year? You lose so much muscle mass in that situation. And, and she said, am I ready? And her ultimate, you know, final thought was, are we ever really ready? You know, and Great. coming back to this, I think just being able to ride this so soon after going through what she did is Fuck. really incredible. That was fucking bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> she said that was bonkers. Yeah. Straight from the horse's mouth. Yes. <laughs> 100%, I think that echoes uh, exactly the sentiments the last 11 riders have felt. So, Kimi Fasani and Elena Height, the last matchup of our 12 riders on these first runs, the first taste of Boulder Park here in the Selkirk Tangiers heli tenure at Revelstoke Mountain Resort. Elena Height really got stuck into some decent exposure here. God, she's just so good at adapting to terrain. And you can see here, just heading into that, those massive drops right there yeah. and being able to navigate that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, getting that, seeing that recap is re re really helpful too, to see how difficult that terrain is to manage. And here we go, getting a, another glimpse of Kimmy's run. Definitely a little 
Bucky in there right now. But yeah. She did so well there. You talked about it, Eddie, at the time. When you've got that gradient and those runnels where the face has been releasing, the gradient change between those. Nice work. Me too. All right, I'm down here with the one, the only, Kimmy Fasani. Kimmy, I would like to officially welcome you back. Oh, thank you! That was so fun! <laughs> Your journey has been nothing short of inspirational, and we're so happy to have you back. But I want to talk about the course. You had a great quote down there. It's bonkers? Yeah, bonkers, because <laughs> nothing from down here is what it looks like up there. So as you're going, you just have to really be ready for anything. Runnels are a lot deeper. There's a lot more tender to navigate, but uh, the snow is really good. So here we are. Wonderful. Kimmy, that was an amazing run. Can't wait for the scores to come in. We're going to head back to the booth as these scores come in and keep this thing going. Thank you, T-Bird. What a yeah. treat to have Kimmy Fasani back on the board. Elena Height with the 74. Kimmy Fasani nice with some work to do in the second run with a 58.2. Uh, we're going to get the second <laughs> runs underway very shortly, and we're going to tag team and bring in Todd Richards, Hannah Beeman, and All Pat right. Bridges for those second oh runs. Gosh, uh, in the meantime, though, before we hand over, we're going to take a look at the area that's hosting us today in the province of British Columbia. This is a closer look at Revelstoke Mountain Resort. In southeastern British Columbia, Canada, in the northern part of the Kootenays and nestled on the bank of the Great Columbia River, lies a little place called Revelstoke. The Columbia is fed by the Illicillouette Glacier, and the watershed surrounding the river bears exceptional ecological significance. The area is so wondrous that Mount Revelstoke National Park was founded in 1914. Revelstoke Mountain Resort is situated on Mount Mackenzie and boasts the longest inbounds vertical of any resort in North America. A staggering 1,700 meters of vertical terrain. While receiving an average of 10.5 meters of snow annually. That's over 34 feet of snow per winter. Revelstoke sits amidst an inland temperate rainforest, which is an ideal climate for snowfall accumulation in the winter months. It rests in the perfect location for cold air to sweep down from central and northern BC and collide with the moisture from the west. This convergence of hot and cold airflow wrings out the moisture from storm systems and dumps snow on the town and the surrounding mountains. Formed by the continental drift over millions of years, Revelstoke's unique location in the Selkirk Range makes it an epic playground for all mountain freestyle snowboarding and a perfect host resort for the Natural Selection Tour, where the best backcountry snowboarders will battle it out for all the glory. Welcome back to Natural Selection Tour here outside of Revelstoke Resort in British Columbia. I mean, we have seen an incredible showcase of snowboarding so far this morning. I've been completely gripped watching these guys go down this course and women too. Todd Richards here, Hannah Beeman, Pat Bridges. We have seen some incredible riding here this morning. Hannah, your thoughts right now before we head straight back out to the course. I'm, I am jacked from watching yeah, this. Right? <laughs> it's like, I am so impressed with everybody just navigating in and finding their lines and making it down. It's so fun to watch so far. Pat, what's been the most impressive thing you've seen this morning? Well, I think the most impressive thing is the riders being able to adapt. I mean, there is no easy line down this face. We knew that from first look. And everybody got out of their comfort zone, but yeah. they were able to manage. And that's the thing I saw that I was most impressed with. Well, straight back up on the course, Travis Rice, <laughs> he came through here and pioneered the very first line on this course this morning. And my gosh, it was a heavy one. Hannah, Pat, talk us through this run. I mean, I think we saw pure Travis coming through this morning. He got out there, he's hungry, he wants to get on those lines and, and show people what 
what he has. So I think we're seeing Travis in pure Travis form. The question that I have, Pat, too, is like, you know, you come down through, through some of these heavy lines straight down in the gut of this course, but once you come through those, they're kind of done because of the amount of sloughing and the hardening up of the snow afterwards. So what do you think uh, Travis's strategy is here now that he's kind of got to lay the land? Well, I mean, Travis obviously had first look on the uh, course for the last couple weeks as he chose the venue. But one advantage he didn't have going into the first run is he didn't see the lines, whereas all the other riders got to see the riders before them. Now he's in the same boat as some of the later riders. He saw where they went, and he's probably like, oh, I want to follow that track and go into that line. One of my most favorite things about this contest is when the drone pulls back and we see what the riders are about to experience before they do. Huge ollie into this shoot right here. A lot of speed management going on. Oh, boy. Oh, that was a good... Travis knows his way around this, this course. He's been studying this for who knows how long. Huge front three. I mean, Trav is just... His, his terrain reading ability is so far beyond the normal human being. He always picks out lines that nobody sees. And that's the, the fun part about riding Travis. You think you know what he's gonna do, and then he totally shifts and does something like that and kind of gaps across a feature that you just wouldn't have seen before. Pat, what, uh, compare and contrast that from his run number one. Well, run number one was a total unknown for everybody mm -hmm. here, including Travis, largely. But what we just saw with that 360 is a harbinger of what I think we're going to see. Now that everybody's done a full run, and now that they've seen where everybody's went, and they yeah. kind of have an idea of whose path to follow to get to what features, I think now is when we're going to start seeing some more tricks. Some tricks, yeah, sure. And that's the crazy thing about Travis and, and basically all of the riders that are competing here, is their ability to spin off of things that have no pop, that are just dropaways, that have no real... Uh, takeoff put into it. I think that's probably one of the most impressive things to me is being able to generate that pop and actually do tricks. And I think where we're going to see the tricks are on the margins. Far riders left, far riders right, where it's a little bit more wide open and you're not getting funneled right into those big cliff lines. Mm -hmm. The unique thing about that. pillows like this is it doesn't set you up for easy tricks. It's you got to be, you know, light on the feet, have some fancy footwork. Right to be able to do tricks on these features. Oh, shit. Well, top to bottom, that was the smoothest run we've seen yet. Yeah, easily. Ferguson right now, I, I'm, I would imagine that he's, is he looking at his phone, going through that line, looking at, because everyone, all they have is just digital images of what they're going to be doing for a run. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the, the beta that these Frag guys have is uh, drone footage, which is in, incredibly helpful. Like the photos and the 2D images can only yeah. do so much. The drone footage really helps to navigate, at least for me in, in previous courses, the drone footage is a world changer. All right, Ben Ferguson coming out of Bend, Oregon, found himself on top of a fairly intimidating cliff. Mm -hmm. A uh, <laughs> very indecent exposure. Yeah in a little area we call it shoot your drawers because <laughs> it was incredibly huge uh, and he navigated it great, but now he has a better lay of the land. So it's gonna be interesting to see what Ferg does here. And I mean, talk about this matchup, these two titans of being able to read terrain and hit stuff and go absolutely massive and put the landing gear down and ride out clean. Ben Ferguson up against Rice. This is, this is the heaviest heat of the day in, in my opinion. Certainly, and both these riders seem to have a way to will their way through a situation they shouldn't be able to land. All right, here we go. Ferg getting the start on his run. As we've been saying, this is the false sense of security up here. This is when you're not even really enjoying these powder turns, although he just did a huge back three and made the little tranny finder. Well, this is all like insurance. What you're able to do up here as far as tricks and whatnot is able to bolster really what is the most consequential part of the run. That's right, but you don't want to you don't want to eat too much chips and salsa before you get to the burrito. You know what I'm saying, Pat? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, definitely sets your mind on a bad path if you fall up top. I think it'll be really interesting to see if Ben goes back towards the same area to build off of kind of what he did 
accidentally almost, or if he's going to try and find the line he meant to get into the first run. So we'll get to see. Well, here's where it all comes together, as you can see, and mm -hmm. it's so blind for these guys. Oh, you can just hear how hard some of that snow is in there, just where these pillows have crusted off and fallen. It's, it's not soft snow. One. Certainly, and when you're crossing the tracks that have been laid down before you, they're definitely oh, set up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Ferg has found himself on top of a large exposure of rock. Mm -hmm. What's his line going to be? Well, he's navigating it really well right there. I nice. mean, getting out of a mandatory air situation. Yeah, that was... That took a little bit of self-talk to get, get all, all over that one, I'm sure. You have Ferg trying to navigate his way through here into the open section down towards the bottom of the course. I mean, very technical line from Ferg up there, but Travis absolutely chucking that big front three into mm -hmm. that chute. The technicality was there for Trav, I think, over Ferg. Yeah, I think Ferguson is taking some really, you know, burly lines, but you can sense the hesitation, and I think that that, that kind of throws him off of his flow, and, and you see Travis kind of, you know, following through a little bit more, and you see his confidence showing a little more in his run. Yeah, it just, and it really does come down to line choice. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's really what today is all about. The course is the biggest competitor you will face. It's paying attention to who's matched up with you in these head-to-heads is nonsense. It's really, where are you gonna go? Is my line going to be true from what I think it's going to be? And uh, Travis definitely had the advantage on that one. Well, you can't discount, too. The riders have a feed at the top of the course. Mm -hmm. So you know everybody is watching where everybody Jim? else went. Rook, Mom. All right, this is a recap of what we just saw. Talk us through Trav's and Ferg's run here. Well, Ben taking a nice drop up top. Or Travis, actually. Yeah, that transfer from Travis was huge, amazing. I think that really shows just how how aggressive Travis is in this kind of terrain. Look at the front three right there. It just lands in a wheelie, powers through mm -hmm. that little step down. Perfect. Found the best snow. And then Ferg, we didn't know where he was going to go. Look at that big back three mm -hmm. into the step down. But, I mean, he kind of ended up almost in the same, a similar situation that he did in run number one. Mm -hmm. Similar, but not, he knew what to expect this time. He knew going onto that face, you're just going to have to have faith. And, and when in doubt, kind of take the conservative exit, I think. Listen here. Well, so we're waiting to see some scores here. So second run score is coming in, an 80 for Travis Rice is 69.2 for Ferg. So Travis will be moving on out of this bracket from the men's quarterfinals into the semis. Mm -hmm. Strong riding from Travis on that second run. That was one of the biggest matchups we will see. Well, Horace speaks. Is Trav uh, insinuating that he turns into a werewolf when there's a full moon? Is that, is that what we got going on here? But I got to say, I mean, let's hear it for Ben. Ben was the second yeah. rider to drop. Absolutely. Ben mm -hmm. was the first rider to find himself in the middle of the gut, you know, shoot your pants. Yeah. He was like the first rider to have to sit there and, and have the come to Jesus moment. Like, do I send it or <laughs> do, do I ride it out? Yeah, Ben went in like headfirst into the, the thick zone. So kudos to him for, for really stepping up. All right, let's hear from more from Mickelbang. Let's hear from more from Mickelbang, who's going to be on this course next. Going against Craven up in Revelstoke is, you know, this is his spot. You know, he's local and he's really good at riding terrain like this. So I think uh, I just got to go, I got to go Kootenai on him. You know, I got to go, I got to go do something, something similar that, that he does. Big pillow lines and yeah, we'll see. That's a great point, you know, going up against Dustin Craven in this, te this terrain, I mean, it, You've got to dig deep, but we've got a Viking here. Mikkel Bang is a very strong rider. He is, rides with so much power. 
Now, when you were taken to this course, Hana, you think like you want to have more light touch like Blake Paul had in first run, or do you want to be a hammer like uh, Mikkel could possibly be here through this run? I mean, I think you want to stay pretty light footed. Uh, pillows are not my forte, so I'm still learning. But <laughs> from what I understand, you want to keep your legs pretty strong but loose so you can kind of absorb those pillows as you go through them. But if you get into a tough spot, definitely somebody like Mikkel can really muscle through some some of, I don't know, maybe a mistake or a uh, flatter landing. So Mikkel is definitely capable of riding a, a face like this very well. And I think it's just a matter of line selection for these guys. Yeah, you don't want to end up in a pillow fight because you're going to lose on this course here because, I mean, the terrain is so big. If you miscalculate, on your takeoff on the first one because obviously you want to pair these up. You want to match these pillows up so you can ride them down in a line. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like Mikel's trying to correct after the first run where he found himself in that ravine or the runnel. Um, he's taken a much more wide open line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, run number one, he found himself in the lower intestine of this course. And I don't really understand, like it was just weird. We didn't even see that on the marked up uh, the, the intel that we had here, there's just, there's so much in this terrain that you can't see is completely blind to us as we look at the images and totally blind for the riders when they come up on it. As we see Mikkel here trying to find his way through this little slough off of that cliff right there. Again, these are like perfect conditions for this terrain. And sometimes in these in these pillows and stuff like this, sometimes you just have to have to point your point your board SFD and just send it and hold on. It's a little bit like a rodeo out there at times. It is kind of a rodeo. I mean, it's it's especially now as we get some more tracks in this terrain, you got to be on your feet as he comes down here through the bottom half of the section. You can see how just those little slough outs are being really difficult to navigate. And that does it for Mikkel Bang's second run here. Well, with the temperatures, with the shadows, anything that's been ridden, anything that's been sloughed out, ah. it's setting up from run to run. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, another thing that we need to mention, too, is Travis yeah, purposely picked this terrain in the shade to keep the snow conditions prime for this event. All right. We're going to take a little break right now. We come back. Dustin Craven takes to the course. Is he going to set himself up on another six stack of pillows? Stick around. Find out. He's proved it in Jackson Hole. He's proved it in Boldface. Fourth and fifth places, respectively. And now he's in the semifinal places. If you can beat Mark McMorris here, he's on for a natural selection. Best ever finish. You see that strategy right there going front one into some very nice switch turns right there. And we know that the judges will be salivating over this. This is exactly what they want to see. And that's where you see, oh, he's going cab five right there. And this is where we see the nature of Torstein's ability to, to compete and strategize really, really come through because it's been years since he's been in a bib and it really suits him just great still. Okay, so he's got a heavy top section there. What's he going to do as he makes his way down into this exposure at the bottom? He's got a big diving board to play with here. Doubles, uses that as a lily pad in the middle. Beautiful line choice. Frontside oh! 720. Oh! What? OK, he is putting the pressure on McMorris right now. Here we go, here we go. This is video game oh! stuff. This doesn't happen. You can't do this in a single run. A beautiful what? method into a wonderful butter. Like Wonder a oh, pretzel oh, butter out of a heel side turn into a bang side oh, nose butter. Torstein Horgmo has just gone absolutely ham. This is arguably not just some of the best contest riding Alaska's ever seen. This might be some of the best oh, yeah. riding. Straight back up to the top, Dustin Craven about to drop, had one of the most spectacular runs we saw in round one. And Pat, you've been saying it from the get-go that Craven is the one to beat out here because this terrain is so familiar to him. Oh, absolutely. And Craven has the highest score of the day so far. But as we saw a little bit with Mikel, certainly we saw with Ben and Travis, is what is Dustin looking to do on this second run? I got to say, Mikel definitely upped his score from the first run. Um, 
And here goes Dustin. He lives right down the road, right here in Revelstoke, British Columbia. Films here. He's filmed Oh Man, Oh Boy. And he's going to show us a little bit of that technique right now. I mean, you have to note this, is that Craven has been typically known as a bit of a loose cannon when it comes to <laughs> things. Just things, you know, mainly Super Park or just being hanging around nice. with people. Holy oh. cow! Full Tommy right there, but got back up on his feet. But I think that, you know, having no fear and a innate ability to trust your own instincts in the worst possible situations, whether that be uh, two in the morning outside a bar or flying through the woods at a super park. I mean, he's he's a cut above the rest. Yeah, and I think, you know, Dustin put down a really good score his first run, so I'm excited to see how he levels up on this one. He might get a little trickier out there. He might try a more serious pillow stack, um, but he's sitting in a good position, so he can kind of push, push his, his boundaries a little bit there. As we pull back and we can kind of see what he's telegraphing into over here, I mean, he's, set, he's setting himself up straight back into that, that heater zone where every feature mm -hmm. over there is a solid 30 feet at minimum. And that was a really good angle to see the scale of these features. The riders look like ants up there, and it really like kind of lets you see how big these things are. Yeah, and then where he's going right now, I mean, he's heading straight into a cinnamon toothpick of a face. It's, it's spicy and it's sharp. So let's see if Craven can billy goat his way in here and find a clean line that yeah. gives him an opportunity for some air time and potentially uh, so he can Super Mario off some of these pillows. Yeah, I think he's got an eye on a diving board in there somewhere. So let's see if he can find it. Yeah, it appears to be like he's pioneering a whole different zone over here, riders left. But he's got some room to make up. He fell on the back one. He yep. uh, submarined on the back three. So, but this is where he shines. He's over here, pine tree peeping. Mm -hmm. We call that Tarzani. What's he got? Okay, <laughs> he's going for a little elevator drop right there, straight into another <sighs> section. You can hear him kind of grunting through it. Fuck. We apologize for the language, but this is just how it goes. I mean, it, these guys are in such crazy situations here that are just full of adrenaline. No one, you know, this is all unridden territory. Even though Dustin lives in Revelstoke, he's never ridden this face either. And everything has got such high consequences. I uh, asked Dustin if he filmed for any projects up here, and he said oh. nobody's sledded in this zone, so... Nobody's really filmed up here. Mm. All right, well, Craven does a uh, series of raggies down at the bottom here, but he's still Ooh, sitting on the highest rack. scoring run of the day. Yeah, I don't think he's gonna be happy with that, but he had a good first run, so hopefully that'll hold for him. Well, again, the riders are watching this from the 10 up top, and they're getting all the information they can get, so they're probably like, well, I was gonna go into that mm -hmm. zone, maybe not. Oh. <laughs> They're just so fatigued as they come down to the bottom. The question that I have too is like, when you're going into that, you come out of the false sense of security upper section and you're about to head into the meat and potatoes of the run. Mm -hmm. How many of these riders are like, uh oh, I hope that's not Ben's track from run number <laughs> one. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this is the sketchiest part. All right, let's head back up to the top for the recap of these runs here. We saw Mikkel Bang decide to go over to riders right, a more open face where you can kind of get a better a better scope at things as you come into it. Mm -hmm. This part of the course, to me, um, lends itself more to like some freestyle tricks and stuff like that. So I love to see some of the riders maybe do a couple more, a couple more tricks or spins over in this more open area. But I guess time will time will tell. All right, and there we go, Dustin Craven, switch back one. Straight away, Pat, I mean, this this line compared to his first, I mean, do you feel like he kind of got lost in the woods a little bit to where he ended up? Well, I, you know what? Dustin might already be thinking one or two parts of the bracket ahead and saying, Just scoping. hey, I want to see what's over here, thinking that he was drawing that big lead in. And I think we could all agree, Mikkel's probably going to pull away with a higher Ooh. score for the second run. The question right. is, will it best Dustin's first run? I think that's going to be really hard to do as we're waiting for scores here. So Craven has the advantage. A little bit of scratch on Craven's nose. And that'll do it. Craven will move on.
Mikkel Bang has been no. eliminated, no. but still <laughs> solid showing. Hell yeah. That was sick. Get up the line. Craven. Who do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Craven is such a jokester. He is one of the funnest people to hang out with because he's always very, very serious in his riding, but he keeps it lighthearted and in the conversation and playing around. Yeah, I mean, look, you've got him setting himself up here for potentially later on. All right, back to the top. Torstein Horgmo coming out of Norway. Freestyle God. If there is a situation here where we have a track in on something, Torstein could potentially throw sevens. You know, who knows? But this, this course really doesn't lend itself to the huge rotations. But as mm -hmm. we saw in his duels, Torstein, once he gets a track in, you never know what's going to happen. He might surprise us. Well, I uh, hopefully he's doing some more uh, tree bonking like he was doing on that first run. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. A little bit different line than he took on run number one. First run, he went way over to Ryder's right and kind of opened up that whole piece of terrain. Now he's just going straight down into the middle here. Front side 180 to set himself up. Pulling a long face here, switch. Which as we saw in the duels with Mills, it's very consequential. That is one of the hardest things to do is to ride switch pow and do it gracefully. <laughs> He's looking for an, another line over in here. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you can see how many tracks are currently being set into the middle of this. Now it's, it comes down to like figuring out where you're gonna go mm -hmm. from there. So, towards nine, dropping in switch, pulling the half cab, now he finds himself in some of the more colorful parts of the <laughs> slope here. And this, I think, is where we kind of saw Mikey trying to get into. All right, and Mikey got dragged yeah. into that little chute over there to the looker's left. That's where Mikey ended up and kind of went down that wash. And here's some Travis lines. We see this is kind of where Travis got a little tricky in this zone. The long shot is where you see all the options. Mm -hmm. There we go. Big back three drifting into that chute, trying to hold on to that heel edge. That snow in the middle of that chute is not soft. Torstein just putting on a clinic up there. One little bobble, trying to find something to hunt and peck to get a little air time here. Well, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing riders go into the, the tech, technical gut of the course. We'll be seeing a lot of pillows. A lot of cliffs in there, and now we're starting to see the tricks come into play in that mm -hmm. zone. We saw it with Travis and then Torstein right there with the back three. Yeah, a lot of the times this first run um, that we saw, that's kind of just feeling out the territory, seeing what things are looking like. And on these, these second runs, we'll see people kind of maybe trying some different tricks, kind of getting a little more creative, because you just don't really know until you get in there. So that first run is really a lot of beta coming in and your second run is where you can kind of do the run you planned a little bit more. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised that he actually, he didn't go back to where he was the first run and try mm -hmm. to like throw some right. tricks in there. That would be the strategy you'd think from a rider like Torstein, particularly after we saw the duels, which was pretty much a backcountry freestyle clinic. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of backcountry, backcountry is the outerwear partner of the Natural Selection Tour. All the snow safety, staff four, and production crew are wearing highly functional backcountry gear, and you need it because this is no joke backcountry where these guys are staging, where the camera operators are. You've got to get in and through all this. So big thanks to backcountry for partnering up and providing everyone with that snow safety gear. Let's. Let's take a look at this piece. It gives you more info on the gear. Riding in British Columbia, especially riding around here, I mean, it's as good as it gets. As far as terrain goes, BC is like the most diverse place in the world. And I think a lot of people are drawn here because uh, it is just like a Mecca. Backcountry riding, it just has another level of presence due to the nature of the responsibility that comes with being out in these locations. You know, you are at the mercy of your own decision making. 
and the decision making of the group of people you're with. And frankly, when it's done right, that's, that's really empowering. You're out there on Mother Nature's terms. When you step outside a ski area boundary and a controlled area, you are definitely arriving at uh, true uncontrolled wilderness. Avalanche terrain recognition and companion rescue training and planning for outings by getting educated on the resources that are available are the number one sort of ways to prepare yourself for going out there. Backcountry safety orientation is what we choose to call it at Selkir Tangiers, but really it's a way to make sure that everybody is up to speed on the appropriate techniques. How to wear their transceiver, how to use their transceiver to find somebody, how to shovel and probe in case that there is an avalanche. And certainly they don't need to be experts or professionals at it, but the basic knowledge of the basic skills is really, really essential before heading out there with anybody. Responsible behavior in the backcountry. It's, it's critical that everyone in the group has done their due diligence and takes it serious. Avalanches don't really recognize whether you're a novice or an expert, and even experts can get caught off guard all the time, and having less experienced people around that are trained in the right techniques to enact a good companion rescue is essential. Heading out into the backcountry is an empowering experience and I encourage everybody to attempt and try to get out there, provided that they are aware of the risks and they know what they're getting themselves into and are properly trained with the proper equipment. It's a beautiful way to spend a wonderful day in the mountains. And a big shout out to BCA for providing the transceivers and to Kine for providing these vests that these riders are wearing today. It's all about safety out here. Nothing is done just haphazardly with natural selection. All right, Jared Ellison up next right now, coming out like a bat out of hell, as Jared typically does. Mm -hmm. He is ready. Well, Jared is the uh, youngest rider in the field as far as the men goes today, so he's bringing those fresh legs, that exuberance. Taking the middle line here, nice frontside poke off the first feature. Great tap. A little bushwhacking right there. <laughs> All right, so Jared coming into his second run here at the Yeti Natural Selection at Revelstoke. If you're just joining us, you are in the middle of the men's semi, uh, excuse me, quarterfinals. Each one of these riders has two runs down through this course to put on their best choice of line, creativity to be smooth, potentially put tricks out there, and basically just navigate this crazy terrain in the best way possible. Jared coming into a Big open face right here. Some decisions to be made right now, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. And like we mentioned before, you have a plan when you go into to your run, but that plan can change in an instant, and you have to stay really versatile and be able to make split but second decisions to, to adjust your line and, and keep going. Pat, I'm starting to notice a pattern here with the riders. It's really easy to get pulled into that central gullet of this course. It is a central gullet, but I, what I find interesting about Jared's line right here is it seemed like he had more visibility. When we were looking at it from the drone angle, it wasn't as many blind rolls or blind pillows as some of the other entrances, which means uh, Jared might have had more intention with his line and been able to sit there, look two, three, four features down the line and know how to get there and know what to expect as opposed to that spontaneousness where you're like, oh, well, this is a mandatory. I got to drop or I got to bail right. out. Mm -hmm. Well, Jared has the advantage right now up against Torstein. So big air, Jared. We're going to have to see if that run actually will keep him in the lead. Torstein had an interesting run, a couple of backside 360s in there, a little bit blending the freestyle with, you know, basically this kind of big mountain navigation riding that's been going down here. This course is so much different than anything that we've ever seen in natural selection history. And man, the game has been upped, that's for sure. Riding pillows like these is a really good example of uh, the term blind faith. Right. You really you're have to know. Braille boarding. Yeah, where you're going and really committing to it. So these two down here sharing some intel on their runs. It seems like, you know, the common consensus down the bottom is, whew, glad I survived that. That seems to be the ongoing theme here as we see Torstein's first run kind of brought him into that same area that we saw Jared in as well. 
Yeah, the half cab up top, a little bit of flavor as he uh, gets ready for the storm below. Is that backside 360? Yeah, that was nice. Kind of a wild ride out of that too. Being able to hold on to that was great board control. And even though it looks really nice and fluffy and there's good right. conditions out there, the snow conditions do vary literally from aspect to aspect. So it could be super fluffy and nice on the pillows. And then once you get into those runnels, it could be chunky and icy. Yeah, that's that. it's very deceiving. And we're looking at the GoPro, the drone GoPro angle. And that really is, it's making this event so much more exciting because to be able to see what the riders have in store before the riders do, it just builds that sense of anticipation from the audience. All right, so here we go, waiting for scores here. Once again, Big Air Jer with the advantage. And Torstein will take the second run, but it will not be enough to overtake Jared Ellison. So the kid from Bend moves on into the semis. Look at well, that. I, I think what did it for Jared was on his first run where he was on that knife edge ridge and he just took it down the line, yeah. whereas there is like no go left and let it ride really close to what wasn't even an option. All right, straight back into it. Blake Paul rides like a gravy sandwich, smooth. I don't even know where I was going with that one, but he's a very, very smooth rider. He's super light on his feet. As Eddie was saying earlier, he's got bird bones. He really does. His bones are hollow. It seems like he's, he just finesses his board around the hill, whatever he's doing. And it just seems like it's so easy for him. I think where you're going was like open face sandwich with extra gravy. Yeah, it's not really, but well, I'll go with that. Whatever <laughs> makes it seem less offensive. But here we go as Blake tries to find his way, hunting and pecking down here through uh, Goldilocks's forest. And it is so easy to get lost in here, especially when you're forging your own trail. You see those little S turns that he's doing. He's trying to keep that momentum going forward, but not too much of a pace because he really doesn't know what he's coming up on. And you know, one of the mountains that I think would give a rider an advantage in this terrain is Jackson Hole where Blake uh, grew up because it's got that kind of sustained fall line like we're seeing here. And I think with the glades and sort of the benchy features within the glades, I think even Brighton, which Blake spends a lot of time riding mm -hmm. bright and would be a nice little training ground for at least this part of the course. However, once you roll over this bench, this ain't Jackson. <laughs> this is much bigger and much more savage terrain in here as Blake starts to kind of look for some opportunities to get his board in the air. We saw in run number one, he was just smooth, his line all the way down. He was just like a surgeon picking through these features. We didn't see a lot of huge air time from him, but that could change down here coming up on this big exposure. I mean, it's all about choosing the line that's going to be dynamic and oh. smooth. Uh, you got to watch out for that slough when you're in the back seat like that. That could take you for quite the ride. Hanna, what's it like when you're looking at a line like that and slough just starts to give you the ball bearing feeling over, over the edge of, of something that you really don't know what's on the other side? It is not a good feeling, Todd. It, uh, that's one of the scarier, scarier things about this kind of combo of pillows and runnels. Like there's some spiny runnel features in there, and and if you're too focused on, on kind of where you're going, and you take your mind off of you know the snow moving around mm -hmm. you and all that, it can really sweep you off of your feet before you realize. Yeah, and it will come up at you very quick, mm -hmm. and especially on a course like this where the consequences are high and. No one has been out there with a tape measure to see how big anything is. You're just, you're boarding by feel. Yeah. Well, I think we're seeing a pattern emerge. First runs for some of the riders, it appears that the first runs are their uh, more solid run. Mm -hmm. Certainly with Blake. Blake didn't even fall till the end of the run in first run. And he had a couple consequential elements there. Yeah. All right. Well, as Blake gets a ride back from our ski do ambassadors, we are going to throw to a break. And when we come back, Mikey Cicerelli takes to this course. Stick around. You're watching the Yeti Natural Selection. If you would have told me a year ago that I would be standing on the top of the hemlocks at Mammoth Mountain with a crew about to drop into the Natural Selection, I wouldn't have believed you. 
Kimmy Fasani is the archetype of the changing face of women snowboarding. She's just broken all the boundaries. And now she's a pioneer for all women in sports, all female athletes. She helped all of us women with that, because like if I ever decide to get kids, I know now there is a person that did it before of me and made it work. Okay, this is the doctor. Five years ago, this started with my mom having cancer. This is not something that I see even once a year. This is something that I've seen a handful of times in my career. Even though you were so young, my goal with you was to make sure you were alive to take care of your kids. Now going through cancer, I've got to a point where I'm more free and I'm so much more my true self. But I would have never found that if we didn't have to go through all of that. At the end of the day, I really feel like all of these lessons that we go through are a way to pass down knowledge to other people. All right, back up to the start gate for Mikey Cicerelli on his second run through. You can see that perhaps we have some cloud cover coming in here, maybe making visibility more of a challenge, but only in this upper section because once you get down into those trees, you get a little bit more definition. As Mikey takes to his second run here. Remember, Blake Paul just came down through. He had a really good first run. Blake has the advantage here as Cicerelli is carrying a lot of speed into this first little hit. And he's going over to the rider's right side of the course, which is interesting. Maybe we'll see a little more freestyle stuff from him. Now, Hannah, in between the break, you were, you were kind of talking about how not only are these riders starting to feel the fatigue in their legs from the physical aspect, but the mental aspect too, because I mean, this was a serious butt pucker morning for a lot of these people because no one had any idea of what they were in for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I. The physical aspect of this is like, yeah, your legs are going to get tired, but um, at least from my experience, it's keeping it's keeping that adrenaline pretty even. It's like there's a lot of highs and lows as you're going through this. Like, you know, it's it's go time when you're going down the run, and then you get to chill for a minute. So it's really trying to manage that throughout the day as well. Yeah, I think that's you know, just keeping yourself in that frame of mind that you've got uh, a bunch more runs to do, four more runs on this course. This is no joke. Mm -hmm. Cicerelli, big frontside 360. Yeah, you said it, Hannah. I think strategically, Mikey is looking to, he's got a sharp toolkit when it comes to like freestyle tricks. He's trying to find a place where that could come into play. He's mm -hmm. coming in hot into this section right here. And not a lot of pauses in his riding. He's carrying that fluidity of line right into <laughs> that little bit of a pinch right there. And then down into this lower bench looking for one more feature to hit maybe he's teeing this one up almost a little double kind nice. of super mario's off that second it's pretty incredible how many different line options there are on this phase yeah it's nuts oh, oh and you see him just get bucked right there onto his back but cicerelli up top that front side 360 com comboing that into that Double double drop down. I mean, that was that was a solid run for Mikey. Way better than run number one, where he got kind of lost in that, uh, you know, that crazy poop shoot that kind of like yeah, yeah, that threw him down in the bottom of the course there. But that was great. Now he gets on the goat path to head back. So big frontside 360 for him. I'm gonna. I mean, I'm gonna say that Mikey has the advantage on run number two between these two. But it's gonna be hard to take down Blake's super fluidity on run number one. Well, that line right there for Mikey definitely had a lot more air, had a lot more features. He was pretty solid, but because he took on more aspects, he had a couple more falls. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, too, you know, it's overall impression of these runs. So a fall doesn't necessarily really, really hurt your score if your line is you come in here clean and you've got a really aggressive line. Here we go. The recap. Blake Paul was first heading into the woods section over here. I kind of feel like Blake got lost in the woods on this run. It's easy to do. This this course has a lot of very similar features. Like the trees are all very similar looking, 
similar sizes, so it's hard to pick out those unique features that you can use as anchors for your navigating through here. Yeah, so. and a lot of these runs too, like you would typically, you would think, okay, well maybe he could just lay back and wheelie through these pillows, but you don't know if you're wheeling into a 60 footer. Here we see <laughs> Mikey Cicerelli with that big front side 360, trying to find his way down here to the second bench that he can get some action on. And that ollie where he kind of just landed in some of that harder snow and bucked him onto his back. But mm -hmm. as we're saying, Pat, you think this run, you know, the advantage going to Cicerelli just because of, of line choice? I think so. I mean, he did have two threes in his run, which really comes into play when it's close. All right, well, here we go. Blake Paul in the lead from run number That's one. Close, with that. but... It's going to be tight. So mm -hmm. it's not enough. Mikey Cicerelli is eliminated. Blake Paul moves on. So the kid from Jackson Hole will get another attempt here on this course. Mikey Cicerelli goes home with some uh, nice uh, parting gifts of uh, riding some deep, deep pow. All right. We're going to send it up to Stan here, who's on the course. Stan, what do you got going on up there at the top of the course? Unreal, guys. Well, we just saw the men's quarter finals wrap. It's going to be a battle between Travis Rice and Dustin Craven, and then a battle between Blake, Paul, and Jared Elston. Unreal. Uh, you know, I think if there's one person, the talk of the of the course up here, if there's one person that can take Rice down, it's Craven. You know, I think Craven is looking for that lunch menu, and it's going to be fried rice. Um, we've got one more uh, run for the women here, and uh, then we'll know. Zoe's about to drop. <laughs> the excitement is high up here. All right, thanks, Stan. Well, there you heard it, fried rice. As Zoe Sadowski Senate takes to this course, we saw an incredible run by her, set the bar for the women early on. Hannah, I mean, she's she's just shown time and time again that you know she's not just a one-trick pony. She can do it all. Yeah, Zoe is so naturally talented, and you can feel her energy. <laughs> through the TV right now. Like she is excited, she's charging. I think I think she's gonna have fun on this run. Well, she took to the rider's right uh, section of the course. We're calling that the five o'clock shadow. It's a lot more open. You can kind of get line of sight on some of the terrain that's coming at you, which obviously is a huge advantage on this course. Mm -hmm. And she's setting herself up right now on a nice little cliff band Yeah, I mean, Zoe is one of the, if not the most versatile riders in snowboarding today. Go. Nice front, front three. Right. Starting to see some tricks coming out of Zoe, and you know she's feeling good. She's got a mean back foot, too, that she can throw where she needs to. All she needs is just a track off of something, and she can get it upside down. So Zoe switch backside 12 into crazy terrain like this. It doesn't matter. She is an all-terrain weapon. God, I feel like the only places you could really get the wildcat down are going to have pillows below them. <laughs> I think there's a couple ones at the bottom that have the potential for a, a quick little little wildcat for yeah, Zoe. You can up and over it. Mm -hmm. I have faith in Zoe. I think she's, uh, you know, like Hannah's saying, like she's kind of feeling eye of the tiger right now. She's riding with a lot of confidence. She's staying upright like she hasn't fallen on this yet as oh, she gets the curse of the commentator Todd. <laughs> I know I know whatever but still this run is has been on fire from the top coming into some of this already ridden terrain down here that is definitely oh, fun more solid three. she's playing she's having a good time out there well she has taken the advantage I mean the balls in Haley's court to improve upon Zoe's first run. I mean, certainly going into second runs, if you are in the lead, you have a big advantage. All right, she's working her way down here back into the goat path. So we saw that front side three just winded. You can hear how hard the riders are breathing as they come into this get back track at the bottom here. She does get picked up and brought back over to the base staging area. But man, oh man, this, this is a leg burner from top to bottom. As we go right back to the top with Haley Langley. Now, Haley was, we've been talking all, you know, the past couple days on our little group chat that we have here with commentators. I, I put a lot of faith in Haley because I think she rides so light. 
I think she's very, she's like Blake Paul. She stays above things. She kind of just can dart in and out of the terrain. So it's going to be interesting to see how Haley puts it together here because Zoe had a couple, you know, tricks on the run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Haley has the, has the potential to do a couple of tricks as well and just kind of, you know, if she, if she picks one or two features to focus on and do a spin, I think she could be right up in there for a contention. All right, here we go. Haley Langlin. For her second run in here, Zoe has the lead. Curious where she's going to go for her terrain here. Well, looking at the type of rider she is, I mean, she is the shortest rider in the field here today, potentially. And, you know, if something's double overhead, it might be triple overhead. Double overhead to Mikel is triple overhead to Ailey. Are you being tallest here on our broadcast? <laughs> I'm, <being> tallest, yeah. <laughs> I'm the shortest announcer. All right, Haley Langlin, kind of just going through visualizing, you know, just to really get eyeballs on this course and, and think about, you know, maybe what she's going to do. All right, so let's hear a little bit from Haley before she drops in to her second run. I feel like everyone's kind of in a similar boat after we got to look at the face on the scout day. It was very intense and it was the realization that we're actually going to be riding it is starting to set in. It's not just like a joke or anything. Um, it's a pretty dangerous face is what we've all come to the conclusion on. And, you know, I think it's going to be really tricky to navigate and people are going to be trying to find those hallways where there's that extra space without trees in it and safety is obviously the top priority but we still want to push it and put on a good show and advance our writing as well in the process so it's going to be a really fun day and you know i'll be a bundle of nerves for sure not only for myself but everybody all right Haley langland on course the level up of women's riding here uh hana you want to care to comment on that I mean this this course has really brought the women to another level I think yeah and each of these each of these females is such a strong rider like in their own territory doing their their kind of riding like whether that's in the park or or powder or whatever but you know not a lot of girls get to ride terrain like this and so this is really leveling it up for everybody it's it's a really like demanding face mm -hmm. and it's really going to be pushing everyone's everyone's limits. I think it's it's fun, but it's also very it can be scary. As we see, you know, you can tell by the way the shadows are starting to creep here. The sun and the visibility is in and out all over this course. Now, Haley's got a set of Oakleys on right now, probably using more of a high definition uh, prism lens on there, so she can see where she's going. Because depth perception is everything on this course. There we yeah, go. Yeah, nice little back three Boom. from Haley. That's, that's the freestyle and the midline that we were looking for and that you come to expect from riders like Zoe and Haley. And I think Zoe not doing as much of that has really opened the door for Haley. All right, so she's looking at this section here. Remember, you need to keep flowing as Haley just carries mad speed down there and that run out flowing all the way through this course, not stopping very much to kind of look at what's coming up on you and making it all look like one continuous line. That is probably one of the hardest uh, parts of riding this zone. A little double stack, oh! oh unfortunate, little all there. But she can still make it up. There's still lots of room in this for her to do some other tricks or just get a couple more little pillow stacks. Listen to that snow under her board. That is not pow. That is definitely hard packed snow in there where all these sloughs are running through these little gullies. Yeah, the slough, the snow getting chunked out, the tracks, I mean, nice. from run oh. to run, oh. they're gonna tomahawk. be dealing with bomb holes. They're gonna be dealing with different stuff from run to run. Well, Haley coming down through that run. We saw that nice 360 up top, a couple little falls on that run definitely gonna you know cost her in the long run here i think it's pretty safe to say that zoe's first score is going to be the one that that we're paying attention to here to carry on you could see the difference in in Haley's confidence that second run the first run i feel like she was kind of feeling it out finding her way through and she really stepped it up and 
tried doing some more tricks, was riding a little more aggressively on that second run. So I'm happy to see that from her. Yeah, for sure. And like this frontside 360 here by Zoe, she was dealing with the same kind of confidence boost as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note they both did threes off that one feature. You know, I like to, th these are the most stressful upper pow turns anyone will ever take. It's stress pow. I don't think that's, uh, that's we're coining that phrase here, stress pow. Well, it's interesting. We are adjacent to Revelstoke Mountain Resort here at Selkirk Tangiers. People can go to this type of terrain and ride it if they'd like. But the job of the guides is to keep you off of these faces as opposed to send you <laughs> off of them. We've uh, proverb dropped the proverbial rope here for these riders to come through. All right, so Haley Langland finally makes her way down to the base staging area. Nice cross three. Oh, shoot. Well, that's a new expletive. I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> All right, scores are coming in here. So it will be Zoe sadowski Sinnott who moves on her first run score with that big old 80 is going to power her through. So we are going to see more of Zoe. But now we're back up to the top here for the second matchup for the women. And we will see a totally different riding style here. We're talking about two riders that we just saw are more park focused. Now we're heading into more of the free ride based rider styles. Elena Height should be the first to drop. Let's hear some more from her. I was actually thinking about the overall the other day, and uh, you know, it's easy to kind of like think about that, but also like each stop is its own event and produces so many like individual challenges. Um, this event in Revelstoke is like probably one of the most challenging events we'll ever do, uh, just because of the nature of the face. And so for me, I'm just focused on one event and. Um, taking it day by day and pillow by pillow. <laughs> pillow by pillow, Pat. Well, pillow by pillow is one thing, but as we saw with uh, Haley last round, we had some proper crust mid-course. Yeah, we did. And I mean, that was kind of further down. I, it'd be interesting to hear from Stan uh, what the temperature is up top versus what T-Bird's got dealing with down at the bottom. It is a nice day out here. There could be some, some big temperature differentiation as soon as you roll over that bench. Well, Lena got an amazing shifty ollie up top, some good flavor there. Flirting with being the farthest right line. So let's see, I mean, she is also going towards the zone that we saw Zoe and Haley in. All right, here she comes as she starts to roll into where the terrain kind of tightens up in here. Mm -hmm. Whole new line for Elena this run. She was a little bit riders left of this on her first run. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if she tries to add any freestyle um, to her run since seeing Haley and Zoe. Oh. Going over the nose there on that first drop. Getting some pressures over here. Trying to find anything that she can possibly pop off of. And here we come into the second bench area. And this is where you're either, you can either find yourself on top of a 60 footer. <laughs> <laughs> or it looks like, oh, she just kind of sloughed off all that snow. Great nice line choice. Amazing yeah. line right there. Nice double shelf. Elena has got to be happy with that. She spent so much time in the backcountry with Jeremy Jones in and around Tahoe, just leisure backcountry, just without the camera out, but just going back in, split boarding in and around Tahoe. And it's definitely paying off, you know, with her being able to keep that board under her feet in some of the steeper terrain out here. Well, and it's worth mentioning that uh, Lena was the first woman to descend grizzly spines in Tahoe, which is basically terrain like this. Look at this right here, great view of it looking for that line down this is very oh. consequential terrain right here elena height has found herself up on top of something that would definitely make anyone weak in the knees and she nice. takes it like a champ makes it through that pillow stack that was really 
That was a great move. Elena Height, incredible terrain read there as she comes down through the bottom of that chute. What a run. She definitely put it together from top to bottom. Totally different riding style that we saw from Zoe. Yeah, and it's something we haven't seen that much of where the rider falls at the top and improves upon it as they go down. Mm -hmm. um, best run we've seen of the women so far today as far as using the terrain as it's presented in front of you flowing she showed some hesitation rightfully so there on that big drop rider's right all right well a big theme of natural selection and travis rice's outlook on life is sustainability tay is aligned with natural selection's sustainability mission tay's ultimate goal is powering the world with carbon-free non-radioactive clean fusion energy let's have a look Fundamentally, snowboarding can't exist without snow. Our winters are changing before our eyes. Climate change is real, and we have the power to stop it. We believe in shifting the narrative from one of crisis to one of inspired climate action. That's why the Natural Selection Tour is pledging to go beyond carbon neutral. Natural selection will be a drawdown event, which means we're putting twice as much carbon into the ground as we are emitting during the tour. That includes the emissions from every heli bump, every sled ride, every mile driven. We'll be offset twice over. We pledge to bring the same enthusiasm for progression on snow to climate action. Because simply put, neutral just is not enough. And this really is not even that radical of an idea. So we, would like to challenge you and the businesses you work with to do the same. So big thanks to TAE with their sustainability mission. And that is the goal here at Natural Selection. Also huge shout out to Yeti in providing the drinkware for Natural Selection. It's all about not having to deal with overuse of plastics and things we wanna throw away. We wanna be able to reuse, recycle and keep this uh, environment that we have here in place. Kimi Fasani is up next. We just saw an incredible run by Elena Height. Great line choice. Kimi Fasani will be on course next and it's going to be interesting to see where she goes. So Kimi takes the drop, heading over to that ever popular stress pow. Get ready for your run. I uh as Elena dropped last time, I was wondering, would, when you're taking the rider's right zone, would you have an advantage as a goofy footer, be an open face to most of the features? And Kimmy as well, being goofy. Well, it looks, actually it looks like Kimmy's kind of taken the lines. Oh, oh dang it. Kind of lands and goes over the nose right there. Fairly aggressive tomahawk as she heads into the middle of the course. So it looks like that she's taking a completely different line then Zoe oh, Elena. Looks, looks like we have a little bit of goggle, a bit of a goggle issue. Yep. Little As I was saying, if you know the big pillows, the big cliffs are in the middle, are you gonna wanna take a rider's right line, line so that you don't have your back to yeah, where you don't wanna go? That's interesting, Pat. I mean, just to, mm. to see what the strategy is gonna be. But I mean, Kimmy, I think she realizes right now that she has to find herself up on top of something of consequence to get a score to take down Elena. And it's obvious by her line choice here. I mean, she's stopped right now, fixing the goggles because uh, contrary to popular belief, you need to see where you're going on this course. So she is uh, looking for an opportunity to put up a bigger score. Well, I think we are saying that the riders were competing against the slope, and that was certainly the case first run. But if you want to advance, you're going to be going head-to-head -head second run. Sure. Elena took the advantage from first run, and I think she bettered her first run score. Yeah, and so Kimmy's following a very similar line than she, uh, than she did on her first run. You know, she already kind of knows what's over there. She had a couple problems on her run number one, but definitely the familiarity with, of where she's going now will play into this, maybe a little bit more relaxed. 
So yeah, long as that's her old run track as opposed to <laughs> and not Ferguson's. Ferguson's. <laughs> <laughs> and even though she had that little, you know, fall up top, there's plenty of time to gather yourself, sure. regroup, and focus on the lower part of the mountain because that's where really most of the action is going down. Look, yesterday Blake Paul posted a, uh, a photo on his Instagram that was like seven pairs of goggles and some Advil. Like he was preparing for the most <laughs> violent rag dolls ever. Mm -hmm. As Kimmy finds herself in this little shoot right here. Wow, that is a big right. piece of terrain. Yeah. This up. As you said, little shoot, I was like, are you looking at the same feet as I am, Todd? That's a uh, shoot your drawers right there. This is going to be real nice in there. Can you get in some yeah. high speed turns down those kind of spiny features of that gut? Nice and open. She's going to be looking for some place to put some air time under her board. A little pillow drops right there. Yeah, good, good little side features. It's kind of similar to like a little half pipe with side hits going down there. There's opportunity for freestyle stuff even if you're in there just getting some nice pow turns. What people don't realize is when you're in the gut of that of that chute right there, that that might be some of the some of the most set up snow on sure. the whole hill. So it's like you don't necessarily want to be down there and it is much harder to ride it so smooth like Kimmy just did because that is the snow that's either in the shade and everything's been funneling in from 270 degrees. All right, Han, I'm gonna make you put your analyst hat on right now. Who took that? I mean, I feel like it's, it's fairly obvious but I want you to break down why you think maybe Elena has the advantage on this one. I think Elena kind of took advantage of the pillows a little bit more on that lower half of her run. Got a few other little errors up top. Um, even with, you know, the run not being perfect, like she was riding it like you'd ride the pillows. And I think Kimmy also rode well, but it was a little more, a little more turny, a little less airtime, like less pillow stacks. So I could see them rewarding Elena for that. Yeah, and I mean, look at this right here with Elena up on top of that serious drop. And just the way that she read that terrain and the flow that she had through it, I think is really going to do it for her. Yeah, that was a really nice triple stack that she rode and she nailed that. Straight down here through the gully. And then it was straight into Kimmy. Kimmy having some problems up top here, Pat. How hard is it to, to regain your confidence after just going into a violent tomahawk like that and then you know you've got a whole uh, a whole bunch of other terrain underneath you that you need to handle. I haven't had confidence for two decades. Oh, that's so why I was asking you. That's, that's ask. specifically why I asked yeah, you that when, question. When was the last time you tomahawked <laughs> and then had to ride a pillow stack like that? <laughs> yeah, not so, many people. We're going to wait for scores here. I think we're pretty not confident right. to say that Helena Height has taken down this matchup here. And yes. Yeah. She had the advantage in run number one and on run number two. So Elena Height will move on. All right, so we have had the women's semifinals completed. Now we're going to look at the brackets. This is how things are going to match up going into the next round. And this is when it gets real, real serious. The final for the women. Wow, it's going to be Elena Height up against Zoe Sadowski. Sinnott. Two completely different riding styles will be showcased here. Who do you guys feel has the advantage in this terrain? I think it comes down to purely line choice. You're, right. You could either ride a serious pillow stack and nail it, or you could ride a little more open and do a couple tricks. And I don't know how the judges are going to... Well, gonna reward that. stick around. We're going to find out right after this. You are watching the Yeti Natural Selection here from Revelstoke. Much more to come, including the men's semifinals, when we come back. Riding in British Columbia, especially riding around here, I mean, it's as good as it gets. As far as terrain goes, BC is like the most diverse place in the world. And I think a lot of people are drawn here because uh, it is just like a mecca. Backcountry riding, it just has another level of presence due to the nature of the responsibility that comes with being out in these locations. You know, you are at the mercy of your own decision making and the decision making of the group of people you're with. And frankly, when it's done right, that's, that's really empowering. You're out there on Mother Nature's terms. 
When you step outside a ski area boundary and a controlled area, you are definitely arriving at uh, true uncontrolled wilderness. Avalanche terrain recognition and companion rescue training and planning for outings by getting educated on the resources that are available are the number one sort of ways to prepare yourself for going out there. Backcountry safety orientation is what we choose to call it at Soccer Tangiers, but really it's a way to make sure that everybody is up to speed on the appropriate techniques, how to wear their transceiver, how to use their transceiver to find somebody, how to shovel and probe in case that there is an avalanche, and certainly they don't need to be experts or professionals at it, but the basic knowledge of the basic skills is really, really essential before heading out there with anybody. Responsible behavior in the backcountry. It's, it's critical that everyone in the group has done their due diligence and takes it serious. Avalanches don't really recognize whether you're a novice or an expert, and even experts can get caught off guard all the time, and having less experienced people around that are trained in the right techniques to enact a good companion rescue is essential. Heading out into the backcountry is an empowering experience and I encourage everybody to attempt and try to get out there, provided that they are aware of the risks and they know what they're getting themselves into and are properly trained with the proper equipment. It's a beautiful way to spend a wonderful day in the mountains. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here at Revelstoke Mountain Resort. It is on the support of the British Columbia province that we're able to make this event happen. Some absolutely stunning terrain out in the Selkirk, Tangiers, Heli region. Here with Mary Walsh and Eddie Wall. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and, I mean, you, we talked about this last year in Alaska, Mary, that shouting across the fence that we saw in the semi-finals between Torstein Horgmo and Travis Rice. We've just seen the same thing from Zoe Sadowski, Sinot and Elena Hype, those two looking like they're really going to come together. I am so excited for the matchup because, I mean, Elena's second run right there, I mean, her technical prowess and navigating those steeps, it's mind blowing. Okay, so here is the bracket for the men's semi final. That's what we're getting into now. And this is the meat of the contest, Eddie. Yeah, you know, for sure the first two, the two of the, the most standout runs for me uh, in, the, in the first bracket was, uh, you know, Travis's run and Dustin's run. Those, those guys really stepped it up straight out of the gates, took some of the most technical, steep and gnarly lines uh, in, in, of the course. Okay, well, we can take a look now. Dustin Craven setting off into the first of these runs. He scored an 83.6, second highest score of that round behind Travis Rice. So our two highest scores going toe to toe in the semi finals. Massive. Oh, that was a massive drop right there. Yeah. Beautiful landing, light on his feet. And that was even before he gets into this, the treat area, the gut. We talked about it watching that second run of quarterfinals. Dustin was almost using that as a rangefinder, exploring different zones on the face. He's tidied it up. The one thing we did see is that a cl cleanliness is next to godliness for the judges. Clean runs saw the biggest scores. Yeah, I think staying on your feet is one of the most important parts of, of this course and, and one of the most difficult parts. And, um, but you do have to mix that in with doing some very, very technical lines because if you stay on your feet on, some, on a wide open face with not a lot of features, um, the judges aren't going to reward you, but they are going to reward drops <gasps> like that Massive. and little goalposts through the, you know, thread the needle through those trees by Dustin Craven uh, so far setting a, a uh, solid run here. He's opening up an entirely new zone right now. I, it's in the center. I'm not sure what from the kind of what exactly zone this is even, but just breaking completely new trail. Well, we know it's going to be meaty. He's coming up to this extremely exposed zone. Oh, wow. Yeah, this perspective, this gives it great perspective right here. And I'm curious to see what he does. Probably going to maybe just go straight down through this little mini spine section and hauling and able to control his speed. And that just right there shows his, uh, his level of comfortability and familiarity with this style of terrain. Craven okay, so just flexing very hard right now on this first run. He looks so composed and smooth in this terrain as well. And that's the, the variegation of that face he just dropped was nuts. Well, it's, it's so fascinating, isn't it? We've said it before, but it's real big mountain terrain of consequence style riding, proper snowboarding, not that heavily weighted freestyle riding that we see in Jackson or even in Alaska.
Yeah, this is this really highlights the interplay, the dance, as Travis says, between rider and mountain, between the terrain and the individual. It's really like the, the fundamentals and your instinct and your wisdom here come through so strong. Eddie, do you think, like, I feel like in the quarterfinals we saw rider versus mountain. It feels with Dustin and Travis, there's going to be an element of strategy. This is rider against rider. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we heard one of the athletes say earlier, you know, I'm not I'm not even necessarily competing against uh, my my fellow competitor. I'm competing against myself and the mountain and just try to get down the run. But now that they have, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, time on this face, they know their way around a little bit more. So I feel like now they can actually focus on what is the other rider doing and what do I need to do to uh, to step it up and beat them. Okay. High fives all round for Dustin Craven there. Travis Rice getting ready to drop in. Let's hear from the man himself now. He can talk us through why he picked this venue. Um, yeah, you know, the first time, first time I saw this venue, um, it was actually pretty stormy, and we were doing a bit of a scout, and it was kind of like gorillas through the mist. We come around the corner and just see this, like, crazy wall with just like dripping pillows and snow features and the scale was was massive and so it's one of those things that sticks in your memory gorillas in the mist <laughs> it's romanticizing this venue a little bit but the 40 year old out of jackson hole wyoming he spent a lot of time in the bib in the early part of his career, but no one has spent more time in the backcountry than Travis. He analyzes everything. He is a savant when it comes to terrain like this. Uh, you know, we just, uh, this just in, we heard that Travis has uh, up upgraded his board to a, a 157. So a little bit of a larger board going into this round. Um, what does a larger board mean? Well, it means more float, uh, higher speed, and you know, the, the benefits of riding a smaller board is that he can get into some really tight terrain, whether it's those tight uh, tr uh, pillows and transitions and also the trees. Um, so it makes me wonder what he has in store to, wa uh, to, to choose this larger board. Well, I think he perhaps gave us a glimpse of it on that, that's, that second run with that beautiful three that he did. I feel like this is kind of that, that bigger mountain approach to technical terrain that he's probably going to be looking to up the ante on. He's so clever. I've been back and watched his runs from Alaska. He gets himself into a position without breaking the flow of the run. He gets himself into a position where he can see a takeoff and a landing. And that's how he incorporates freestyle into big mountain runs. We've got this board. It's a volume shift board, the Golden Orca. So it's going to ride more like a 162, 165. Oh, starting things off with a backside 180 landing switch stance, very difficult to do in powder, and continuing just to cruise down this whole upper section switch, which is something the judges will absolutely take note of. Nice half cab 180 off of that uh, nice big pillow there. Okay, so Gab on the GoPro drone, chasing him down this face. Now we get a bit of, bit of perspective of this western side of the venue. Snow's definitely, I think, a little deeper, a little colder on this side of the face. And we know that below this, on that rider's left side, is a just a factory of pillows <laughs> down there. Yes, and some solid cliff bands. So I'm, you know, just very curious as to see what he is going to take. And of course, Travis in uh, his regular pursuit, just cruising very casually. He's under pressure now, though. Make no mistake, Craven's laid down a decent line. He has got to deliver here. That is very true. Well, judging by what he's going into, I think the delivery is on. Oh, it's in okay. the cards right now. This is a massive, Whoa. massive exposure cliff band. Oh my gosh, there is. He's found a slither of snow there on that ledge. Wide out. Oh, okay. White roomed himself. We talked about this at the start. Controlling your slough, keeping yourself out of the white room. Oh, oh wow. wow. Talk about finding a landing where there appears to be none, like you said, Ed. Oh, I mean, oh my God. What? Travis is going for it. And he's oh. stayed on his feet for a minute there. Went back three to uh, instantly a front 180. Look at the snow just, you know, barreling down behind him. That was a very precarious situation that he got himself out of in a, in a very stylish way. Uh, I don't think anybody else could have done that. No, that is... That is literally why he is Travis Rice, white right there.
I think the judges had a relatively easy ride through the quarterfinals. They're, the processes are going to start melting in the yes. judges' booth now. They, they've got some really big questions. Look at Craven meditating on the run that he's just seen. So I am curious to see what the judges do here because, okay, so Craven stayed on his feet. He did a technical line and it was an amazing run, but Travis's line was very high consequence. It was a, it was a new line. Um, and he did have, he got in the white room at the top, which means he kind of blinded himself with the snow. So he had to stop, but then he, you know, continued that run in a very, in a very solid way. Don't forget the back one up top, those casual switch turns. He did the same on the way out, like a really, really casual switch run. Let's see what he's got to say. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I got white room. So few people operate at Travis's level that he's his own worst critic, so. A little transfer across. Little transfer across. Okay, so this is fascinating. Remind ourselves of what we saw from Craven. It was so smooth up top. Yeah, all the way top to bottom, Craven looked relaxed. Look at how massive that air was and just dodging those two trees. I mean, you know, he just put down a solid casual, uh, you know, made it look very casual. That's, that's really interesting, seeing that pause again there as he lined up for those spines. Well, I mean, that angle, we can see how big it is, but it still compresses it with the GoPro view. I mean, that is just absolutely massive, taking a quick breath before that. And then, of course, Travis coming down here. This is strategic, you know, like his run up top, putting in those switch turns, that's the strategy that we know the judges will, uh, will rank highly on. And even though he white roomed himself, he made that transfer, and the transfer is above all of that exposure. That was just enormous. Like, he's still above this while he's making that air. Backside three, and then a front 180 right here, and then just goes down a little bit, but unreal. And that's taking things up such a next level. That's exactly where points come from in this situation. Okay, really, really interesting. I know, I think, uh, in my opinion, I think Dustin's probably gonna take uh, the higher score on this run, but we'll have to see. It'll just be barely, I think. The instabilities in Travis is a, t a bit too severe to ignore, aren't they? There we go. But v great indicator of exactly what you explained, Eddie, the fact that Dustin, potentially in terms of the line choice, was a bit more casual. Travis reaching for the moon with his. Like, that, that risk, that creativity really stretches out. You know where you don't want to be, though, within one point above Travis Rice. That is the most dangerous place to be. I mean, props to Dustin on that run, but now run two. Who knows what's going to happen between them? OK, Jared Elston maturing at a phenomenal rate in the last 24 months. He's put down some brilliant lines at natural selection, and he's put in, he's done his homework for this British Columbia event, but he's going up against Blake Paul one of the most elegant and I think you could say as the backcountry prince regal riders out there. So the 24 year old out of Bend, he's got action sports in his DNA. Dad was a pro surfer, mum's a professional mountain biker, just drifting through those first three turns. Oh, great start to the upper section of his run, just floating through this top zone. I actually heard uh, Jared and Blake are sharing a room up, uh, up in uh, Revelstoke, so <laughs> that's pretty interesting. <laughs> There's roomies going head to head here, and uh, Jared making his way down into the crux of this run, and you know he's going to want to put a big score on the scoreboard. I mean, the judges, they really have, it, uh, have a difficult job today, I'll tell you that. You see him root finding, talking to himself a little bit there. I mean, he's got nothing to follow here. Again, we're into totally uncharted terrain. Yep. And again, something that the judges will take note of. Uh, you know, when you're not following anyone else's line, it shows a uh, much higher degree of difficulty. It's amazing, just over the past couple of hours this morning, watching the speed and flow just continue to increase with these guys. Like, Oh, this is, what an in technical, oh, there we go. Nice backside 360 as he kind of 
does that toe edge traverse across that very exposed face below him. Look at the size of those cliffs. And again, you know, when you have those zoomed out angles, it really just shows the, uh, the perspective of how massive those features are. Look at how wow. small Jared looks on that face. It's, it's incredible. Keeping his speed in the bottom, probably trying to find a couple more features. Nice backside 360, landing, catching a little mini tranny finder there, keeping his speed up. Oh, beautiful ending to that run, too. I mean, this, the whole t topography of Boulder Park really is incredible, and I think that Jared has, he's taken advantage of so many different kind of variations of this venue. It really shows the breadth of his abilities. I particularly like the hands behind the back on the sole arch to finish. <laughs> I, I saw that. Lucas nice Magoon touch. tribute. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, you know what's interesting is that, to me, that, run that Jared just put down is almost a similar riding style as Blake. You know, I would have expected Jared to get into a little bit more crazy, hairy situation, but I think what he wanted to do was just get a solid, you know, feet on the board run, which he did, and which we just saw the judges rewarded Dustin Craven for that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, this will be very interesting to see what, uh, what Jared uh, gets scored here. Was, was that metaphorical right yeah. there? Just, that was... <laughs> Get Travis's board out of the way. One. It's my turn now. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, Giggy. Okay. Got While we uh, wait for Blake Paul to get ready, we can just show you Natural Selections really, really stoked to announce a partnership with the New Earth Project uh, in their sustainable solutions realm. Uh, the team in the New Earth Project has built a strategic coalition of the outdoor enthusiasts, industry-leading brands, and critically global packaging suppliers. And the mission is to rid the world's oceans, lakes, and rivers of plastic pollution. And that aligns perfectly with Natural Selection's mission to celebrate Mother Nature. Let's check it out. Travis, you know, who has had a long career, is at a stage of his life, he's like, well, I, I want to use this as a microphone to really elevate the conversation around sustainability to celebrate Mother Nature in a very engaging way and almost use the competition, the content as a Trojan horse to have these conversations and the impact change. The New Earth Project is a coalition of outdoor enthusiasts, industry leading brands and innovative packaging suppliers all working together to solve these problems. Great things are accomplished by the people who refuse to lie down. Our whole mission around celebrating Mother Nature and talking about sustainability, now we have something very tangible that's well to the audience. At the New Earth Project, our, our tagline has been, we do this together. And that was something that we figured out really early. Like, the secret sauce is community. Yeah. <laughs> the secret sauce is everyone working together. My hope is that brands will begin to look at this sustainable transition as something to celebrate. And at the end of the day, like, that's what this should be about, is like we are all inspired by this beautiful planet and we have a responsibility to understand our impact and do everything we can to minimize that if it's negative. And it's not just the new Earth Project that Natural Selection's working with. We've also got Conservation International and Sea Trees who work in a carbon offset initiative. Sea Trees supports scientists and communities who are looking to protect and regenerate uh, blue carbon coastal ecosystems. So those connections Natural Selection is really, really proud of. Okay, back up to the start now of this beautiful venue tucked in between the Selkirks and the Monashies. If you want to follow us on social, it's at Natural Selection on Instagram. Facebook is forward slash Natural Selection Tour. YouTube is the Natural Selection Tour. And of course, you can go to naturalselectiontour.com. And then we have that wonderfully tall drink of water that is Blake Paul, effortlessly graceful on a snowboard. Go and watch his yesterday part if you want to see him at his best. That is achingly cool. Cameo from Arthur Longo, and it's got a Modest Mouse soundtrack. Let's see what he can throw down for us here. First run of the semi-finals for Blake Paul. 
It's Blake going wide riders right right now. But just giving us a little, little dose of his very, very light on his feet, perfect style. Making his way down in, this is the, the kind of fun zone, the relaxing zone. Try to get your heart rate down before you get into the nitty gritty. Well, Todd called this area out here five o'clock shadow. There's that kind of, you haven't got those big trees. It's more like a couple of bits of stubble, isn't it? Yeah, and as you can see, you know, you do have a nice, uh, nice visibility right now, which is immensely helpful for these athletes. I'm fascinated to see him come out here and try and lay down a score, though, because Torstein, Horgmo, Mikkel, Bang, most of the riders who we saw leave us in the quarterfinals chose this side of the venue. It hasn't been a traditionally high-scoring side. So I think Blake's got to do a lot of work here. Yeah, I think if you're going to go into this zone, you probably are going to want to try to do a couple of couple little spins, a couple more, lean, lean a little more freestyle, unless you're on top of, uh, on top of some cliffs like this. <laughs> there we go. He wants those big scores. That was a solid <sighs> double drop. And then oh, wow. still pointing it, keeping his speed up. Again, the judges love high speed runs. And he, how was the transition fine? Like he, there was an edge change off the second double and he found that transition perfectly. Okay, this is a really interesting strategy, but he is really finding those kind of hot spots, those featured hot spots in this area. He's on top of a huge stack of Oreos here. Oh, if he just goes just to the left right now, he's going to get into some amazing terrain. Oh, oh my wow. gosh, that was an amazing line right there. Oh, and he holds on to it. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Wow, you know, it's interesting because we were saying earlier, if you go far to the rider's right, it's a little mellower. Uh, the terrain isn't quite as uh, as big, but I think uh, Blake Paul is proving us wrong right now. Yeah, he's really taking advantage of all the places you want to hit to really kind of like get the best, squeeze the best juice out of this zone. I think there's a really strong argument to say that this terrain suits Blake Paul's style perfectly. His approach... Now he's going oh. into a zone that no one has gone into yet, I believe, oh, and just making it. his way out of it. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's going to be... Uh, I think that's one of the fastest lines we've seen. Nice little frontside three popper at the end there, milking every last part of this run that he can. And I think the judges take note of that as well. So, I mean, Blake Paul, that, that, was, a, that was a very solid run number one here in Heat 2. I just think too his ability to take those those in succession drops and really land them that shows just really exquisite board control. It may not look as intense and gnarly as more of those kind of really featured zones in the middle, but that just shows his prowess. Well, you bre start breaking down the judging criteria, the creativity. He's maxing that out. He's taken a totally new line. He's found the transitions. Risk, as you said, maybe dialed down just a touch. Let's take a look though, this is Jared Elston's first run. And again, it was, both of them have broken new ground and right. the judges are gonna be fizzing on that. And they're such similar riders, yet so different in approach. I mean, we really did see Jared so light on his feet during this run and getting into some of very, very hairy features. Bring up a little backside 360, catching that transition perfectly. There's that turn. <laughs> with the hands behind the back. And look at that. Do you know what this is? This is the thinking person snowboarding. <laughs> You've got two very, very cerebral riders really pulling this face to pieces and squeezing the best out of it. Wow, I mean, that. Just, his ability to stay on his feet in that situation and take that many quick landings in a row, I find to be incredibly impressive. Look at that little bridge out onto the nose there. That's one of the, I think that's one of the cooler lines we've seen so far. A little bit of a bobble there, but you know, still keep the speed and then just shot gutting out of the bottom there. This is when natural selection is at its very best. You're watching film part lines live as part of a contest. It is absolutely breathtaking. Scores coming in 74 6 to 73 4. Incredibly tight again. Literally 1.2 between them. We saw the same distance between Dustin Craven and Travis Rice. Very, very tight. And this, this gives each rider a barometer of where to go, what they need to do. One point separating them, and they have strategy for that next run. 
Okay, stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will have the second runs of the men's semi finals. Travis Rice and Dustin Craven, Jared Elston versus Blake Paul. The largest reservoir of fresh water on Earth and the top of the watershed, the snowpack, where we play, is found in mountain ranges around the world. Melting snow begins the water's journey down through creeks, rivers, and estuaries, all the way to the sea. The ocean, rich with kelp, coral, and mangrove forests, is the Earth's largest carbon sink. And protecting these blue carbon ecosystems is key to slowing the planet's warming climate and snowpack. By regenerating coastal ecosystems, Sea Trees works to naturally capture carbon emissions, address climate change, and protect everything living downstream of a healthy snowpack. The Natural Selection Tour strives to connect people with Mother Nature and, through those experiences, inspire them to protect it. Working with Sea Trees, the tour has calculated and is addressing its climate impact through support for highly effective blue carbon capture projects. Learn more about Sea Trees and how you too can help protect the snowpack and everything living downstream of it. For today and tomorrow. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection. You're looking at the stunning terrain of the Selkirks just east of Revelstoke Mountain. We have one of the most impressive venues snowboard competition has ever seen in front of us. I'm very pleased to say that we have none other than Mark McMorris in the studio with us. Three weeks off the back of a broken ankle and you're proving your superhuman healing powers again. There's no pot on there, no cast. Oh, well. You know, you uh, do all the right things, you can get a fracture to mesh pretty quick, and the severity wasn't too intense. So happy to be here and happy to already have a moving ankle. Okay, I'm gonna put you under pressure straight away. We've already discussed this in the break that we just had. Jared Elston, one point ahead of Blake Paul. Does everyone agree with I that, that score? I thought that was a tight heat. I came in here with that argument. <laughs> yeah. um, two of my best pals, but yeah, I thought Blake had the upper hand on that one, but um, they both had moments in that heat of brilliance and they have one more run and that's going to be the deciding factor. And I think that's what that one point tells us is like Blake now knows, OK, if I'm to take what I did in that run and move it to slightly more consequential terrain, that could be a massive jump in points. And it's, it's just a barometer in that sense as well. OK, moving back up to the top, Dustin Craven is going to kick us off again. Travis Rice going second in this first of the two semi-finals. And certainly we've, it feels like we've got four very different approaches at the moment. Totally. Four different riding styles. You know, uh, Mark, for you, you know, having been a competitor in this, what is it like standing at the top of the drop-in right before you go? I mean, is it just like crazy nerves? Are you, are you just in the zone? What's that like? I would say at a contest where you get to take practice runs, you're incredibly nervous, but you kind of know what to expect. This is a whole different kind of nerves where you're just like, I have studied as many drone clips as possible, but that's not real life. So I don't, I don't know. And it, it usually helps to get in it. So now that we're in the semifinals, all these riders have had their, uh, their toes wet, if you will. I think the riding level is going to skyrocket as the day goes on. Were you surprised at how much everyone bit off in those first runs? Yes, I, I knew Travis would go crazy. I knew Ben would back him up and go crazy, but the stuff they got themselves into, like <laughs> Dustin's first run and all, it's just, it's crazy terrain. It's interior steep pillow riding and um, it takes a certain kind of rider to be able to buck down those things. Okay, DraftKings have partnered up with us mm -hmm. for the uh, fantasy natural selection. Eddie had Travis down. Yep. Did you go Elena as well? Uh, yeah, I went, you know, originally I went Zoe, but now it's Travis Elena. Woo. Okay. On the spot. And, and you've got I was a driving to LA semis. today with my phone, like trying to get downloaded. <laughs> but I was like, ah, oh, maybe I won't. I'll just get in the booth and watch this thing. 
And OK, so on the strength of what you've seen so far, I, I actually think Blake is pulling forward for me a little bit, but Travis seems to have the bit between his teeth on this. It's Travis's event to lose. This is no one's ridden this kind of stuff more than him. Not even Craven. Yeah. This is heli pillow riding. I think this is Travis's event, um, and everyone's just going to try and nip at his heels all day. Yep. And the fact that we're seeing him do spins on this terrain, where most people are just kind of airing and stuff like that, is just an indicator of where his mind is at and the level that he's at. So, but it's not to say that no one else is not going to step to that. I think. Yep. Dustin could win, Blake could win, Jared could win. Yep. I mean, and and then on the ladies' side, too, I'm looking forward to that. Elena, or yep. we're Elena Zoe right now? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yes, I'm looking forward to that as well. One of the best bits of insight, do you think it's going to come down to how many lines people could have stacked? Because we're seeing, we're in semis now, their third run's about to start their fourth. Do you think it's a case of having four or five different runs stacked up that you can move to? I think it's good to explore the face, right? Yeah. 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 But um, I would say if you know how to get a high score, you should probably go go and do that. <laughs> Not maybe yeah. go exploring, right? Well yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. And I, I also think that, you know, what we just saw in that in that last bracket, um, I think the judges are rewarding anyone who goes into that middle gut section because that is the the most challenging, scary, and technical terrain. And um, Blake put down such a solid run on Looker's left, and that just still wasn't enough to to you know uh, beat Jared. Very very good point. Okay, we can go up to the top now with Stan Levier. Uh, what's going up? Uh, going on up at the top there, Stan? <laughs> well. I, I got to say it. Let the judging drama begin. I don't know. <laughs> I thought that Blake Paul powered through that line. It was incredible to see the way that he handled that. Took that line that's been traditionally scored a little bit lower with a kind of tenacity that we hadn't seen all day. I think that uh, Mark uh, McMorris is exactly right. It's only up from here. I think Travis Rice has the eyes for the best run. It's just really a question of does he have the legs? Very good point, Stan. Very good point. Um, T-Bird, down the bottom there, what's the atmosphere down at the bottom? Uh, like, I, I know it starts to get a bit of a party as you get some riders who are knocked out and starting to relax. Yeah, the energy down here is a lot calmer. There's no question about it. As these riders get more comfortable riding this course, I think the level's going to step up. The one point difference between the men in run one and semifinals, that's going to mean a lot coming into run two. You could see it in Travis's eyes. He looked at Dustin and he said, there's not a lot between us. One point. So it's going to get real interesting here. Yeah, less than a point separating both of them. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, I've got to say, T-Bird, that jacket is just making your eyes pop. You look absolutely beautiful out there today. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, Ed, if I can look as good as you sound, my friend, you're, you've been in my ear all day. You sound great. Oh, there we go. That's your 20 bucks earned. OK, <laughs> uh, thank you, gents. I'm going to leave you to it. Um, uh, I mean, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have second runs of semi-finals. This is a mouthwatering prospect. Zoe Sadowski Sinna. Come on, let's go, Zoe. 20 years of age, again, fresh off the plane from China. Can she continue her winning ways here at Baldface Lodge? Choosing to change things up with a straight air off that first hit and heading far riders right to find some fresh snow. Tail grab off that drop and having to throw the brakes on a little bit. It's steep up there. We said it before, but worth repeating. Well, that Tommy Hawk that we saw from Ben Ferguson helped us appreciate just how steep as Zoe Sadowski Sanat absolutely sends it. You know, she she goes big. That's what Zoe Sadowski Sanat does. <laughs> the definition for this Kiwi rider. Stomping that backflip, 
making that look pretty easy, even though it's definitely not big tail grab. Going deep as she rounds things off at the bottom of the course. A little bit of a shifty, and she's down. Good run. Especially that bottom half. I mean, the power that this young woman has. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here in Revelstoke, British Columbia. We're actually on a remote broadcast. We're in Southern California, 1,400 miles south, but we are bringing you all of the action live. Uh, I think you noticed on the link up with Tom Monterosa, he's rocking all of the backcountry gear that you see on screen. We've actually got some of it up at the back here. Uh, there's all of the backcountry gear. You can find that on naturalselection.com. There's also all of the BCA and the kind gear. Did you get your swag pack, Mark? Oh, I'm, I'm always swagged out, man. But <laughs> it's always with uh, my brand. <laughs> but uh, I got some BCA gear for sure. It's okay. the best in the best in the biz. Yeah, you kind of want that before you tell them that you've got an ankle injury. You're like, can you send the gear and then I'll. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, event poster up behind me as well. There's NFTs and sign posters on the website. So go and grab those while you can. Uh, second run predictions, a point separating Travis and Dustin and a point separating Jared and Blake. My prediction is mental stress for myself and the rest <laughs> of us and probably the judges also. Yeah, um, and, and you know what? I did want to just say, too, the, the judges have a very difficult job. And, you know, we can speculate uh, whatever our opinions are, but I will say that I, having been a judge before, I have nothing but respect for them. It's a very difficult and thankless job. And um, and they are looking at this in a way that maybe we are not, you know. Uh, so I definitely big shout out to the judges. And regardless of what we say, I mean, I, I have the utmost respect for them. I mean, I think they've been doing a great job thus far. Yep. And... It's not an easy thing to judge, like you said. It's a different kind of riding, something you don't see every day, and um, one thing may be harder to another rider, you know? So um, I think they're doing a solid job, and they just gotta look for the people that are taking those risky lines and doing it with grace. Okay, Heli has just landed up at the top there. It's dropping off all of our semi-finalists. I mean, you, no matter what the competition, from X Games, where you snuck the gold out from Mar under Marcus's nose with back-to-back 1620s, or into the first year of Jackson Hole natural selection. Like, you've been in those clutch positions. What's the secret to it, to staying calm and focusing on your riding, not letting the tension get the better of you? Um, trying to build throughout the day. If I look back on both of those events, I landed runs at X Games early in the day and, and built on them and built my confidence. And in Jackson at the natural selection, I rode pretty well and mellow in, in the qualifications and then built through the semis and was able to take out Travis Mickle and then just like found my stride right at the right time. And that's not easy to do. And it's definitely not something that happens every single event, but if you can like follow the steps that led to that, you're gonna get there more times than not, so. On using that formula, who is doing that today that you've seen on the strength of the riding? They're getting nice pretty long in between these runs. So, I mean, B Dustin has been showing signs of brilliance. Travis, of course, he's not going to leave anything on the line. He wants to take more runs on this because he has probably like plan Z and <laughs> Q <laughs> ready to go. So um, I look forward to seeing Travis and Dustin ride and then... I would love to see Blake nudge into that final or or Jer. Jer has exactly what it takes. He's super talented and he has big kahunas. That was fantastically sat on the fence there, exactly like Mary <laughs> earlier. She I like your style. All four women to win. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, we've seen the same thing with Elena on the women's side as well and Zoe. Both of them are pushing that, you know, same burn it at the right right time, right place. But yeah, and also like I mean it's anyone's game when it comes to head-to-head. -to -head. Someone can fall and someone can nudge ahead, but all these women and men have what it takes to win. Okay, I want to give a quick shout out to Rose Corr and Chris Kessler, AKA Biscuit, part of the NST family who can't be here with us today. Uh, we're thinking of you guys, but right now it is the turn of the closest thing we have to a local here out at Boulder Park. The man from Revelstoke, British Columbia, He's on that yes standard board. Watch 
156. He's had a couple of really, really solid runs. His first run here, very powerful, and he leads, as Mary said earlier, a very nervous position to be one point ahead of Travis Rice going into your second run. You know the snow is good when you make a turn and uh, you white room the drone above oh. you. Massive air off of that platform. Really good method out of Dustin. Solid method. Best method of the day, I'll say. Oh, nice front side three. And to be honest, up in this zone, it you know, it's it's a little more fun, it's a little more easy, but you can easily go down on a front side three like that, which will easily which will affect your score. So uh, still very risky to to be doing, you know, tricks up in this zone. Full strategy as well, because we saw Travis doing that in his first run. And I think, like I said, that, that one point difference doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. So you really have to take every opportunity to up the ante on your previous run. Dustin's trying to build that space if he can before Travis drops. Yeah, gain some points up high, take some risk up there. And he's done just that and getting into the more technical section now, looking for his landmarks. Okay, am I where I think I am? Yeah, and as Ben said, all these trees look the same. <laughs> yeah, all here. Here we go, on top of an extremely <laughs> exposed face. Jeez, he is. I, uh, not oh my afraid. goodness, this right. view is so wild to see it before the rider comes up top of it. Oh, he, and now whether he wanted to go or not, he went with oh, the snow on that one. And big that was a proper where's Wally for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Peering out over the precipice. Oh, oh man. my he gosh. does it. He lands it. Dustin's ability to on-site pillow lines is nuts. All right, so far uh, this is shaping up to be an incredible run by Dustin. So Travis is going to have his work cut out for him. Kootenai King, hometown advantage. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Do you think he's got the most experience in big pillows? He's got the strongest back quad. <laughs> like his his back leg, his quad, the Kootenai quad is what we call it. He he can just bash through pillows. The Kootenai quad. <laughs> when well, you said back quad for a minute, I thought. Yeah, you know, I know how that. I was can like, get wait, what? Up, out of <laughs> I was like, he has a back quad. Okay. No, yeah, his, his quadricep <laughs> muscle is extremely strong. <laughs> um, but yeah, Dustin, hometown hero. You know, Rebel Stokes going off right now. Well, but Travis is Travis just is mad. Down. Travis is mad, so Travis is just running out. down the course. He's <laughs> he's not even gonna strap in. Yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. And the ease with which he made that drop seem like it was a walk in the park for him. That was just that was ridiculous. A couple of things to note that Travis will be able to take advantage of is the fact that Dustin came to a complete stop twice. There you go. Um, yep. Travis is going to obviously try and flow through the whole thing. I'm assuming he just watched his run on the TV, so he knows what he has to do. And I mean, if there's one guy that can do it, yep. probably this dude. We've actually got a Sendy uh, moment of the day, and you get the feeling that it could come from okay. this semi final, the way these two are squaring off at the moment. Yeah, it's a finals matchup for sure. Dustin's work here is done. <laughs> he just, no he just looks his helmet so... on right for him, please. <laughs> he just looks all disheveled. Any purpose right now. <laughs> okay, so Dustin Craven, a spectator now, as Travis Rice gets ready to take his second run in the semi finals. The next three minutes will decide the first of our finalists. Dustin Craven has made a really really solid case for his inclusion but as you said mark a little bit of a hesitation there if travis can mentally commit to the most exposed sections of this face then he leaves the judges no excuse totally step up the freestyle like he can um and then ride some super consequential stuff which he will um i feel like he's just got to put the puzzle together here he's got the he's got the pieces and I think there are some athletes who um, maybe struggle when all the pressure is on. And there's some athletes who uh, thrive off of, that, uh, off of that pressure. And that's when they turn everything on. And I think Travis is one of those riders. I remember watching, I remember, I'm old enough to remember Travis's time in a bib. 
back in those Tokyo Big Airs, Aaron style, yeah. and it was exact. He loved it. He's yeah. like exactly like Zoe. He's got ice in his veins. Yeah. The more pressure you apply, yeah. the more likely you are to see his best. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of similar to the person sitting next to me on this couch. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Mark. No, he definitely <laughs> uses it as fuel. I mean, yeah. it's it's one thing when everyone expects you to win, but it's also like you are putting all of this on too. Yeah. There's like next level pressure on this guy every time he takes a run at natural selection. But you called it. He, oh. got, he was angry. You could see the energy inside <laughs> him the moment he saw Dustin's run. Up, we sure. could feel it in the studio here, I feel like. Oh, okay. Oh, that looks so fun. It does. <laughs> Revelstoke, British Columbia, putting on the Ritz for us today. It holds the record for the most annual snowfall of anywhere in Canada, over 24 meters, that's 80 feet in one winter. You can see the evidence that, of that here in the insane snow formations we've got on this course. Travis Rice coming up to the crux now. I feel like he basically just pinned it from the top. I mean, he's like Yeah, butter, a method, but he's spending Ooh. all his chips down here, let's be honest. Backside 360 in the trees there. Taking a line that he has not taken so far, which again, is very risky because you can get lost very easily on this course. But uh, as Mark said, this, uh, you know, Travis is strategic. So he's had this line in the back of his mind this entire day. Right, he's racking up the bonus points with every popper. But he needs we exposure. Go. We know that's where the judges are handing out the big points. Yes, you're absolutely right, Ed. Same pinball shoot that we saw Zoe Sadowski Sinner on in her first run, and it scored high for her. Oh, oh there we go. Wow. All right, laid back a little bit, but kept up his speed. Get on that flank. Wow. Oh, there he is. Okay. Okay, so he's getting into some pretty. Oh, look at these fingers. Pretty scary terrain right here. Okay, he's, he's definitely a, making quick work of it also. Yeah, navigating it well did not come to a stop, as you had said, uh, Mark, that Dustin did. So I'm you know, just worried that wasn't quite what he was hoping for. I feel like he had something big lined up and maybe never got onto it, or, or maybe he was just doing some exploring. But I think Dustin Craven may be going home with this one. I feel like, do you think he wanted to dial up the freestyle, like send it a bit harder and, and back off on the exposure a touch? But the, the scores have told us from the start of the quarters right through to now that you need to be in that heavy exposure, those deep, deep pillows. Totally. Dustin <sighs> did just that. Do it, uh, oh, he's, had to have a he's purposely wearing his helmet like that, kind of the Kootenai Gap. He's definitely mocking the helmet there, isn't he? Okay, highlights from Dustin Craven's run. Big method up top. Yeah, look at this face that he was on. I mean, this is, that oh, was oh, insane, wow. and I think he is going to get rewarded uh, generously. To the final, yeah. right? It has to. <laughs> that was that 200 was, feet in yeah, about two and a half seconds. That was the ender shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah right? that's the video part where the 100%. And it's interesting because Travis's previous round, he really turned the dial up. I, I kind of have to go with what Mark is saying, too. I wonder if that cause it wasn't exactly what he had planned. Yeah, it almost seemed like he was looking for something because just the way he came into that, those first few runs where he was just launching the front three off that one hit. Yeah, and that was this good. run. I don't know. I mean, I I know. I mean, I'm sure this this backflip is uh, is a big very. standout for him. I know that that you know it's very difficult to do off of a, off a pillow like that. But I'm just not sure if it went exactly how he planned. And he then, landed and this that is, backflip in a track. I that, think that's what took yeah. him down. Yeah, we can, and we can't uh, write that line off. Like that was very technical right there. But again, I mean, uh, that that line that Dustin took was pretty pretty nice. When he knows it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, scores coming in. And it's by the look on Travis's face, it's going to confirm what he thinks. So, Craven, a point ahead after the first runs. 
Travis Rice goes a point and a half ahead of Dustin Craven. Oh, wow. wow. For a right. place in the finals. And I think that goes against what Travis thought. It definitely goes against what we thought in here. Yeah. Wow. I, yeah. Travis. I mean, the judges, again, all the props and respect to the judges, too. But I think we are a little little surprised in here. Okay. The one thing I would say. He didn't stop. He never stopped. Yes, he never he stopped. He didn't stop. Kept his flow up. His and flow it was up one it was one piece. Jared Elston dropping in. We'll come back to this. We'll put a pin in that discussion. Right now, Jared Elston with it all on his shoulders. He goes into this in the lead. But again, the, it's less than 1.2 between them. <gasps> Massive oh, kick out right there. So he has got, if he wants to secure his place in the final, he needs to put some daylight between him and Blake Paul. <coughs> Jared Elson making his way down, headed into this first bench, starting it off with a nice method, kind of following in uh, Dustin's tracks. Ooh. Jared, one of the riders who's consistently sought out the really heavy exposure of the central part of the face. I've been a little hiccup there, but he's going to get into this bench. Yeah, and honestly, if I, if I were a judge, I don't even know if I would completely, you know, it's, he was just kind of cruising along and just kind of fell into a little, little bit of a hole there. I don't think that was a, a massive oh! uh -oh. deduction, but it looks like he kind of went. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. From that other view, it looked like he kind of went into a fell tree into well. That tree well yeah held on to that one Keep nicely. Look at the exposure he's above now. Oh. Looks like he was trying to do a little spin off of that. Or traversing under that completely exposed cliff band there. Oh, I, no. I mean, the selection of this terrain too, though, is it's impressive and immense that this is kind of, he's navigating this. Just riding down that is yeah. a feat. I agree. Yes. And I think, again, these pulled out angles right here, these long lens angles really show the size of these features. Um, 100%, I actually. Well, where you get yeah. those spines or those runnels, we saw it with Mikkel, they're like elevator shafts. You get caught in um, one and it's just, yep. Yep. you're getting flushed. And that snow in there is not powder, so no. I think that's something that everyone needs to know. I mean, uh, that's one of the most misconceiving things about watching these things. You think the whole entire course is perfect snow the whole way down, and it's absolutely not the case. There is uh, some variable snow conditions in there. I want to give what we see Jared down on the apron here, give a massive shout out to the crowds watching in Revelstoke. There are big screens down in town. They've been hanging out with the riders all week and Revelstoke have put on a real show of hospitality for all of the riders. And it is an incredible week to be in resort. Uh, so shout out to all of you there enjoying the show as Jared Elston makes his way in. I think. Personally, I don't think this is going to be an improvement on that first run score. I think he's got a nervous weight. I agree. Yep. Yeah, that, that will not be. I, I would be very surprised if that was an improvement. I doubt it will be. But we have been wrong. That's true. Yeah. 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 You know, they, um, they're, they're definitely loving the flow. They're loving the full pull. They don't the want to see you stop. If um, we're going to go back to. We um, should go back. If we, let's go back to Travis and Dustin. Dustin's was a single piece of terrain. Travis yes. had four or five features, which is potentially how it got weighted. And that's, I think, what is so incredible about these judges is they really are able to weight the entire full pull of the run and everything that he was doing on each popper from the top and then getting tricks in on the on the second section. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's going to elevate his elevated score, and it did. 100%. Back three and a back flip in there, which Dustin, there was, I think it, we had the method up at the top. I don't Great. think there was a rotation. Yeah. Method, front three, yeah. and then came to a stop and rode that crazy gnarly man. face. But yeah, when, when there is a flow category, that's not going to help you out if you come to a stop. Yeah, and, I, and again, I will say, like, be, having been in the uh, judge's position, it, you are looking at this and discussing this in a totally different way, you know, than, and they're looking at things that, that we might not necessarily be catching as well. Okay, before Blake Paul drops in for his second and final semifinals run, let's hear his thoughts on the course. Um, the course is pretty wide, it's pretty long, it's definitely the biggest, most challenging, most difficult to navigate course that we've ever had in an event, um, or that I've maybe ever even seen in a backcountry contest, and 
Yeah, I think the name of the game is going to be finding landmarks, getting into your line. Um, just looking at some of the drone footage, there's three or four blind rolls that you just have no idea where you're going unless you can match it up with a tree or a bump in the snow or a pillow that you already went by. So I think it's just going to be navigating and just getting a sense of scale once people start riding it because some stuff looks super huge, some stuff looks more manageable around huge stuff. So it's just going to be kind of nitpicking in there and figuring it out. Okay, so Blake Paul dropping in, ready to be judged. And let's just be clear, we're trying to decipher the decisions the judges have made. We're not questioning them. Chad Otterstrom, Guillaume Morissette, Brian Fox, Jody Wachinak, and Connor Manning in the booth. Those guys have decades and decades of judging and riding experience between them. So loads of credibility there. Yes. No, don't, don't envy the position that they are in. They do an amazing, amazing job. And I think the nuances that are picked up by that crew to decide the order of these things and decide the scoring is incredible. I could not do it. Okay, Blake Paul out far riders right. Same zone that we've seen Mikkel, Torstein, and then Travis. Travis wasn't quite this far out to the right, but it's definitely less exposure, but it gives you more opportunity to send This is one of those convex rolls he was talking about, completely blind on the other side. So very easy to get lost, very easy to lose your line. But not Blake Paul. Sets himself up perfectly, mm -hmm. a little shifty. He needs to squeeze an extra point out of this run. Oh, he's going backflip, and he stomps wow. it clean. Great landing on that. So, so far, he's putting down <sighs> a, a sucky tree tap. <laughs> Lake Paul, also known as Gordon Lightfoot, <laughs> just floating down this course. Now getting on top of one of these stacks again. All right, going down nice little wow. air, kind of a little shoot into, into an air off that bottom pillow. And uh, here, here we go into another blind roll. I think it's a lot like what you said, Mark, earlier, where it's not just one section of the run, but it's having that full pull where he had the it was his back three on the, the mm -hmm. popper on the top, and then he has the back flip there. He navigates the small line, or not small, excuse me, a <laughs> <laughs> not small at all line of pillows. And putting that all together, I think, is, is really impressing oh, really? the judges with the scoring. He's had the flow. He, he's checking all the boxes. Yes. It'd be nice to see him end with a bang here. I mean, so far, I believe. I mean, so far, this this run uh, oh. is uh, is I believe beating Jared's second run. There but will go. it be his first? Yeah, it's, that's the big question. Like, yeah, put I yourself don't... in a judge's position now. We've had moments where you're drawing breath, where your heart stops, and that run, as beautiful as it is, it hasn't done that to me. Right. Yeah. But the the backflip was strong. There was some great. Yeah, seeing how Travis's was judged compared to Craven's makes me believe that that full pull with some freestyle, we might see a big score. Look at that, Jared, very hospitable there, just dusting yeah. the snow off for Blake to come and sit on the Yeti cooler. <laughs> If we do go back to kind of the, the kind of heart of natural selection, it really is about the interplay, right? We've mentioned it before, the interplay of the terrain and the rider and taking that full advantage like Travis did, like Blake did, shows that deftness with the terrain. Beautiful start for Jared Elston. Big soaring method. Yeah, this is, I love seeing these replays. So you get a get a, some other angles on this. I mean, you know, this is that type of terrain that is just like you said, kind of heart stopping, gets your heart going. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of exposure, lots of risk. And then, you know, then you have a line like this that's a little more fun, uh, but also technical in the sense of, you know, how many drops he was doing. Um, and, you know, the tricks like the, the backflip, I believe might be right here. Yep. The control and the flow of this run yeah. is going to be maxed out. That overall category. Yeah, Except because right there. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why he stopped there. Come on, <laughs> yeah, the, the end of the run. But that was a nice little weddle to finish things off. And we did talk about that earlier as well, that that small hair of uh, hesitation could be the deciding factor down the line. Yeah.
It's the signpost, the excuse the judges need yeah. to shave something off. Okay, so Jared Elston was 1.2 ahead in the first run. Blake Paul needed to make that up. He's definitely, oh, he's he, definitely trumped Jared's he, second run score. All right, let's see. There it is. So the first run scores. 76. Oh, cow. There we go. 1.4 between them. Blake Paul will move wow. into the finals at the expense of Jared Elston, where he will face Travis Rice. Wow. Wow. Jackson versus uh, Jackson Local in this one. Oh, cow. Vindication cow. for Blake Paul. After that, Wooden Spoon ninth place in Baldface. He's come back and made a finals here in British Columbia again. Always knew he had it in him. I'm very, very happy to see these two going head to head. <laughs> wow. Blake Paul, a finalist against Travis Rice. Here we go. All smiles between Rice and Paul. We've got to say uh, a big thank you, Mark McMorris, for making it into the booth with us. Super some fun. fascinating insight there. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> this is a day I look forward to uh, to compete or to watch. It's, <laughs> it's been anxiety driven and ridden. I was like driving up here watching this first few runs, tripping out. So it's going to be a good day and can't wait to watch this final. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's going to be with Todd, Hannah, and Pat. We'll leave you in their very capable hands. It's crucial that we learn the origins of our lands in order to honor those nations who've lived off it since time immemorial. We would like to acknowledge the land on which we gather is the territory of the Sinaix Nation and is home to many diverse indigenous peoples. We honor their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. Located at the confluence of the Columbia River and its adjacent tributary, the Silkwa'it River, Revelstoke was originally inhabited by this mighty nation. This land is considered unceded or unsurrendered territory, meaning that it was never formally given away by the Sinaix Nation, nor did they willingly abandon their territory and is still owned and occupied by them today. Each nation across our continent, known as Turtle Island, speak their own language and is culturally unique. But each believes deeply in the connectiveness of the environment and all living things. The spiritual connection with snowboarding and the mountains is undeniable. For centuries, these First Nation peoples sent their young into these same mountains to connect with nature, fend for themselves, and to learn to live off the land. For over two decades, the Indigenous Life Sport Academy has been using this ideology to connect Indigenous youth with their natural environment through the life sport of snowboarding. The Natural Selection Tour represents another opportunity to bring our community together to grow both spiritually and culturally. As we forge the path ahead, it is vital that we look to our past and respectfully acknowledge those that came before. Welcome back to the finals here at the Yeti Natural Selection. Todd Richards in the booth again with Hannah Beeman and also Pat Bridges. We got finals going down and this is going to be crazy because we just saw a big shakeup. We got two dudes from Jackson Hole going against each other. And also on the women's side of things, uh, Zoe with her, her park prowess is going up against Elena Height with her great backcountry know-how. We're going to send it up right now to Stan. Before we get to these finals, who's got a report from the top of the course. Stan? I got to tell you, we're running on a generator up here, but the energy is electric as we go into finals here. Insane face-off between Zoe and Elena. I'll tell you what, it is Zoe's birthday. If she wins, maybe a special Kodiak birthday cake. I don't know. Anything could happen. I hope these riders are as energized as we are. I get the feeling that they are. History is being made here. We're having a great time, and soon enough we'll have a champion. I know you guys at home are probably just as excited as I am to watch this go down. 
Thanks, Stan. Well, we are now into the finals, and you can see as we do the look over here of this terrain, it has been taxing these riders to the limit. We got Elena Height up against Zoe Sadowski Sinnott for the women's final. And then, as I said, we've got the big Jackson Hole showdown between Travis Rice and Blake Paul. The women are going to go first, and it's, you know, as the sun is kind of setting here and getting a little bit later in the afternoon, the shadows are getting longer. Elena Height will be up first. What is going through her mind right now, Hannah Beam? And you've been in a situation before competing at natural selection. What is it like being in that start gate when everything is on the line? You really got to block out a lot of the, the noise and really focus in on the plan. <laughs> <laughs> and the plan is to navigate down through the course and hit the things that you plan on hitting and execute the tricks or whatever you're planning to do. So I think Elena is just trying to breathe, focus, and get into that flow state. Now, Pat, we saw Elena on the run previous that got her into this final. She, she found those stacks of pillows. She found that terrain that really you know, highlights her skill set right now. She came from being a pipe rider who was just dominating in pipe, and now she's dominating in the backcountry. Pat, where, like, what do you think her strategy is going to be? Go straight back into that zone again? Well, I think so. I mean, it's certainly of the two runs we saw from Elena, the second run was the run where it all came together. She did a double into a triple line. Um, if I were her, I'd go for the comfort zone. And, and we talk a lot about Zoe being a consummate competitor these days, doing the Olympics, doing the X Games. Nobody has been in as many contest finals as Elena in this field. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, the amount, the amount of, of uh, start gates that she's been in for half pipe comps is crazy and snowboard cross. I mean, Elena's, Elena has one of the best turns in snowboarding and she knows her way around big terrain of consequence, riding with Jeremy Jones quite a bit in Tahoe. And she's looking here to get herself situated on top of some of that consequential terrain that she found herself pushed into the final with. And I mean, Hannah, we've been saying it all day, you have to have faith in the track that maybe you put in previously to direct you back to where you need to go. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know what Elena's plan is, if she's trying to go back to any features she's already hit or to totally change it up, but she's at least able to navigate a little bit better through this terrain with those tracks. And I just, I think we're gonna just see her kind of charge, get her energy up, and then I would love to see her throw a little back three or something. I know, just get, get some kind of a freestyle move in there. Now, yeah. there's been some uh, questions about why aren't these riders wearing avalanche packs? Well, they have these Dekine vests on that are great for the backcountry. They, you can hold a shovel in those things, but each one of these oh, riders, yes. Right now, the best safety people are on hand, so these riders are not riding with packs and shovels and probes. Here she goes, lining up this bottom section here. And this is a, a hairy little section. Oh, oh. kind of bush clipping on the way in there. Well, Lena definitely added technicality to the bottom third of her run. The top two thirds were the most flowy runs we've seen from any of the women with a lot of drops, a lot of air time. I think she's looking at it like, well, I'm not gonna be able to go trick for trick with Zoe if it comes down to a trick off. So I'm gonna sit there and take the more technical line. Well, the question that I have too is also like, okay, so Zoe's already kind of maxed out that zone where she did the front three and you know, she did mm -hmm. a, couple, a couple little poppers in there. So is it gonna be held against her? Are the judges gonna like uh, dock points for her just wearing a groove in this course? I don't know. I can't, I can't tell if Zoe's going to just try and step up the tricks or if she's going to try and make it a little more technical, maybe hit more of the, the pillow stacks. Um, I do think Elena can ride those technical stacks. Sure. And if she just throws in a, a 360 in there somewhere, I think she's, she's right in there as well. Yeah, I just don't know if she needs it. If she's doing doubles, if she's doing triples, meaning pillow to pillow to pillow, mm -hmm. I don't know if she'll need even a 360. And this is such, I mean, this is so different from any natural selection that we've ever seen because you're incorporating kind of these big mountain consequential uh, rhythm lines into things. When before, you know, in all the other events that we've seen, with the exception of maybe Alaska, it's all, there's, there's pat downs, there's jumps that are already there for you. This is all about trying to figure out natural terrain underneath you and make it, you know, bend the mountain's will to yours. And that, 
sometimes can go great and sometimes can be a massive problem. Yeah. And sometimes with these pillows, it's like if you ride a pillow line once, sometimes all that snow sheds yeah. off and you can't really go back and ride it again. It or, changes the pillow dynamic. Well, before we get into Zoe's run, and we're going to get into her head a little bit and her thoughts on the mountain. Yeah, the, um, the face that we're going to be riding is pretty technical. Probably the most insane face I've ever seen, and nothing like this has ever been done before, which is really exciting. And yeah, it's going to be crazy to put a line together that, um, you know, you can find your way down pretty easily. So, going to have to do a lot of study, and um, I'm pretty excited to watch what everyone comes up with. So, here we go. Zoe, it's her birthday, 22 years old. She is right now getting ready to drop. She's riding a Natural Selection Tour collab with Burton Snowboard. Um, there's part of the industry alliance up here, all the different brands that have come together to put this magical event on as Zoe leaves the start gate. So first run of two here for the title. Well, here we are. This is the finals. This is, this is for the whole show right here. They've only got two runs to make their mark, guaranteed top two finish though at the same time so Zoe up top here through those rollers this is the leisurely part of the run as she starts to head over into the five o'clock shadow the stubbly you know this is a big avi path here where all these little young growth trees are a lot of this has been taken out by previous avalanches over the years you can see all these small little tree tips sticking up trees aren't so big you get a better view of what the terrain is that's coming up at you. And it looks like she's taken a very similar line uh, as she's taken the previous runs. Well, she's proven what we thought. She's uh, staying in the comfort zone. Yeah, I just wonder how that's gonna pan out. I mean, the, the, there's, been, there's been a couple of hot judge calls here today, and I just wonder if it's gonna be, you know, they're gonna take away from it. Plus, it's pretty hard and and Bucky in there as she throws up and over a backflip. So she's getting those tricks out of the way straight away. Going really fast, traveling quite a distance here to get down to another zone. Now, Beeman, talk about like, what's it like when you start getting into those zones where there's been a lot of traffic through there, like how that snow kind of um, firms up as the day goes on? I mean, it definitely affects the way you're riding. It, it can kind of bounce you around in the landing. It can kick you weird off of a takeoff if you hit a little chunder, chunder ball or whatever. So it's, it's definitely to your advantage to land in some fresh snow. And we've seen a, a lot of these features have been hit multiple times by multiple riders. So it's not getting any easier on those features. Yeah, especially over here in this section as we see Zoe trying to hunt and peck her way down here to find some kind of an opportunity. Now remember, one trick is not gonna win this. You've gotta put a line together as she finds herself on top of a pretty large exposure. Straights off of it. Oh! Bomb hole, replace your divots. Maybe a little flatter than she was hoping for there. Ouch, so as she comes down here through the bottom half of her run, Bridges, compare and contrast uh, between her and Elena's run. I mean, Elena didn't have quite, you know, she didn't do the tricks, but what do you think as far as, as far as selection goes? Well, I think Elena flowed really fast, really smooth, had about a half dozen airtime opportunities before Elena started to get off it her worked. flow. But then again, Zoe did have the mm -hmm. drop to the backflip. Um, but I got to give the edge to Elena. Elena yeah. definitely took more chances. She used the slope wisely, didn't travel long distances without getting any airtime, where I think that big traverse for Zoe kind of took her off her rhythm. I mean, this terrain definitely plays into Elena's wheelhouse right now with, with her current focus on snowboarding. I mean, uh, Hannah, how, how is it like trying, I mean, you came up being a slope style champ for years and years, and you translated your skills into the backcountry. How hard is that transition between those two mediums? I mean, it's it's definitely a, a game of time. It's like you put your time in, your energy in, uh, you can figure it out for sure. And there's a lot of things that I learned in the park that apply to, to riding like this too. So I think it's Ooh. just the girls that dedicate the time and energy to doing this kind of riding, those 
Those are the girls who you'll see excel. Sure. All right, right there we see the up and over the Wildcat off of that feature up top for Zoe. And then kind of like this little zone in here, there was, there was some little, little hops and jumps, little bunny hops through here. But she kind of like did a full cannonball off of that last, uh, last feature as we see it coming up right here. But she pointed it though, but it just didn't turn out to be as steep as she thought it was going to be. Yeah, she might have hit the other side of that little spine we saw coming down too. Maybe she overshot a little and had a little bit of an uphill landing. Yeah, I don't. This this one's going to be a tough one to call. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so scores are about to drop. This is run one of two for the women's final here. This is who will go home with the title. Let's see who has the advantage going into run number two. So it will be Zoe carrying the advantage into run number two, a 79.2. Well, when we come back, we're going to see the men's final and another run from the women. Stick around. We are going to be crowning champions here at this year's Natural Selection Tour, coming to you from Revelstoke Mountain. southeastern British Columbia, Canada, in the northern part of the Kootenays and nestled on the bank of the Great Columbia River, lies a little place called Revelstoke. The Columbia is fed by the Illicillouette Glacier, and the watershed surrounding the river bears exceptional ecological significance. The area is so wondrous that Mount Revelstoke National Park was founded in 1914. Revelstoke Mountain Resort is situated on Mount Mackenzie and boasts the longest inbounds vertical of any resort in North America. A staggering 1,700 meters of vertical terrain. While receiving an average of 10.5 meters of snow annually. That's over 34 feet of snow per winter. Revelstoke sits amidst an inland temperate rainforest, which is an ideal climate for snowfall accumulation in the winter months. It rests in the perfect location for cold air to sweep down from central and northern BC and collide with the moisture from the west. This convergence of hot and cold airflow wrings out the moisture from storm systems and dumps snow on the town and the surrounding mountains. Formed by the continental drift over millions of years, Revelstoke's unique location in the Selkirk Range makes it an epic playground for all mountain freestyle snowboarding and the perfect host resort for the Natural Selection Tour, where the best backcountry snowboarders will battle it out for all the glory. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection Tour. We are talking finals from Revelstoke, and it has been a day of history being made out here in the backcountry. The first person to be up will be Blake Paul. And uh, Pat, you know, we were kind of just talking in between the break about, about how the judging goes down in this thing, because it's been, it's been a couple questionable calls that we've, we've been jibber-jabbering about behind Curious the scenes. Curious about. Curious, Curious. about. So, what are they what are they looking at well this is largely similar to the duels and that the judges not only watch the live feed but they also have an ability to replay and they have an ability to replay any of the feeds you mm -hmm. know so if there's a specific angle that somebody might have darted behind a tree you might want to get eyes on that landing again i mean the judges have all these tools in their toolkit so what we're seeing on screen might not necessarily be the replays the judges are going to to kind of get those little details because yeah, it is close yeah. mm -hmm. so hannah i mean blake up against travis rice i mean blake is a student of rice in many many ways because of, of his influence from jackson yeah i mean this is <laughs> this is classic you know grasshopper yeah sensei situation so if blake like... beats travis it's essentially travis's fault yeah, he, so, <laughs> he did a real good job. <laughs> so here we go. Blake Paul, his first run of two here in the Yeti Natural Selection Finals. He's taking a very similar line. There's that tail grab back three over that little hip. 
So a couple little poppers out of the way, a little slob air to get his line set. So as he works his way down here, I mean, we saw him on previous runs just really go to his flow, and that's, that is his strength out here. Travis is going to bulldog these faces and go absolutely massive and use those tree trunks he has for legs to put things down where, you know, Blake is the complete opposite. He just kind of like floats around like a mm -hmm. plastic bag on the wind. Yeah, he's a dancer out there. He kind of just, you know, dances his way down the mountain, makes it look good, and just has a really unique flow to the way he rides. All right, so he's looking at this very first drop, and this would be the beginning of this first saddle. A couple different features in here. We saw him chuck a backy before. He's going to do it again. Balls. Yeah, you got to think the low-hanging fruit's already been picked on this course. So you're either going into something like one of the lanes that doesn't have as many features or one of the lanes that hasn't been ridden for a reason. Now, Blake, in the run previous to this one that popped him into the finals that beat Jared, he, the only time he really stopped was in this really weird section uh, at the bottom. It didn't look like he needed to slow down at all. He's keeping his flow up pretty good. Doing a couple little pillow checks to make sure that there's a landing underneath him, but uh, for the most part, he's carrying his line through here and not really pausing very much. No, I mean, a lot's been made out of how Blake makes it look so effortless. But again, with the judges we have today, they've been Oof. on faces like this. They know what he's doing. Look at this, front side 360. Nice he's got that backflip under his belt now. Trying to eye up another little feature here. See if we can squeeze in one more little pillow stack before the finish. Yeah, he's going to need something big. He knows Travis is, you know, Travis has got eye of the tiger. I, it's not good to be competing against Travis Rice when Travis is backed into a corner. Here we go, Blake looking at something here. A little ollie out into the flats, but sticks it. So Blake, decent run, couple tricks in there, that front three, a little iguana backflip. Uh, Tip your hat to Damian Sanders. But so he got, uh, got a couple tricks in there. Decent line. Now, where do you, obviously we know Travis isn't shy about stepping to some of these um, large marge features in the middle here. Do you think he's gonna go straight over there? I mean, look at him right here. He's on his phone, peeping probably the line that would make either one of us poop our drawers over here and yeah. just trying to like tee it up. I mean, I, I think I was, joking when we were off off camera earlier but i wouldn't be surprised if travis just straight lines into that and jumps the whole pillow face <laughs> like travis just has that determination that hunger that like he will do what it takes to get the job done i think blake paul is really consistent mm -hmm. and blake can put down a very like beautiful freestyle run every time i think travis just has that wild hair that you just never know what you're gonna gonna get from yeah him. i mean there's there's people on this planet and you think about different athletes that kind of embody what rice has you get like a a travis pastrana you know people like that that are like these crazy showmen where it seems like complete chaos to the average human like oh my god he's crazy but it's mm -hmm. it's he's not comfortable until he's in that zone of having it seem out of control mm -hmm. and that's when travis's eyeballs are vibrating the most he and thrives. he's in that zone <laughs> transcends yeah. to a different totally. level when it's he's so in that crazy <laughs> And, but he's, I mean, you can tell he's like looking at this right now. I think that's one of the hard parts about this venue is there's so many options that it's like, how do you, how do you make the call of what line to ride? Right. Because it could uh, go different on every line. It could be such a different scenario. Yeah, it's, it's wild. All right, T-Bird, you're down at the bottom of the course. Uh, let's hear a little bit from Blake Paul and, and what he thinks Travis has got in store. Yeah, I'm down here with Blake Paul. It's the Battle of Jacks in Wyoming right now. Um, Blake, looking ahead after that incredible run, what do you think Mr. Rice is going to do? Um, I think he's probably going for one of the biggest cliffs somewhere out here to ride down. <laughs> Some sort of line that hasn't been ridden, I would say. Seems like most uh, rideable lines or obvious lines have been ridden, so... I don't think anyone really knows what Travis is going to do. But he was studying up top when I dropped in. You seem very, very chill. Is the pressure of finals getting to you? Um, 
I was more nervous just before the whole event, just to get into the terrain and see kind of what it does to everybody. But uh, now feeling a little bit more relaxed. It's been pretty fun riding and the snow is great. And somehow I'm still snowboarding. So <laughs> just keeping it going, I guess, up against a big wig. Yeah, buddy, good job. Take a quick walk with me over here as we're waiting for Blake Paul's score to come in. We got the gallery. We got Haley Langlin, Mikey Cicerelli, Ben Ferguson, Jared Elson, Nickel Bang, Kimmy Vasani, Dustin Craven. Deal, what are y'all thinking? What do you think? <laughs> uh, it's been so much fun to watch. And I don't know. I think, I think Zoe's got this one. You heard it from down here. We're going to go back up top. Travis Rice about to drop in. Let's see what he does. Thank you, T-Bird. I am nervously anticipating this run. I know Travis is going to do something special, and it is going to be spectacular. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Travis Rice, his first run in the final of natural selection from the deep backcountry of Revelstoke. This whole thing came out of this guy's brain. The only reason that anyone's even out here is because Travis Rice was probably sitting on a car ride at one point and was like, hey, I'm just gonna change the way competition format works in snowboarding. This is really boring. I'm really good at everything. Uh, so we're gonna switch it up a little bit and, and make the terrain one of the uh, hardest competitors to take down. I gotta say, compared to Blake, when I was watching Blake's last run, I was comparing it to his previous runs, mm -hmm. and I wasn't even looking at it through the lens of what does Blake need to do to be Travis? Right. I was looking at it, how can Blake better his previous runs? But that's not where we're at anymore. No. It, it, we're definitely not there, especially when like, you can tell the body language of Travis where he didn't want to sit there and talk to Stan. He, he's not joking around. He's just like, you know, it's like a cat with its hair standing up straight on its back. Travis is on the hunt. That's right. He's like a pit bull that's been beaten in a cage for three days, <laughs> unleashed on this course. He wants meat. Well, he is going far to the uh, west side, is it? Yeah, riders left, I believe. Way over there. And this is un, uh, untouched territory, so some deeper powder turns up top. But this is where some of those giant features where everyone has been kind of like uh, Billy goading around exist. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's finding stuff right here. Look at that wave. Yeah. Nice there's, front side snap. There's some big pillow bouldery field options down in, in that corner that nobody's really gotten to yet, so. All right, as Travis, I mean, he's trying to find his way into that large section of terrain, that swath of terrain that really makes a difference and here it is travis as we pull back we see what he's coming up upon and that's one of the best things about this is the gopro drone view we get to see what the riders cannot and it really builds anticipation for us to see what's going to happen what is he putting himself on top of yeah the foreshadowing is so ominous when you look at this angle and he is not slowing there. down rice lacing a giant there. double line right there Holding on to it, holy cow. Little combo 360, trying to hold on to it. It's a little wild in there. That was insane. The line of the day right there, easily. Cindy Award is up for grabs as well as we see these car-sized chunks of snow rolling down that face with him. That was insane. That's what I think, you know, Blake was afraid of. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You don't put baby in a corner. <laughs> you do not. So Travis Rice uh, coming down here, doing Travis Rice stuff. Blake knows what's up. I mean, obviously, he is a student of Travis Rice. I can't wait to see the replay. <laughs> I, mean, I know. Yeah. I'm like so blown away. Because he didn't, I thought he was going to stop up top, and he didn't even slow down. He just pointed it through there. Full no, commitment. and he was in the white room for a couple of those shelves. Yeah. Unbelievable from Travis. That was, ah! no, yes, there it is. We lost the GoPro on that run, I think. Or was that on when we started? 
I was really looking forward to the POV on that I one. I know, right? <laughs> that was for Craven. <laughs> yes. Holy cow, that was heavy. That was two contrasting styles of snowboarding put head to head. Let's take a look back. Look, look at Blake here, finessing his way down through the line. So, I mean, he had the tricks, Hana, but the, the, uh, the hold your breath factor wasn't quite as strong as Travis's run. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how the judges judge those two runs because they're so, so different. It's a really hard, hard job judging, you know, apples and oranges, very different things. But Pat, one thing to notice is uh, top to bottom, I mean, they, there was no falls in either one of those runs. It was constant flow. It was constant flow. The other thing you got to think about too, though, is we've seen Blake take that zone a couple times. Travis is oh totally pioneering a new line. That, look at this, one more time for the people in back. We thought he was gonna stop up there, he didn't. He just punched it. Just wheeling down through those powder stacks. You see all that slough coming down behind him. Travis just fed on that face right there. Look at this. The Cindy Award of the day so far, I would argue that this is the front runner right now. Well, and get this, the after bang right here with the three at the bottom. Yeah, that's just like, that's the icing on the cake. Like, he yeah. didn't need to do that. And, uh, you know, he was actually Right taking, there, wallying in. Yeah, big wall right in. He hits that 360 as just like, you know, that was a risky move. He'd already laced that line. If he had fallen on that 360, he could have thrown that all away, but he just nailed it. And I feel like you could see him. He was kind of cruising along the top ridge there, looking for his entry. But when he saw that entry, it was all go. This is going to be a big, commitment. big score. I know. I got to size up when I go to Bear next weekend. I'm riding yeah. too short of a board. You should. <laughs> you should ride something much bigger, Pat. <laughs> all right. What is the score going to be? Are we going to break into the 90s for Travis Rice? A high 80? Do they want the judges want to leave themselves some wiggle room? Legs are finally warmed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so run number one, Travis with a 90.8. Blake coming in with a 73.4. Travis carrying a meaty lead into the second runs. Do you get that, Travis? It's like my legs are finally warmed up, whereas there's 11 other riders here are like, God, my legs are cooked. Oh, that's part of being uh, 40. About. <laughs> 40 now, it takes you a couple runs down right. that face to warm up. Jeez, Louise, what a just attacking of that terrain. Opened up a brand new line. As we look at this, the overview of what these riders have to take down, it is just magnificent. So next up, we will have the second runs right back up to the top with the women. Elena Height will be the first to drop. This will be for the winner. Who is going to take home this year's Yeti Natural Selection? Elena Height will go first. Well, certainly this matchup going into second round is a lot closer, yeah. a lot more of a rivalry than what we saw between Blake and Travis. I just like the fact that it, you, you have these two different riding styles. Like You have one woman that's just doing back 12s and switch back 12s like it ain't nothing, and Elena is just like, focused on going in the backcountry and living in a tent for three weeks, you know? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Elena is just so good at riding technical lines like this. And I think if she can, if she can get the line clean all the way through, I, I feel like that's going to be a really great run. Um, I just worry about Zoe and her tricks and uh, she, that's the element that Elena doesn't have in her run so far. So right. I'm looking forward to see if Elena like tries to add a little bit of, of freestyle stuff in there to level up, or if she's just going to try and hit a bigger, more serious stack. I mean, she doesn't need much, right? She just mm -hmm. basically needs like a backside 360 or like a solid grab off of something. 
But, you know, I feel like that she, if I was, if I was giving Elena advice, I would say find your way back over to those, that, that triple stack into the double stack that you got yourself into this position in the finals with. Yeah, and avoid any hesitation. Take the run top to bottom, peak to valley with confidence. And she's finding some fresh snow in there, taking a line. That's where Blake Paul came down. You saw him in this section of the run earlier. There's a lot of tracks in there right now. Yeah, kind a of lot a, of traffic. Kind of, it's kind of a paved section of this course. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of slough that is underneath some of these bigger features as well. So the landings are not the pillows they used to be. But here we are on the finals, second round of finals, and there is still some hallways on track. Well, there's really only been like a, <laughs> a dozen riders through this thing all day long. <laughs> there should be. But what an incredible face. I mean, there's still so many features out there, but it's hard to, it's hard to deviate from the terrain that you've gotten a little familiar with, right? right? Like you don't, that's a big chance going off of the course that you already take. And so I, I see why, like I understand why the riders are sticking to the runs that they know because the more familiar you are, the more confidence you have, the better you could ride. And, and what a big difference when you're looking at the drone's eye view of this compared to when you have the pulled out long lens. It doesn't look as big. Elena, double stacking. Right there, makes Ooh. it out. Oh, oh. And almost gets launched into that bush right there, but she had that technical stack of pillows up top. She made her way back to that zone that you were calling out, mm -hmm. and that was the highlight from her semifinals. Yeah, so Elena Height playing to her strengths, gets kind of bucked a little bit off of that, you know, that consequential drop section there. As we see Zoe straight back up to the top as Elena finishes out her run down here in the Powder Flats. Look. So not only does, uh, does this event have someone going home with a oversized novelty check, but also you get to move on to the next event and you can go home potentially. If you take this whole thing home, you can go home with a ski -Doo. And we have uh, the Ski-Doo ambassadors down there at the bottom hooking everyone up with rides from that Billy Goat track all the way back to the base staging area. So big shout outs to them. As we see Zoe get ready for her final attempt here through this terrain, is she going to go straight back over into that zone? I, I want her not to. I want her to go and explore a little bit and maybe put herself into an uncomfortability zone. Yeah, I want to see if she's going to take a chance and do something different, maybe try try a bigger trick, try a bigger stack. I don't know if she's going to try and just up her run from the last one or if she's going to, you know, really go out there and take a chance and try something different. She has that score though. She mm -hmm. I mean she has wiggle room to to play with here. Like she's already sitting on a decent score. Now, I would say if you want a bigger score, maybe go and start to hunt down some of those other places what? that maybe she hasn't been in yet. Well, I think the question right now isn't whether or not Zoe can better Elena's second run. It's a matter of whether or not Elena's second run better yeah, Zoe's that's, first, that's, which I got to be honest, I don't think she quite did. I think Zoe wants to just better her own run. Of course. Regardless of Elena's yeah. score, I think she's looking to up it for herself. And I think, I think she's going to take some chances. Like, play around, you know? Zoe... Zoe likes to have fun out there. She likes to play. She likes to push herself. So I think we'll see her, hopefully, yeah. do that on this run. Well, had Elena pulled the bottom shelf so after going off the triple on the ride out, hitting that next air, had she not, like, got thrown off her line, I think for sure we'd be looking at a competitive score. And I think it is going to be a competitive score, mm -hmm. but I think she got a little lost finding that spot. All right, so here we go. Zoe, this is for the title right here of the Natural Selection Tour here from Revelstoke. It's Zoe's to lose at this point. We still don't know what Elena scored on her second run. Zoe has the advantage right now. Well, this is it. This is 
whether or not you're going to be champion of the natural selection tour comes down to this run as far as the Revelstoke stop. So she's looking to get herself. Yeah, it looks like she's heading straight back over into that terrain once again. You know, this is this is and I I fall victim to this as well when I ride in the backcountry too. Like I go to what's familiar and Zoe is like she's familiar with like park riding. Park riding is the same. So you want to have that you want to have those opportunities for airtime over and over again. She knows that she's got a guaranteed popper over here that she can chuck a backflip on. She knows that there's a spot for the front three. But I got to I got to be thinking those landings can't be all that sweet anymore. They're a little rugged coming out. Oh, oh goes for front seven. That's what I wanted to see. She gets, yeah, she went for it. Front went seven. For a bigger spin. And that was, uh, Broke you know, the camera. how we wanted her to see, you know, her her to incorporate that terrain. As we have, we have a little camera problem. We're in the backcountry. Yeah. What are you going to do? You're a million miles back there. So we're going to get back to Zoe's run here in a second. But, you know, we were just saying, like, if you're going to go back to that terrain, mm -hmm. you have to up it. You can't just rely on the old faithful of the up and over wildcat backflip yeah. again. She did that run. She was looking to improve on it. And for Zoe, I think improving a run means more rotations, more tricks. So, Pat, with, I mean, with that slam, I mean, she's already in the lead. But with that slam and not knowing what Elena's next score is going to be, do you, think it's, do you think it's tight here? Like, what do you think? Well, obviously, she's probably on slope right now, and we're not seeing what's happening right now, but hopefully we'll get a replay. But it depends. Did she fill her goggles with snow? In which case, that's going to throw you off a little bit, affect your visibility. Um, I think the reason why she went for the 720 is like, hey, I've already set down the run I want to set down on this side, so now let me go for the run that at the end of the day, mm -hmm. I don't want to walk away saying, you know, I should have tried this. She just did. Yeah. Right. And if you guys are wondering, like, you know, we've the the whole staging of this event is there is nothing back there. There is no place to plug a cord in. So the fact that this event is even taking place in the middle of the backcountry is absolutely nuts. And so far today, we've had no issues. But mm -hmm. when you're in the middle of the backcountry, stuff happens. I mean, for the riders, for the technical aspect of this. So. Just bear with us for a few minutes as we wax pathetic here in in the uh, the host set. So let's talk broader picture here because now after this run comes down, we get you know whoever's going to have the advantage. Well, whoever's going to win this thing basically for Zoe and Elena. But the big story I think here is okay, straight back up to the top with Blake and Travis. Mm -hmm. I mean, Blake's got to move on from that zone or throw sevens. You know. And he's, his hand has been forced at this point, which leads me into the next uh, topic at hand is, where does Travis go now? <laughs> well, I was thinking this about Zoe just now. Here we are. Zoe's on her second round of the finals. Um, we know the high consequence features are in the middle of the zone. Yeah. And you kept talking about, rightfully so, how she kept going riders right. Perhaps she's like, well... The conditions, my legs, it's been a long day. If I get into the really hairy stuff, yeah. am I taking a risk unwarranted? Yeah. Now, Blake doesn't have that luxury. Blake's got to get out of his comfort zone to not only beat Travis, but even to match Travis with what Travis just did. And I think there's, as far as anybody who would have followed Travis down that face, it yeah. probably would have been the rider he beat in the round before. It's Dustin Craven. Yeah. It's probably the only other rider. Well, he said he said he did it for Dustin. All right. Exactly. Well, before we get back into this, we're going to throw to some of the highlights of Elena's and Zoe's runs here. Let's take a look back at it. Watch some snowboarding instead of us in the studio. So here is the drone's view of Elena trying to set this up. So Elena trying here to find some uh, untouched snow to get busy on. And she was, this is the first run. And look at this right here. That was that double stack where she almost gets spit into that bush. That was so sketchy. <laughs> you we, couldn't really see that from the, from no. the initial view that we saw. That angle adds, shows really the full story right there. And I might be uh, 
Change of my tone on that. The judges might surprise it's pretty us. Pretty heavy, yeah. That that run had consequence. So here's here's Zoe's line, and uh, talk us through this, Hannah. Just like where she was, and what her thought process was to have her like end up in 720 country. Well, I mean, right here, I think she's just you know you can see her bouncing around, having fun. I think she's getting herself pumped up to try some bigger tricks, like we saw that seven, and you know she's she's finding her way back. She's familiar with this with this feature. I think she's just kind of being in the moment, and then when she gets there, that's when you kind of are like, yep, this is the time, yep. it's gotta happen. So, I mean, Pat, just, just reflecting on what you were saying, Pat, I think Zoe's hand had been forced, she saw what Elena put together, and man, oh man, it's gonna be interesting to see how these scores shake out. All right, so we're gonna take a little break right now. When we come back, we have the scores from the women's final, and we're gonna go straight back up to the top. It's gonna to be Blake Paul taking on the behemoth of Travis Rice. Let's see who wins this thing right now at Natural Selection Tour. I mean, he's surely feeling good. He's got that 92 to sit on, but of course, knowing Travis, he's not one to lay back on anything. Well, that was a flat landing. He really had to judge his speed carefully there, not to overshoot that. So he's got one drop up at the top there. The cheeky backside 180, setting up for that same hit that we saw Torstein on. Oh, and the going. cab fight. Yeah, yeah, solid, solid strategy so from good, baby. Rice right there. And, and he's he, feeling good. It should have been toe heavy for him. He had to kind of lay light off his heels there to get into that super technical takeoff. What? Oh, oh man! Frontside wow. 540 off that diving board. So he's riding switch now and through the bottom of this face. Just opening up a whole new zone. Whoa! Cap free! And just a little hot butter out. Okay, Travis Rice is on one right now. Where? where? I, I don't know what to say. This is just. This, this words sort of start running out at this point because we're in uncharted territory. No one's ever laid this kind of consistency down over a face this side with size, this, with this intensity of tricks. Welcome back to the Yeti Natural Selection here from Revelstoke in the Selkirk Tangiers, part of BC, and it has been an incredible day. We are setting up a monster last run between Travis Rice and Blake Paul. Travis Rice will be the final competitor to drop. He started this day off with a bang, and he's gonna end it with a bang, but we now await the scores from this final run that will determine the natural selection winner for the women's side. Elena Height, Zoe sadowski Sinnott, who is gonna take this thing home? Waiting for scores to drop. This is huge. Who is gonna, T-Bird, T-Bird's gonna bring the news to us here. T-Bird, we're gonna throw it down to you. You can drop the hammer. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? He went. All right, it has just come in from our judges that the winner of the Yeti Natural Selection is going to be Zoe sadowski Sinnott. Happy birthday! 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 Absolutely unbelievable. Zoe, after all the work, all the preparation that went into riding this course, how does it feel to emerge victorious? Um, yeah, it feels pretty insane. I've honestly never ridden any terrain like this, so yeah, to come away and like get a, a few runs down it and like come down in one piece and then win is pretty insane. Also, one more thing. Happy birthday, Zoe. Thank you. Should we sing Zoe happy birthday? Yeah. Sure. On three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. All right, well, 
What an incredible day for Zoe. I mean, hats off to all the women out here today, but Zoe coming through clutch performance, unbelievable. Her conquering of multifaceted terrain dominance. I mean, it's, it's unreal. And here we have Travis Rice. He is not playing Tetris on his phone. He is deeply studying a line that would make any mortal man quake in their boots. Blake Paul is probably on the opposite side of the spectrum, just like, I don't know, man. i just going to go and do what I can do. So, Hannah, you and I have both traveled with Travis. Actually, all three of us have traveled with Travis a Indeed. lot. Give me some insight into the brain. How does Travis Rice's brain work differently than other human beings? <laughs> if I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel no. like, I feel like we have some idea. Um, yeah, I, I do not know. I just know Travis is always, like, trying to be the best he can be the right. best Travis. He's always trying to push. He's always like trying to draw that out of other people. And he just, you know, well, he doesn't take no for an answer. He doesn't. That's, that <laughs> is a great point. Travis Rice does not take no for an answer. And someone else that will not take no for an answer is our man Stan, who is up top. Stan, what is a word from the Stargate? You're up there with Blake Paul right now. I'll, I'm going to fill here for Stan because Obviously, uh, he didn't take no for an answer when people asked him to uh, be a sideline commentator. Stan, what is the word up there? Plug your mic in, for God's sake. <laughs> Mike is in. We're ready to roll. I'll tell you what. We got up here. Travis just looks at Blake and says, well, at least you don't have to play it safe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the, the, the vibe has been clear. <laughs> Travis wants uh, to see Blake do something. Blake, I think his uh, his his word was, uh, "We're gonna see what happens when we get in there." Yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Two contrasting styles. This is the final run of the Yeti Natural Selection. Travis Rice wants to eat Blake Paul as a snack. You've heard it here first. We're gonna see what happens. Blake is also going to just see what the mountain gives him. And, you know, to kind of reflect on, on a uh, proverb by Craig Kelly, you know, you want to be like a marble rolling down the hill. And that's really how Blake Paul's style is in the way that he, he interprets terrain. Don't you think, Pat? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he is. I was hoping for something a little bit more exploratory, see how uh, Blake handles some of the more, you know, pillowy terrain. But here he has gone to the right, but he's... He's got one of the most enviable styles in all of snowboarding. Everybody wants to uh, be as light on their feet as him. And yeah, less. And, and I mean, just just watching him dance, like as as Hannah had said earlier. So you've got the marble rolling down the hill versus the bowling ball, which is about to come in in a few minutes here. But I mean, Blake looking like he's he's carrying a very similar line. Will we see some different tricks? That's going to be the question. And Blake could easily surprise us. He could choose, you know, choose a different line oh, out back of the blue. Seven. That was a nice little back seven. Blake going for the most spins around in one trick today in the Yeti Natural Selection Tour. Yeah, he's taking a cue from Zoe there. She was going for her seven. I mean, that's literally the one feature that I've seen in this entire course that is the most like a jump. Mm -hmm. You know, a typical poppy style jump that Blake would, you know, encounter at Brighton where he rides all the time now. Blake's getting into the stack. Oh, ridden nicely. Yep, carrying a lot of speed. But that right there is indicative of the other hazard when you get into some of these bigger features is there's either another pillow in the landing or there's trees in the landing. And the landings are, <laughs> the landings are key because you know, when you're on those pillows, it's really hard to dump speed. Like once you get going on those pillows, you are just going. There's nowhere to, to slow down. So you'd want to make sure that you have a nice clean landing to get, get through. Here we go, Blake. A little bit of a heel side elevator through the upper portion of that chute. But so far, I mean, he did that backside seven, kind of a backside seven to butt a little bit if I'm splitting hairs here, and I'm sure the judges definitely are. Um, and also that big front three. Back 180, kind of laying it down. So I'm, I'm not seeing that in the 90s. I'm not seeing that run being in the 90s for Blake. 
I think it's safe to say that run's not in the 90s, but Blake knew he had to mix it up, and yeah. he definitely mixed it up on that run. And it was it was a great run. Challenge is, it's, is it a great run for the finals against Travis Rice? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, the thing that I'm kind of the most, uh, I wouldn't say disappointed, but, but it's to me, I would have loved to have seen a different matchup with people. I would love to have seen Craven versus Rice at the end of this, because I think that they have two of the most similar styles, and I think we would have seen just a straight up warlord battle over there on those uh, meaty stacks of pillows. But, you know, Blake played to his strengths, and that's riding super light through through terrain, popping in and out. I mean, anyone that's ever ridden with, ridden with Blake at Brighton or any resort around knows that, that you can't touch him. He's like a bunny rabbit bouncing around the, the snow. And that's what these riders got to do. You have to play to your strengths. If you're trying to be out there and trying to ride like one of the other riders, you're, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. So it's like these riders, they know what they're good at. They know what they can, what they can do out there. And I think, you know, it just depends on how the judges interpret that, what they want to see out there and, and what everybody ends up thrown down. So I, I feel like Trav is a pretty, he, he can read what a score will be. Because, I mean, he's been competing in, in everything from, from half by big air slope style for years and years and years and years and years. He knows how to read what scoring is going to be. He knows how to read what he needs to do. But I feel like this being his event and everyone's expectations of him stepping to the gnarliest terrain with reckless abandon, like, do you think we're going to see a safety run by any means if, if Travis feels confident on this final run that he's got this in the bag? No, I think Travis is going to definitely try to step it up. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, we're going to go down to T-Bird. He's got Blake. We saw our boy redirect into that massive fill line last run. So, yeah, it was a fun last little run. Tried to get a few more tricks in, but wasn't didn't go as good as I wanted to. How much did endurance play a factor today? You must be exhausted. Um, definitely a bit, but also, you know, it's steep pow. It's not too bad. Uh, more mental endurance, I think, was the, the ticket today. Just how much you studied, what's possible, watch everybody kind of pinpoint things. And yeah, definitely happy that everybody's standing at the bottom besides the big boy. And after all that research, all the diligence you did studying this course, was it what you expected or was it something different? Uh, everything on the course is bigger than expected, for sure. Um, a lot of the drone lines make stuff look rideable, and then you see photos and it's unrideable, and you really have to look at everything from every angle, and then when you're riding it, it's even different and just vaster, and the, the runnels and the guts between the pillow lines are pretty deadly in there. All right, man, well, congratulations. You rode incredible today. Thanks, Steve, bro. Appreciate let's see what, it, bro. Let's see what the boss man does. Up yeah. to the top, Travis Rice dropping next. <laughs> Thanks, T-Bird. Straight back up to the top with the boss man. And here he is, Travis Rice, about to put on an absolute show for us. I mean, this whole event, it started with Trav. It is going to end with Trav. And I hope this thing just gets set off like a crescendo of fireworks. I... Is it worth noting Travis is listening to Survivor Eye of the Tiger? Oh, I thought that was your phone. I, I don't know where that's coming from. Is it Travis? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he does. I mean, look, there, if there's one person that embodies Eye of the Tiger, it's it's a home slice right here. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's uh, also, I mean, as far as attrition goes, it's about all contingency plans. I think Travis had a plan for each separate heat of the brackets. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think and, Craven and he, did as well. I yeah. think Torstein probably did as well, but he didn't advance. Whereas a lot of the other riders were a little bit more, you know, impromptu. They were more freestyle. I mean, Travis has years of looking at Polaroids to try to, or looking at iPhone shots <laughs> of where you want to go in Alaska and all these crazy faces. He probably has the most experience of anyone out here picking your way down a line that doesn't look doable. And Travis has really ridden all over the, the course. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think Travis just really wants to ride all of those lines. So he's trying to get as many in as he possibly can. <laughs> 
All right, so this is it, the final run of the day. We've already seen a stellar performance by Travis Rice. This will be the icing on the cake for him. Travis Rice, final competitor to come down this incredible terrain outside Revelstoke at the Yeti Natural Selection. Out there in the fresh. Just playing around at this point. An incredible run that is up for the Sendy Award of the day, that insane pillow line that he took earlier. Casually finding his way through the woods. See, it's the first rider to drop on the day and the last rider we're gonna see here at the Yeti Natural Selection at Revelstoke. Where is he going? I'm trying to like, like in my mind, I keep picturing the little, uh, um, picture that we had oh my gosh Trav is coming in hot so he's already taken down the mellower section of this run but I think he's if I'm thinking he's in where he where he might be this empties into a very very meaty zone and that might even be Ferguson's track right there <laughs> if you know what I mean <laughs> second track of the day Oh. oh, my lord. Here we go. Trav finding his way over into the meat of this course, straight in the middle, carrying a lot of speed, momentum not being cut at all as he navigates his way through some of these huge drops. Well, it's funny how riders on the tour have trouble, like, scheduling out time to film a video part, whereas travel just, Travis just multitasks. And that's, that's something that these judges, they want to see uh, a run through here that you would be, you know, putting in a video. Trav hasn't slowed his momentum at all. Straight off of this at the bottom here. That was the run. What a nuts run. Straight down the middle. Travis Rice, the final competitor here. And I'm going to say it, it's all but latched up for Rice. I don't even know how many pillows that was. I lost count. <laughs> that was like uh, that was like going to a fancy hotel for old people. There were so many pillows on the bed. <laughs> He's well, got to be happy with that. If he didn't already have the Sandy Award, as far as line of the day, that might have been it as well. Wow. T. Ricky, the legend, just adding another chapter on, to his Good snowboarding on, resume. Great. And making it look easy for how hard that line was, he made it look really good. Look, Rice is like <laughs> Blake Paul is about as thick as one of Rice's thighs. And that's just so he's like two Blake tall, Blake Paul legs. The dude is a madman. All the other writers are in their own head going, how did he find that line and how was that not written until the last run of the day? That's what I said earlier. He will just find lines that you don't see. All right, we're waiting for scores right now. But before we do, let's recap what went down on that second matchup for these guys. There's that back seven. Real nice back seven for Blake. Two totally different styles of getting the job done here in these final runs. It's Blake hunting his way down here. Goes down on that run a couple times. But what an amazing showing from Blake Paul all day long. He just flowed this course, made it look really, really easy. And then uh, this guy. Travis Rice carrying mad momentum down through these trees. This is in insane. When you pull out and see the amount of terrain he covered in such a short period of time with so many different drops. And like you said, Hana, like look at all these pillows that he had to navigate down here. He sees the finish line. Mm -hmm. He's really good at just seeing through the whole line, like kind of he just commits and he can find a way down through through those sections. Unreal. So Travis put up a 90 on his first run 
What will the second run score be compared to Blake Paul? It's going to be huge. Scores are coming in. Travis puts down an 87. So Travis Rice is the winner of the Yeti Natural Selection here at Revelstoke. Huge thanks to Revelstoke for putting this event on. What an insane day. History has yeah. been made here as far as what we consider Hunger to be Mountain. competition. Oh, it's a full moon tonight. Travis Rice is officially turning into a werewolf. T-Bird, get there with our winner. All right, the first Woo! rider to drop and the last rider to shut it down. You're looking at the Yeti Natural Selection Revelstoke champion, Mr. Travis Rice. Travis, how did this course push you both mentally and physically today on your snowboard? <laughs> in every damn way that it possibly could have. I mean, this this face is is so buck. It's uh, I mean, it's like borderline, borderline. Like, is this too aggressive of a face to have a contest on? <laughs> but we did it, man. Oh. Um, secondly, I want to ask you, as one of the founders of this tour, looking at what it's become and where we are now, what's going through your head when you see what we're doing out here after all these years? So easy. <laughs> uh, I mean, man, it's just, you know, humility and gratitude for everyone. The riders all showing up and stepping up. Um, I mean, it's it's crazy. Like, what the, the level of what you all are seeing right now from the backcountry is so many people that have put so much effort into this. And, um, you know, it's it's been a joy to, like, continue to push in different directions and see, you know, how far this thing can go. And... I mean, we're live from the great pillow wall of the north. And that was your first time ever going against Blake in a head-to-head, -head, correct? Yeah. What uh, what you see out of Blake today that impressed you from the top before you dropped in? I think I heard uh, I think I heard Ed Lee saying something about his riding being essentially like silk. Um, I mean, Blake's so confident on his on his feet on his board. He's so light. He's almost like, uh, he's, he's almost got like a refined, almost Nico, Nicholas Mueller kind of lightness to him, but in his own way, you know, he, he's just an incredibly stylish rider, getting to go into the finals with him, you know, representing County 22 and, and Blake Paul, give it up. Hey, congratulations, man. Travis Rice, your 2023 Yeti Natural Selection Champion. Well done, my man. <laughs> Back Thank to you, you guys. Thank you, T-Bird. I mean, what an incredible day. This has been absolutely nuts as far as like what we've seen, the transformation of what a competition in snowboarding can be. Rice has done it again here. Hannah, what are your final thoughts of the day? <sighs> that was so fun to watch. I think it checked all the boxes I expected for the day. We saw some massive pillows we saw some crazy maneuvers in yeah. situations that you couldn't predict and i think i think everybody rode really well and man what a what a fun thing to watch Pat, yeah. sum up the day for us well historic you know monumental um i think right now for like where travis took us on this journey over the last three years today's got to be that you know penultimate moment of proof of concept for him you know he had already been to scary cherry before he had been to jackson before but in his mind's eye i think this is the train he mm -hmm. really envisioned this tour getting to and it was he was the one because i think all of us were a little bit cynical looking at the venue yeah. over the last couple of days going well is this even going to work you know what's going to happen? Are the riders going to unstrap and hike out a yeah, certain yeah, feature, yeah. certain lines? Are people going to get lost? Uh, what's going to happen if they, you know, bomb hole? Are yep. we going to have to, you know, like cut down. the commercials all day long? And how long is it going to take? And what's the attrition? I think it's incredible. Everybody has something to be proud of from today. Yeah, it was fantastic. Well, without the global partners that we've had here, Caffeine, ESPN, GoPro, Red Bull, we wouldn't have been able to bring this to you. Also, massive shouts out to Yeti. Huge 
Thanks to Travis Rice for coming up with this crazy thing and letting us just bask in the glory of his ideas. This has been insane. The Yeti Natural Selection Tour from Revelstoke is a wrap. But coming up next, stick around. We have the post show. We're going to talk about all the things that went down today. Giveaway a Sandy Award, all kinds of crazy stuff. Stick around. Much more to come from the Natural Selection here from Revelstoke right after this. The largest reservoir of fresh water on Earth and the top of the watershed, the snowpack, where we play, is found in mountain ranges around the world. Melting snow begins the water's journey down through creeks, rivers, and estuaries, all the way to the sea. The ocean, rich with kelp, coral, and mangrove forests, is the Earth's largest carbon sink. And protecting these blue carbon ecosystems is key to slowing the planet's warming climate and snowpack. By regenerating coastal ecosystems, sea trees works to naturally capture carbon emissions, address climate change, and protect everything living downstream of a healthy snowpack. The Natural Selection Tour strives to connect people with Mother Nature and, through those experiences, inspire them to protect it. Working with sea trees, the tour has calculated and is addressing its climate impact through support for highly effective blue carbon capture projects. Learn more about sea trees and how you too can help protect the snowpack and everything living downstream of it for today and tomorrow. Wow, take a breath. <laughs> the action is done, the dust is settling. What an incredible three hours of snowboarding we've just witnessed. One of the most ludicrous, I think we can say, venues that snowboarding has ever come across. This is the most wonderful pun ever, Natural Reflections. Joined for the post show by Mary Walsh, Pat Bridges and Hannah Beeman. So much to discuss here. I mean, sum it up, have a look over everything you've just witnessed. What do you make of this, Hannah? I wish I was there, but <laughs> it was mind melting. I'm like, I can't even imagine the amount of studying and just, you know, strategy that went into everybody's runs today. Blake Paul talked about that in the post-final interview. He said that it was mental endurance more than physical endurance. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, we go out and we film lines like this for like a whole day, as many runs as we can get in. And even though this is a really long course and you're taking multiple runs, it's probably still not as much snowboarding as we normally do in a day. It's more about controlling those ups and downs of like your adrenaline and your emotions and all that, that it's like, you just don't want to get too fatigued in that way. Mary made a brilliant point watching the finals outside that the last hour has been like a glimpse inside Travis Rice's head. I mean, Pat, you've watched more snowboarding than almost all of us combined. What did you make of that? Well, and I mean, the first time I went heliboarding was a couple of kilometers away from the venue with Travis. So I've seen him in these situations on slope where, like when he's filming in a situation like that, one, he doesn't even tell the guys to take out the camera unless it's a type of feature that he thinks is going to make it in the film. And if he doesn't think he can land it in one or two tries, he also doesn't tell him to pull out the camera. So he carries that sort of on it, consistency, you know, like superlative. That's, he lives on a plane where openers and enders are just his safety tricks. I mean, I think to what you're saying, we saw Travis put down a video park timeline. I think going into the finals run, this is where we saw what we talked about earlier today with the, the pressure bubble that riders like Travis exist in and when they kind of perform, they pull like the throttle all the way and they perform to their max. That's what we saw. We saw Travis, you know, when psychologists write books about the flow state, that is what was happening. Travis turned on and just sent it, and it was, it was mind-melting, like you said, Anna. But uh, the two main points to discuss today for me, the, in the men's category at least, the standouts are the fact that Blake Paul had a point to prove after Baldface last year, and he did that, but also that Travis, there was, after the semi-finals result, where we saw him berating himself, 
He then got put through to the final and, I mean, I think we can call it anger boarding. It was almost that he had a point to prove there, not just to the judges, but to all of us that this is what I can do. This is what I came here for. To your point, Pat, I think Travis knows he wants any, any snowboarding that's happening to be ironclad proof this was the best snowboarding. Mm -hmm. And if someone's going to win, he wants it to be without any possible uh, argument that they aren't deserving of that top spot. And what he was doing, I think, in those last two runs is showing, OK, I'm in finals. I'm going to put down the most ridiculous run possible and make it look amazing to, to make sure that this is the highest level of boarding possible and stop. Well, I think the features in the train that was chosen for today was so dramatic and so overtly visually intimidating that I think it took a while for the rest of the field to really acclimate. But I think Travis himself, though, having had eyes on it longer, having had a hand in choosing this venue, I think he showed up today with about multiple contingency plans. And if he's like, if I'm in the finals, this is what I'm going to do. If I make it to the semifinals, this is what I'm going to do. And I think there were a handful of riders like that, but not everybody. And that's why we saw riders get pulled into the same lines time and time again, where they're like, well, I just want to make it to the bottom on my feet. Whereas Travis was different. And it goes back to what I was saying about when I was with him while he was filming. He's not going to choose a line, even what we saw at the end. He chose that line over other lines because he knew he could do it. OK, enough chat. Let's take a look at that winning run from Travis Rice. Hannah, talk us through this because, I mean, both both runs were pretty spectacular. Yeah, and I, I wanted to mention how I thought the second run was amazing, but the judges rewarded his first run more because of, I think, the freestyle aspects. And we saw that in a couple other runs, too. And I think this first run, you know, Travis is having fun. He's been a little more freestyle -y. Um Still got into some, some big terrain. But ultimately, to me, I expected it to be more of a pillow, a pillow fight. But it ended <laughs> up being more of a freestyle fight. There was a little more freestyle emphasis than I thought. And then I think that's why this first run of Travis has scored higher than his second. Well, and I think it was this feature right here, which is the Sandy, I would imagine, the Sandy line of the day yeah, where he does the big. redirect Wally right here and just that was ridiculous that was, in, <laughs> that was completely insane there are five <laughs> elements to what he just did right there so that amazing. any one of them is a high scoring element exactly and it's just it so off easy with that back get, three you get turned upside down yeah and land on your head yeah and, and there's there's no breaking in in pillow lines like that it's like you just you're going once you commit to that <laughs> yeah, line. Yeah, once you commit, you're just kind of pointing it and going and hoping that you have a nice landing and a clean run out. Truly, truly spectacular from Travis Rice. And there's just no question. You, you said it, Mary. You used the phrase car, ironclad, solid result that says this is what I've done. I'm laying this down as a marker. And it, after at that point, you're kind of thinking, is there anything that Blake Paul can do to match Travis at this stage? And he gave it a good push, to be fair to him. Yep. No, I agree. I think Blake's riding, one, it's always beautiful to watch. And two, I think he had that seven that he did um, and in his last run and like a little bit rough on the landing. But still, I think he was upping the ante in that way. And he was taking that that rider's right side, but he was flowing. And again, I think it's that part where Blake often makes things look easier than they actually are because he is so smooth. Mm -hmm. But he, I mean, he did, he put up a heck of a fight against Travis. Okay. I'm sorry. Go well, on. I was just going to say all day long for Travis. Travis didn't have any easy battle. I mean, and arguably the biggest challenge for any rider of the day might have been Ben dropping second after Travis because we make a big deal out of Travis dropping first. But Travis, like I said, had a hand in choosing the zone. Travis has been there more than anybody. Well, let's hear for Ben dropping second because he was much more of a harbinger of what the rest of the riders could do because he had as much preparation as they did. And we had that heart in mouth moment when we realized just how exposed the middle of that face is as the camera pulls out and reveals 150 foot of rock below him. Um, we'll cross over to the women's now. And 
I think a lot of people on their form guide had either Zoe or Elena. So the final matchup itself was probably not a surprise to anyone. But the way it played out it had a really high level of riding, Hannah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Elena got on top of some really amazing pillow stacks and read them well. Zoe, we saw her freestyle abilities shine through, and she got on top of some some really nice stacks as well. So, I think both of them have the have the ability um, to ride this type of terrain and make it look really good. I think it just comes down to the you know the little execution things, whether you know the line you pick has a choppy landing or if you take off okay on the pillow. So, I mean, terrain selection is so huge in these events. I feel like, Pat, when you looked at the venue, it was leaning, most of us were leaning towards Elena for big mountain experience and, and comfort within exposure. But Zoe rode chin first from the very first run, it felt like. She did great. And I, but I got to say, though, Elena had a couple untimely falls. Had Elena, like, it's almost as if she, she could have been a little bit more conservative and finished, like, beaten Zoe. But Zoe with the freestyle. Zoe found the elements to play to her strength, whereas Elena did as well, but she just rolled the dice one too many times on the cliffs and the pillows. Do you agree, Mary? I think overall, Elena and Zoe are such a good matchup because they each approach things from a different aesthetic, but that has very similar roots, honestly. And so I think they're both, they both bring such an interesting perspective that mostly watching them in this finals makes me very excited to see what happens in Alaska. Mm -hmm. 100%. Okay, let's take a look at Zoe sadowski Sinot's winning run now. I think the thing that both of them had in common and that I was so stoked on watching them, there were so few hesitations. They both got stuck in. They were so confident riding over this bowling ball in the middle of the face. I completely agree. I think that's what's so beautiful about their riding is we've talked a lot through this broadcast about lack of hesitation, uh, taking full confidence, doing like a perfect wildcat like that, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, into these scenarios. And both of these riders really brought that into each run they took. They both are such strong and confident riders. They just charge. And that's something that is... It translates really well to the viewers. You can tell when somebody is riding the face and they are confident and just really attacking what they're going down. And each time Zoe had that sort of freestyle orientated face and then cut across into this exposure. Mm -hmm. I was saying that to Todd after the uh, semifinals. Everybody, and I, and I alluded to it recently, everybody who rode here today rode at the top level. Like nobody came in here and was outclassed by this face, which I wouldn't have expected by looking at the photos the last couple days. I was like, some people are gonna get rattled, but it didn't happen at all, as we see right here with Zoe. Yeah, everyone really rose to the level of this, of this course, and it was really cool to see, because a lot of people haven't ridden anything like this before. Historically, I think, I think, Hannah, I've heard you say this before. Um, I know we've talked about this um, you know, offline in meetings, preparing for things. But one of the things that Travis does is he really shepherds people into situations that he sees that they can excel at before often you see that you can do that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this whole contest was an example of that with him saying, this is the face. This is what we're going to ride. And everyone rising to the occasion. But I feel like he probably saw that all along. <laughs> yeah, he, he usually has more confidence in you than you do, Yeah, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> but it might take you a minute to catch up. Mary, you got the uh, limited edition natural selection Burton hometown hero there. We had five riders from Burton today, uh, Ferg, Mikkel, uh, Zoe, who am I missing, Mikey Cicerelli and Kimi Fasani. Uh, they're riding, I know that Zoe and Ben definitely were riding the limited edition this natural selection nice graphic. To hometown hero collaboration there so you can head over to Burton and there'll be a very small number of those available if you're interested in picking that. one up fun. Oh. okay we're going to take a quick break when we come back though we'll be looking at the sendy moment of the day and the line of the day please come and join us there fundamentally Snowboarding can't exist without snow. Our winters are changing before our eyes. Climate change is real and we have the power to stop it. We believe in shifting the narrative from one of crisis 
to one of inspired climate action. That's why the Natural Selection Tour is pledging to go beyond carbon neutral. Natural Selection will be a drawdown event, which means we're putting twice as much carbon into the ground as we are emitting during the tour. That includes the emissions from every heli bump, every sled ride, every mile driven. We'll be offset twice over. We pledge to bring the same enthusiasm for progression on snow to climate action. Because, simply put, neutral just is not enough. And this really is not even that radical of an idea. So we would like to challenge you and the businesses you work with to do the same. It's crucial that we learn the origins of our lands in order to honor those nations who've lived off it since time immemorial. We would like to acknowledge the land on which we gather is the territory of the Sinaiks Nation and is home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. We honor their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. Located at the confluence of the Columbia River and its adjacent tributary, the Silkwa'it River, Revelstoke was originally inhabited by this mighty nation. This land is considered unceded or unsurrendered territory, meaning that it was never formally given away by the Sinaiks Nation, nor did they willingly abandon their territory and is still owned and occupied by them today. Each nation across our continent, known as Turtle Island, speak their own language and is culturally unique. But each believes deeply in the connectiveness of the environment and all living things. The spiritual connection with snowboarding and the mountains is undeniable. For centuries, these First Nation peoples sent their young into these same mountains to connect with nature, fend for themselves, and to learn to live off the land. For over two decades, the Indigenous Life Sport Academy has been using this ideology to connect Indigenous youth with their natural environment through the life sport of snowboarding. The Natural Selection Tour represents another opportunity to bring our community together to grow both spiritually and culturally. As we forge the path ahead, it is vital that we look to our past and respectfully acknowledge those that came before. We really want to acknowledge the support of the Sinai Chakista tribe who are part of this territory and have given us the permission to use this land. So a huge shout out to them. Look at that terrain. It's been a pretty special day made possible by what Travis Rice described as perfect snow and fantasy terrain. Very, very different to every other venue we've seen so far, whether it's Baldface, Alaska or Jackson Hole. Uh, the one thing they all have in common is that they're pretty remote, which means that you can get... Let me see if I can lift it. That is a black rhino atlas wheel. Those things are tough. Absolute gimme if you've got an overland rig and you want a big set of wheels for them. Big shout out to the CMO, Brian Henderson. Uh, he's super passionate about action sports and he's the reason they're involved with us. So thanks, Brian, for your support. Head over to naturalselection.com and you can win a set of these wheels. OK, we're going to take a look at the men's run of the day. Where do you think we're going with this? I mean, I could guess someone whose first name rhymes with Avis. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything wrong Great with that. Great guess, Mary. Congratulations. <laughs> you win a Kodiak cake. Oh, exactly. Who is that? <laughs> okay, so I'm pretty sure that this is Travis's second, it's his first run from the finals. That utterly Mental. ridiculous triple layer drop because we're not done yet. He gets out onto this last step. And that's so consequential because if he just had landed improperly at all on that 360, then that would have cost him that whole run. And he could have gotten hit by some rolling snow boulders like we saw <laughs> exactly. in Jackson. Like those things are dangerous. Yeah. They can Sandal take you out. Mental. <laughs> yeah, you can end up in a proper Indiana Jones like yeah. getting chased by a giant ice boulder down the hill. You gotta be aware of those hazards. This was a literal like cartoon jaw on the floor moment, I think, watching watching it was just like, okay, the the bar has been raised again.
Yeah. We talk about it time and again. Natural selection is putting video part standard riding into live competition runs. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's absolutely mind-melting when you see someone capable of that. He's a snowboarding savant, isn't he? I mean, you're riding at this level, Hannah. Like, how far ahead of everyone is he in, when it comes to route finding and reading terrain? I think he's just so... I can't even describe it, but it's like Travis just... He has a different lens on the world. And I think when he sees a face like this, the calculations that are going on in his mind, it's like it would take me days to get to that point. <laughs> so he just, you know, he's a supercomputer when it comes to snowboarding. He calculates, he calculates risks, he gives the options, and he just finds the best ones, and that's what he goes for because he holds himself to such a high standard. Okay, that's a brilliant answer. <laughs> uh, ten points. He's a cyborg, uh, essentially. He's a cyborg, snowboarding cyborg. Uh, let's check out the women's run of the day now. Pat, what's your call on this? Um, well, I'd imagine it's, well, it's got to be Zoe right here. <laughs> there you go. Big old drop up at the top there on that one. I think this is her first run of the day. I. It it's would be fresh. her first run of the day. I think, uh, certainly, I mean, it, this is great to watch, too, because you're realizing how picked apart this side of the course is by the end of the day. And breaking trail over here and setting a new line. And this is the line where she was most confident in the pillows. Uh, Riding into that with zero hes hesitation, putting that cut in, setting it free, and then coming through that really, really steep funnel. To me, this line for Zoe is going to translate really well up in Alaska. Like, I feel like you can tell where her snowboarding has advanced in the last even two years that we've gone to see her around, right? And so to me, this, this looks like really good Alaska potential riding right here. She's, she's navigating through, she's finding little drops and features. I think she's just, she's improving before our eyes and it's awesome to watch. That's a massive compliment to you coming from an individual with such heavy a lasting experience as yourself. I feel like that's a, a harbinger of what's to come. Now this looks like a video game. Mm -hmm. It is phenomenal, isn't it? When you think that she's chucking switchback 12s of kickers in January, but then she can come out here and ride at that level in the back country. With, it is a completely different skill set, improvising on your feet. Mm -hmm. And being so young and not having the pedigree or the experience and depth of terrain knowledge. But she's been coached. I, Mary and I talked about this. Down in New Zealand, her folks were managing Snow Park. She was coached from the age of eight and she was watching some of the best riders mm -hmm. in the world. So she didn't have to unlearn any bad habits and she knew what level she had to, got to, had to get to. All of the fundamentals are there. So it's like it's right there at her fingertips and she's still... 22 today, she's got such a long career stretching out in front of her. The future is so bright, it feels like, for women snowboarding. Yeah, and I think Zoe is a prime example of these girls that are coming up now. It's like they don't have a limiter on them. Like I feel like we didn't get to see a lot of these amazing things that we're seeing from women now, and I think it's just snowballing, and it's like the world is her oyster. She's like, yeah, sure, that's possible. I can do that. I can do this. I can... I can chuck a back seven or whatever off of this crazy feature. And I just can't wait to see what all these girls come up with next. They're just taking it to the next level. And it's, it's cool. Like, I wish I, wish I, I was doing that stuff. You did you do know? it. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing to watch. Well, I think that's part of what the beauty of this contest series is, is that it puts riders that may, like, would Zoe have already been getting in the backcountry? Maybe, but to this level? Perhaps not. Perhaps she would have just been really focusing on the, con the traditional contest circuit. So for her to be exposed to this kind of terrain already, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit in advance of potentially where someone would be normally in that kind of path, like the path that you're describing that you guys went through, and um, is really broadens the scope of what is possible and creates yeah. so much opportunity. You can see, as you said, watching her and the others getting just better before our eyes mm -hmm. as we watch them on this circuit. Well, speaking of broadening the scope, I mean, you had the most experienced rider winning the men's side of the field. And you had the youngest rider winning the women's side of the field. Mm -hmm. That's a, and granted, she is a year older today. I mean, what an amazing way to spend your birthday and stuff. But I mean, 
talk about a span right there and what a what an equalizer the natural selection tour has become because it is still such an anomaly in the world of competitive snowboarding that nobody really can you know have an airbag next to a pillow stack you know it's it's not as you know sort of sterile as the half pipe slope style big air those environments have become mm -hmm. OK, we're coming up on our last award of the day, and it is the Sendy moment of the day. Uh, the most impressive moment. I've made the other two guess, Hannah. What have you got for this? Oh, is it <sighs> the Kootenai King, the Dustin one Craven, one. sending it? Strongest quad muscle, back leg quad muscle, I think, was the quote <laughs> from Mark <laughs> McMorris. The Kootenai quad. The yeah, Kootenai yeah. Quad. <laughs> Absolutely ludicrous. Second run up against Travis in the semi final. This Where's view Wally? really does it justice. I mean, that GoPro angle is amazing, but then you pull back and look at just how massive this thing is. It spins, makes your mind spin. It's really interesting to see Oof. when Travis said, I did that for Dustin. Travis redirected right above that, and mm -hmm. that was the line Travis got way. best line of the day on. Is that same pillow huge? <laughs> that first pillow stack is 20 feet, 25 feet tall. Like you, that pillow stack alone is bigger than you know most humans would jump down. On it as an individual. <laughs> as an yeah. individual stack. <laughs> like that line is like it's like a skyscraper, just that, bouncing down a skyscraper. That's just the setup. Okay, if you're interested in finding out more about Sendy, it is a marketplace where you can rent or buy gear or you can list your own gear for sale or to rent out if you've got your own stuff in resort. At the moment, we have a limited edition NST backcountry jacket signed by all of the riders on Sendy. Go on there. All of the uh, proceeds go to charity. So go and check that out. Uh, definitely worth it. Now we've got the women's Sendy moment of the day. Votes for this one? Elena on the triple. Yeah, stack. yeah. OK, I'm I'll going double that, that flip. <laughs> Three yeah. against one. Let's see who's right. <laughs> no. Oh, this was another very, very good contender. Mm -hmm. Rattling down through that pinball section of pillows. Zoe sadowski up. claims all of the plaudits today. Again, I mean, it is her birthday. You got to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Well, she's got those 100% goggles, but does she have the 10% rule? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> They're going to find out. Really important. A little bit more than 10% with the exchange rate currently, isn't it? Uh, percentages are the same in Canada as the United <laughs> States. Okay, Mary? <laughs> oh, this new math. It's going to be a hot town and hot time in Revelstoke tonight. Yeah, it's going to get pretty loose, I think. Yeah. There's so many people gathered in the town square, they've got big screens up, so... Oh, I bet it's so fun. Full pull of spectators. It has been a very, very busy day of action. A remote broadcast that sent pictures live from the Selkirk Tangiers heli tenure backcountry just east of Revelstoke. The lodge down here, 1,400 miles away in Southern California. We had live field reporters, top and bottom of the mountain. It was a truly breathtaking day of broadcasting, but the riding cr critically lived up to the hype. 12 of the world's best riders throwing down in some of the most intimidating terrain you'll find anywhere in snowboarding. <sighs> The only thing left to do is to look ahead to Alaska. We're heading to Valdez this time, and it promises, again, another new venue. So, completely different to British Columbia. We're going to see the same kind of snow quality, but a very different type of terrain up there, Hannah. Yeah, I, I mean, you're going to see a lot less trees, and you're going to see a lot, a lot more open faces. Um, Valdez is, is big big terrain and I think uh, it's it's even harder to judge the scope of, of of the size of the terrain you're riding on up there so uh, it's just it's route finding again train selection but it's even harder.
<laughs> that sounds exciting. Yeah, it's super fun. <laughs> How much of an advantage is it, say, for Travis and Zoe now going forward, though, with a bit of confidence, Mary? I don't honestly know. And, Hannah, you might have more succinct thoughts because you've been in that position. But because of the full reset, the terrain change, I mean, I think there is an element of confidence. But I think that it, watching it, it does seem that everyone kind of starts blank slate going into each event. You probably you know better than I do, though. Yeah, I mean, they're obviously all connected, but you come in and, you know, everyone's starting over again. You're against different people. It's You just kind of put the last one to the side and just take take each stop for what it is and try to do your best. It's nice to have a, a fresh start and another chance at, at winning. That's what's so cool about all the different stops is – is you might have blown in at the last one, but you can have total redemption at the, at the next stop. So, um, yeah, anything goes. And each, the venues that have been picked have such unique characteristics. It does feel like different riders are going to shine mm -hmm. in different places. Indeed. Well, totally. But I, I do think um, it'll be interesting to see how Mikey does in Alaska, because I think he has a little less experience than the rest of the field up in Alaska because he is a newcomer to the tour this year. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see what Elena does after spending nearly a month after Natural Selection Tour last year up in Alaska. And if you watch the movie Ark, you got a chance to see the fruits of that, which she'll even readily say she was a different rider after she left Alaska than the rider who showed up and stepped out of the contest venue after the Natural Selection Tour stopped. Those three weeks, really, she leveled up. And let's not forget about Jared. I mean, Elston last year, it was really his first time in that kind of, uh, you know, enormous mountain terrain. And he's another one like Zoe that we've been, just been watching up level every single time he drops in. So I think he's going to put on a show in an AK. Yeah, I think there's, it's anybody's game again in Alaska. Like Torstein last year, you know, he wants redemption. Uh, Travis, obviously. Don't have to say much about that, <laughs> but I think I think a lot of people are gonna shine up there. I Valdez is such an amazing amazing place to ride. Big beautiful slopes. Um, maybe not as tech and tricky as where we were at last year, but I think it it has a lot of other things to offer that we'll see some really beautiful riding go down. I like, also want to say I think uh, Alaska. It's going to be amazing to see Kimmy up in Alaska. I think that's going to be more her zone than what we saw today. Okay, Alaska kicks off at the start of April. Closing thoughts for today, though. Mary, how would you sum up what you've seen today? I feel like I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Mentally, I feel exhausted. I was just watching it. No, I seriously, though, this was such a spectacular day. We got to see in real time um, riders ride a face that has never, ever been ridden before one of the most complex technical days of snowboarding I think has ever been recorded. And I think the riding was pushed to a whole new level. I think expe expectations were blown out of the water. And I mean, this was a, a very great day. I think it's incredible that all the riders are gonna be at the after party. I mean, <laughs> for the last couple of days, we've been looking at a venue that we didn't even know if it was rideable by more than a handful of the competitors. And they all rose to the occasion. They collectively, Snowboarding has got to be stoked on what went down here today just because those riders really stepped up. And I said it a little while ago, this, I think, is, is the proof of concept for everything Travis has been working f towards since the first natural selection in Jackson Hole in the aughts, you know? And I think that's a big one. Now we get a little look into what Travis's vision for this tour really is. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I coming into this and seeing that face, you know, we only have so much information. We're not up there poking around and, and seeing all the angles and investigating. And I was a little nervous. I was like, ooh, maybe, maybe it's a little too much. But everybody really, you know, showed up and rode to their, to their best of abilities. And I think it's, I just think it's so awesome. Talk about, you know, doing something that's never been done before and really doing it well. And I am just so excited that it, you know, went the way it did, and I just really wish I was in Revelstoke tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're going to have so much fun celebrating all together.
Thank you all so much, Mary, Pat, Hannah. We also want to say thank you to Todd and Eddie uh, for their work in the studio. We want to say a huge thank you to Ben at Caffeine as well for his help with the live broadcast. We need to say thank you to all of our Industry Alliance partners, everyone from within the snowboard industry who supports this tour and the riders who compete on it. And of course, all of our partners. Without your support, this would not happen, especially the province of British Columbia and Revel. Stoke Mountain Resort. Thank you to the 12 riders who threw down today and of course congratulations to Zoe sadowski sinner and Travis Warice on their wins today. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you in Alaska. The wait is over. It is go time on the Yeti natural selection here at Revel Stoke Mountain. The true size and scale of the features up there is remarkable. 12 of the world's best riders, and they are ready now to go toe to toe. That thing is juiced. Oh my God, that was massive and he rides away. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> he manned that Wow, this angle really oh, puts it into wow. perspective. Oh my goodness. Absolutely mind melting. This is just a gigantic statement from Zoe sadowski sinner Travis knows his way around this, this course. He's been studying this for who knows how long. Oh boy. Travis will be moving on out of this bracket into the semis. That'll do it. Craven will move on. Nickel Bang has been eliminated. Hell yeah, that was sick. Torstein will take the second run, but it will not be enough to overtake Jared Ellison. So the kid from Bend moves on into the semi. The final for the women. Wow, it's going to be Elena Height up against Zoe Sadowski Sinnet. The men's semifinal. That's what we're getting into now. Travis Rice goes ahead of Dustin Craven for a place in the finals. Blake Paul will move wow. into the finals where he will face Travis Rice. Wow. All right, it has just come in from our judges that the winner of the Yeti Natural Selection is going to be Zoe Zadowski Sinnott. He is not slowing down. Rice lacing a giant double line right there, holding on to it. Holy cow, that was insane. So Travis Rice is the winner of the Yeti natural selection here at Revelstoke. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Munger Mountain, Lobos.